One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. One two 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 I mean you were happy with the test right the sync was fine one point one because you were doing sync with Udo last time, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Because I didn't change anything for that. So. Yeah, yeah, okay. One, two. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. One, two. One, two.
one more. One, one, one. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. One two, 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 one two. One two, one two, one two, one two, one. One two, one two, one two, one two. One two, one two, one two, one two. One two. One two, one two, one two. One two, 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 one two. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Good start with a, a nice applause. Thank you very much. Uh, it's and very special to be able to meet in person and to welcome you all formally to, uh, to Oxford and the University of Oxford. very special days, I think, they will hope to have lasting impact front. If you set the focus of today has how far we've come. Economics of well-being conference that was at three. Fairness is organized by in this room. They're both labor economists who had started taking an interest in these kind of strange, fluffy data on how people feel at work. From the EC to organize this big first conference, which was going to take place at the London School of Economics, where both um, are based. 
widely and put out 120 seats, not unlike today. On the day, however, they find out that only people showed up. And also puts it at nine, whereas Andrew Clark insists there were 11 people. <laughs> you should also know that these 11 people were the 11 speakers. <laughs> Apparently for one representative, and um, made me wonder, or I better understood why we've had such a tough time with ES ESRC ever since. <laughs> and getting funding. Um, fast forward about 30 years, and here we are today, and I'm sure that just merely glancing at the program uh, for these two days will, get, have, will have given you a good sense for the quantity and the quality of the caliber and the interest that the topic is receiving from both in academia and from outside academia, especially tomorrow when the business and policy leaders will also all join us. So, uh, I do want to point out that um, we a funny day. Um, of time, let me very quickly introduce the giants in the field, uh, and they will be presenting material on the recent trends in well-being. And then ill-being uh, with, with Andrew, who will uh, uh, set some alarm bells on where the data seem to be headed. They will keep to 20 minutes each, which will then allow for 10 minutes per presentation for some Q&A with all of us, the audience. Please raise your hand if you want to ask if John wait for a steward to come around to give you a microphone so we can all hear it properly. With that, please. Are you happy to be here? <laughs> here, together. It's something special. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, wait a minute. In Iceland, they were all singing. You're supposed to be singing too, because I want this group to rank up with them. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Well, they did the foot, foot stomp version too, but I, I, they had me paired with a op real opera singer, so it made it all together easier. I've got a clicker. There was a little problem when you were speaking, Jan, that if you turned one way that you could hear the, through the speaker and not with the other. Is that true with me as well? Am I okay? Yeah. Same again? Yeah. Same again? Audible? Yeah. Credible? <laughs> Wait and see. I have got a 40-minute talk to be given in 20 minutes, and so I'll skip out all the compliments I was going to give to all my friends. I have never been in a group that had so many of my mentors and colleagues all drawn together in a meeting, despite, you know, COVID, no COVID, even before, that never happened. I, I've shared uh, papers and platforms with uh, all of you, a good chunk of you, uh, many times and enjoyed them. Uh, so this is my potted history, but even looking around the room, I realized that the potted history is not much good because it's, it's missed out too many of you. And I see a Lois Singh, I didn't, I missed the Frame Stutzer book in here. And there are so many things that have been missed. Uh, but the two Andrews have already had the, the appropriate nod for important contributors. And of course, Andy's, uh, uh, Danny's book on the foundations of hedonic psychology, all safely in the previous century. Uh, now, inter getting more interdisciplinary, I put in Oxford 2001 because that's where I wrote the paper that was my introduction to the field as a, 
a research assistant for Aristotle. It was inherently interdisciplinary. Uh, but that paper then allowed me to meet the two Andrews, who both were then mentors and friends in trying to get that paper in shape before I actually uh, uh, put it out. And then it led to me being recognized or seen uh, by both Gallup and by Danny and by Richard. Because uh, Richard then uh, had Danny and me and other people later to a meeting about his next book. And so it, through these networks, you, uh, you get at meeting a whole lot of people and developing your own ideas. Uh, but when I'm, I'm trying to show how this is the research day, not the policy day, but they're intrinsically related because you can't do the research unless you have good data. You can't go the good data unless somebody thinks it's important. Typically, that's not until policymakers think it's important or somebody thinks they should think it was important. So that uh, the story of the World Happiness Report, which is in some sense what I'm building up to, really required a confluence of several positive things. One, there had to have been a science extant and worth talking about and with reasonable things to offer at the time you take it seriously. There had to be a very good database or else you're not going to be able to do the empirics for a world happiness report. Secondly, you had to have a platform. You had to have a way, an interest. And of course that required some deep contributions on the governmental side. And that was a magical combination of the government of Bhutan and Jeffrey Sachs, if you like, because the government of Bhutan had been holding these uh, gross national happiness conferences since early in the century. And I'd been lucky enough through also that same paper, I guess, of being involved in the several of those. So I knew all the players on that side. Uh, and then uh, Jeffrey managed to get that resolution in June of 2011 before the General Assembly passed NEMCON and then that led to the meeting in Timpu later that summer where plans were being made for the April 2012 high-level meeting at the United Nations. And so it was Jeffrey's idea and Richard and I agreed to play along um, that we should have a report of the science to present before that meeting. And uh, I think Danny was at the seminar we held adjacent to that uh, launch, uh, and maybe some of the rest of you as well. But it surpassed all our expectations in a sense of the interest. We'd always thought the reason people took GDP so seriously and not happiness is that that's what we were fed in all the media. And uh, the, so the question is, was there some other alternative source of information about something better worth focusing on? And that was the intent, of course, of that resolution uh, for governments, and it was also uh, the intent of the report to help build that science. So I've taken you through all of that. Now, uh, Danny keeps reappearing in all these things because he's a towering figure in so many ways. Um, but it was his idea, he invited Ed, if I remember this right, it, Danny invited Ed and me to join him in, in editing this volume, International Differences in Well-Being, that then we had chapters from a number of people in this room, uh, and there was a conference at Princeton in, the, in 2008, in uh, October, I guess it was. And here are some, as I remember, some of the issues uh, discussed at that conference. Uh, in the end, in the introduction to the book, we said, well, it should be a, a subjective well-being. But in fact, when it came to later the World Happiness Report, how many people would have read it? It was called the, the World Well-Being Report. Not very many. And uh, so it, it was true at that conference, there were people who were writing books on happiness and they called them happiness. Uh, they said, you can call your book whatever you want, but uh, happiness is what I'm going to call my book because it has a convening power. Uh, and that remains the case. Uh, and then, of course, people, when we did pick it up for the World Happiness Report to call it happiness, uh, they said, well, there's inherent ambiguity there. Some people said it's just all fluff because this is just positive emotions. Not what life is about. It says you want a good life, an important life, a purposeful life. And so we picked up the philosophical point that uh, Amartya Sen uh, traces to Gramsci and I trace uh, to Grice uh, that, in fact, there are 
two ways of using the, the word happiness. One is, how happy are you? This is like in the Gallup question, how happy are you yesterday? It's the question I asked you when I was asking you to sing and answer. The second way is how happy are you about something? And so, to take uh, Danny's distinction of living life and thinking about it, living life is how happy are you now? Thinking about it is how happy are you with your life as a whole? And it turns out, putting a life evaluation question that way gives you almost structurally identical answers to satisfaction with life or the Cantrell ladder. Uh, and so we get, yeah, let me skip to the income point first. At that conference, you'll remember, Danny, you and Ed had a chapter that said the Cantrell ladder gave bigger income effects than does life satisfaction. And that was because it has a relativity built into it. That was the hypothesis. Well, you know me, I'm a numbers person. So I man we managed to persuade Gallup to put in the satisfaction with life question in a survey, so, which is the only way to do it, right? You've got the same people in the same con survey context and you ask both questions and it turns out the income effects are identical with those uh, two uh, measures. And so uh, right in the compass of that same book, we would raised a hypothesis and produced the evidence and uh, I hope put that one behind us. Uh, binary answers and longer scales, uh, I've only, I've always been a long scale person um, and so yes, no, it just doesn't have enough information in it. As we've increasingly focused on inequality, then the importance of the longer scales increases because you can get meaningful distribution shape differences with a zero to ten scale. Zero, one has nothing in it. So now we would like to trace the evolution of changes in the inequality of well-being distributions in terms of the inequality of the source variable. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. Uh, so anyway, longer, longer wins on that one. Uh, affect balances, uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you where we're going on that one. Uh, so this is the three things that uh, Ed really sort of had this binary split, tr triple split, and that's the same one that's in the Cantrell ladder. Uh, uh, and of course, the life evaluations is what we concentrate on, I'll tell you why. You know what the Cantrell, this is all people who know all this stuff. And so this is the, uh, the Cantrell ladder top and bottom and increasingly we're presenting our first picture this way because when we present the figure the way it usually is in the report, three quarters of the world's press think we are ranking countries on the basis of those six factors. Well, as you know, that's obviously not the case and that's not what we do. So we have to be careful because it's very important to us that it's not our index of anything that we're ranking countries on, it's their expressions of their own life evaluations. So uh, why do we use life evaluations? Well, they're a single umbrella measure. Uh, which is critically important, so it then says purpose in life, very important, but it's a right-hand side variable, not a left-hand side. I'm following straight from the Aristotle's pre-registered hypotheses that I was originally testing in 2001, I'm not making it up. And positive and negative emotions, also very impor important effects on an overall life evaluation, but they're not an alternative to those, they're in fact part of the, what goes into the sausage. And of course, once you have a, a variable directly measured, as opposed to a combination of other variables, you can use it to explain the relative importance of the other variables. Well, that's absolutely critical for the kind of cost-benefit analysis that Gus and, and Richard and others have been doing. You have to have some compensating differentials. In order to get those, you have, and many of you have done this stuff, of course. Uh, and of course, it's very important to, to get a good primary measure as you then find it easier to look at the actual levels. And it's not just for countries, it's subgroups of the population, it's anything. You can then say, how different are they? You've got these measures, you've got the sample sizes you know, you can then test for significance of the differences. And of course, the cost-benefit analysis I've already talked about. And the inequality, I already talked about that, it's a good thing too, because I'm down to how many minutes? So I'm going to skip right through this because you know the World Happiness Report so you know the way it's set up. Okay, oh boy, I'm in trouble. 
All right, so the key points I wanted to make <laughs> were, first of all, the importance of measuring positives. When the uh, Lloyd's Register Foundation had a world risk poll, they asked for some help and said, what kind of questions do we do? And I said, these are all negative risks. Why don't you talk about some positive risks? Why don't something, pos chances of something positive happening? So we persuaded them to put the wallet question in. If you lost your wallet with something valuable in it, how likely is it to be returned if found by a stranger or a police officer? And so now we form, framed the questions so they were on the same scale. Very likely that you'll have uh, harm from mental health issues, very likely harm from, men, from uh, uh, violent crime, very likely return of a wallet found by police, very likely if found uh, by a, a stranger. Sorry, a police and neighbor we've got here. There's strangers in there too. They're all in there together, so they aren't, these are, they're competing for explanatory power. To think that either a, a, a stranger or a neighbor would return your wallet, well, either would return, both I mean, would return your wallet. It has the well-being equivalent of all of those things put together, current unemployment uh, and then those positive measures. And you see, you can compare it to a doubling of income. So I see really important, if they hadn't included those measures of positive risk, everything would have been about all the damages to well-being from these negative things. Unless you actually specify the positive possibilities and measure them, you'll never be able to do the science to convince somebody that it's a mistake to just look at what's going wrong and try and solve that rather than looking about what's going right and try to make it happen. All right, this is uh, the, the lost wallet question uh, is actually had some real experiments behind it. So for 40 countries, uh, we know uh, the actual Cantler ladder scores, blue, the wallets actually returned per 10 lost in red, and the number expected. So this comes, this comes from our surveys, uh, the, the, and this comes from the Cohen et al. experiments. And this is the latter. Well, you can see how important uh, I just divided. Re oh. Have you got that? Have you absorbed it all? I'll send it to you later if you want to ask a question about it. And I'm going to skip through the migration because I want to give you at least a flavor of the COVID stuff. Inequality, people much happier. We took all Europeans and gave them Nordic levels, individual ESS data gave them Nordic levels of uh, trust and personal connections. You see how it shifted the old distribution, pulled in the left tail, moved the mean, but more important than moving the mean was the reduction uh, in inequality. All right, uh, so this is overall eliminators, uh, and this is COVID deaths. But let me take you to the next one, because I'm just about disappearing on you. Uh, let me back up. So you see what trust does. The Nordic excluding Sweden, Sweden and the other Western Europe, now Sweden had a, had, a, had a really open policy, and you can see how it matters. They've got the same social context and all the same kind of quality healthcare system, just made a mistake. You can see the difference in terms of both measured excess deaths for 20 and 21, as well as registered uh, COVID deaths. I'm heading backwards. I think I'm gonna be 30 seconds ahead okay. and open the, for questions, because I know I haven't answered all your questions, and now I have 10 minutes to try. Over to you. You be, be warned, if you don't... <laughs> At this stage, applause is a waste of time. Let's get on with the questions. <laughs> and if you don't have questions, I'll start talking again, and that's always bad, yes. So in all this research, analyze satisfaction equation, which aspects or facets of the life are the Uh, uh, in broad terms, the social context. Then you say which aspects of the social context. Different surveys measure these things different ways. But that wallet thing, 
is rather nice because it, well, you could see how important it was. It isn't in our basic modeling because we only have it for one year in the Gallup poll. Um, but some feeling that you are in a community where other people watch your back and would help you. One part that even Aristotle didn't pick up on as much as human nature demands that he should is the extent to which feeling that other people want to do things for you is important and that you get well-being out of doing things for other people with other people, for other people. So that's a, we found a continual increase in the power of pro-social activity, both in terms of what it does for the giver and what it does uh, for the receiver. But, you know, somebody really close to help you. All life is local, so it matters most in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in, in, in who you know, but it's equally true for the society. So we find trust in the overall institutional systems is independently important to your trust of the people who are going to find your wallet and return it. The Nordic stuff on the wallets is very relevant, right, because a lot of people say oh, it's just because they have great social safety nets. Well, social safety nets don't return your wallet. Other people return your wallet. Yes? I feel like there's not enough research, uh, not enough research done on physical exercise. Um, and so I know it's reverse causal. Uh, but I think, especially during the pandemic, right, we see how important it is. Yeah. You know, why is that missing? Why is it missing? From the research. Why is it? Well, because the data don't have it for the global research. Remember, this session, my talk is about world happiness. So we're stuck in a way to talk about things that we can get reasonable world measures of. It's, it's, there are lots of excellent studies about physical activity is great. Physical activity done in concert with others is even greater. And uh, so that's where the social com context does come back. So from all these time use surveys, but more importantly now these mappiness uh, data, because you know who they're with as well as what they're doing moment by moment, and who you're with is much more important than what you're doing. But given you can be with a friend, uh, to be outdoors in physical activity is right up there. So there's evidence, but it doesn't get into my world thing because I don't have the data. It's not because it isn't important. Over here. I want to ask uh, quite a basic philosophical question. So you, you distinguish between happiness with and happiness during. So sense of satisfaction with life and then actually how you feel. Yeah. And you went for the, the satisfaction with life version. And I'm, I'm curious to hear uh, why you prioritize that one. Because you said, well, look, you could explain how, you, how happy you feel. Uh, that, that can explain your life satisfaction. Yeah. But that can go the other way around as well. And one way I think about it is that if we encounter someone who is in agony and we ask what's bad about their agony, it seems what's bad about their agony is their suffering, it's how it makes them feel, yeah. what's, rather than the fact it makes them less satisfied with their life. Yeah. So I wonder why you, why you take satisfaction rather than happiness to be the thing which uh, oh. in the end is, is what matters most. I mean, I, I, I was testing a pre-registered hypothesis straight, straight out from Aristotle and he said it was these positive feelings, in fact, do support a, a greater sense of leading a good life. Uh, and we also find, if you treat, for example, uh, positive affect and life satisfaction as alternative dependent variables, the fit is very much tighter if you go for life satisfaction. We then put the positive emotions in, and they get a really big effect and they cut down the coefficients, just the ones you'd expect they to cut down. So the social a actions ones, the kind, because we know they give you joy, we know they give you life satisfaction, a good part of that life satisfaction is flowing through the emotions. So it plays all of the joys, the current emotions, both positive and negative, play these mediating roles between what life is delivering to you and how you're feeling about your life as a consequence. So I, the causal direction to me is pretty clear. All these things, as you well know, these correlational studies, the, the causal arrows on most of these things go both directions in a circular flank. Goodness for that, because if good things didn't build good things, then we wouldn't spend as much time trying to create them. Yes, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, we know a lot about happiness and life satisfaction. What are the biggest things we don't know? What are the most important questions we still puzzle over or need to find out going forward? Now you're, you're asking from the point of view of a statistical agency? Uh, 
or research. Well, if re researchers, us guys, we're dependent on what the statistical agencies give us. That was so wonderful about the launch by uh, 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 Gus and, and the NSO and the Prime Minister in November of 2010. They said, this has got to be a team effort. If we don't have the data, we won't be able to do anything. Uh, so now we want to dig in much more. You see, Gallup is 1,000 people per year per country. You can't do anything with that in terms of really understanding what's going on. So the next step is to get linked and at least consistent national statistical agency collections that allow you to drill down by population subgroups and geographic subregions in order to figure out where is life good and where is it bad and then it helps you to understand both context and individual circumstances and explaining it. We're just way up there and a lot of the early models were just looking at as treating as these effect these influences so they were additively independent. Well of course they're not. So 2.0 is saying well let's see where the interactions are are important and why they're important. So it's very early days, and, but it's important to get enough feedback uh, to the policymakers and, and their statistical agencies that they're thinking it isn't over just to have a big four in a survey or two. You've got to have the key measures in all your surveys. It should be just like, you know, the basic age, education, gender, you should have subjective well-being in there. So we're long, and give us that and we can start telling you things that are Interesting. Uh, here, final question. I'm so sorry. I talk too much. Uh, just interested in the. You talked about examples of measuring trust. What are the measures you're using for social connection? Oh, there are lots of them. I, in the Gallup poll, it's do you have someone to count in times of trouble? Yes, no. Well, we know from the European Social Survey there are any number of ways of digging into that more. How many? How frequent have you had this support? What kind of support? Family, friends, and so on. So, jury, so there are dose response relationships for all of those. And so basically every kind of connection we look at, there's a dose response relationship. Well, there's a peak in the family one in some cases. <laughs> You can imagine why that is. That was the last question we had time for. What? One more question. Good. I cut myself off. Next. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, I'm, I'm just wondering from policy point of view, what kind of role the World Happiness Report can play in influencing the uh, global agenda? For example, given that sustainable development goals will end in 2030, and the global community is now looking for what's going to be the next big agenda for post-SDGs after 2030. So I'm just wondering the role of World, World Happiness Report can play. Mm. Well, we've been comp very surprised at how widespread the distribution and take up of the World Happiness Report has been. For the SDSN, it overshadows all their other publications put together. And what that has done, the number one thing it's done in terms of behavior and the way governments think about things, is that it's changed the focus of attention to the Nordic countries. Because they're all, all five of them are almost always in the top 10. So now you find in all those countries and other countries, you see they're saying, just like high PISA scores drove everyone to Finland to find out about their school system. Well, the Finnish educators are smarter than most others, so they've discovered the, the education is more than about test scores. And in a sense, we're now saying, uh, people are now saying, what is it to see? And so some of this is coming out of the country. Of course, the first thing they'll say is, we're not happy. And that tells you one of the reasons why they're happy is because they're not about to boast about anything. Um, and, and, then you, and then you take through what they say about their life and you say, well, if that doesn't justify a high life satisfaction answer, I don't know what would. So they're very high. Well, you saw the wallet return peak. Uh, and so people notice that. And that's a relevant policy thing for all countries to say, we have to build social connection. The countries that have it, work better than the ones that don't. Uh, and so if you're thinking of the policy agenda, I think that's where they're now. It's not what you're delivering to people, it's how you're enabling people to do things with and for each other. Reversal of the whole thing it doesn't come top down, it comes bottom up. So you're enabling patients to help patients, you're helping unemployed to help unemployed. You're, you're, you're really 
creating the capacity to generate better lives or helping to create it uh, right across the board. And it's, so it's that, so everybody can have this sense of freedom and engagement and so on. It's a big, it's changing the agenda from repairing something bad by a medicine that gets rid of the anxiety but cuts off your willingness and ability to generate something better. It's the generation of something better in all these phases, whether it's employment or health and so on. I've gone on too long with my last question. I knew I would. Thank you very much. supposed to keep me on time and I already dropped it. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, uh, John Emanuel, mainly for organizing this, but everyone, it really is quite an occasion and it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and I suppose I'm going to talk about something sort of new and different um, that we, maybe we don't need more measures, but I think we do. Um, now I see I'm going backwards. Hold on. Here we go. Okay. I have to get used to this. Okay, anyway, first of all, like, like um, John and I, I suppose most of us here, we're pretty amazed at how far we've come and at this event, it really is a wonderful event. I remember, also remember past events where there were many less people and lots of people call us, called us crazy and there were two Andrews there, always key, um, and a Danny and a Richard and everything else. But um, it really is, it's really exciting to see where the field is um, and it's, it's, I think it's particularly beyond anything I imagined in terms of it being not just a really interesting research field, which it is. I mean, I think it, what's really exciting about it now is it, it is economics, but it's also psychiatry, medical science, genetics, philosophy, all sorts of fields, um, psychology, obviously. Um, but also the extent to which it's now become a really interesting, important, an important policy lever. And that we think about well-being now as you know, there's, there's a range of, of views on how central it should be to our policy uh, objectives, whether it should be the objective, as I, um, I think many of us think it should be, or whether it should be a complementary objective to GNP, which I think the two can go together, um, or whether, you know, we should, there are still people who are skeptical. I mean, a lot of us in the room are preaching to the converted, but there are also still people out there that think this is completely loopy. So. We still have some work to do, I suppose, to convince some people in the world, but I think, in fact, the world is convincing us that well-being really matters. I think COVID made a huge difference, showing us not just that things besides income matter um, in terms of successful societies and healthy societies, but that things beyond income like mental health and well-being really, really are central. If those things fall apart, your society falls apart very quickly. And unfortunately, I think, I don't know exactly what Andrew's going to say, but I know that the one reason I'm focusing on hope is that I'm seeing it lost in a lot of places and seeing the damage that that does. Um, and so I think it really has, in a, in a, you know, as horrible as COVID has been, it's really highlighted the importance of having such tools and such an approach to what, do what I call is take society's temperature, right? The, you know, GNP is one example of how we're what we're producing, not great measure, but it's no measures are perfect, neither, neither honestly is life satisfaction or our measures, but it's another measure that's really important. It's taking sort of the, it's, it's really measuring people's well-being rather than just the economy's well-being. Anyway, um, I won't go into more details. I think John went into it a lot, but I do think one of the key things we still need are widely available national public well-being data. So the Brit, you know, in the UK, you're, you're really lucky. But if, for example, in the US, they just started measuring ill-being because of fear during COVID. 
and all of the surveys started including, the official surveys started including reported depression and anxiety. No positive measures. So we've missed really critical years where we really don't know, <laughs> except through other data sets, if the increases in depression and anxiety were among the same people who are already depressed and anxious, if they, they were you know, accompanied by positive measures, in fact they were in many cases, life satisfaction stayed relatively stable after a dip, um, even though people incre you know, reported more anxiety during a pandemic, go figure, right? So you, t you really can't understand this unless you measure it right. And so the US is a prime example of why we really miss the boat in really critical years on doing that and why we should have you know, data that's public, that's, co that's com comparable about, uh, across countries in terms of well-being. Um, so one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is, you know, I think we do, we have, we have a right in the sense that we, we should measure the positive and negative affect and then evaluative measures. We have sort of, a, I think eudaimonia, measuring eudaimonia is really important, even though it tracks very closely with life satisfaction, the whole idea that people without a purpose and meaning in life actually lead really terrible lives. They lead lives of despair, which is again, why, why I'm thinking a lot about hope in addition to all the other measures, that if you do, the reason I think hope should be a fourth dimension along with life satisfaction, eudaimonia, and then positive and negative affect, is that it's one of the most agentic measures of well-being. In other words, hope is not just optimism. There's this, you know, the tragic optimist versus the hopeful pessimist, and you're, it's better to be a hopeful pessimist, or so they say, right? The idea that you can, that things may not be good, but you can make them better. And it isn't just they will get better, that it will drop out of the sky that they'll get better, but that you can make them better. And so that entails some sort of agency. It's not sort of the happy peasant kind of finding where very poor people will say they're very happy because it's a survival mechanism. You know, they have no choice. So I've been doing a lot of, of of trying to understand both hope and despair and the, seeing the very negative effects of despair, and particularly in the US where we have a crisis of deaths of despair and premature mortality on the order of, it's up to about 100,000 deaths a year, preventable deaths from suicide, overdose, and alcohol poisoning in the United States. And it used to be, it was considered a white problem. It was sort of uh, the, the death of the white working class. But in the past couple of years, it's spread to minorities. So we, all of a sudden, we have more, more reason to be even more concerned, and the, the causes are more complex, including, unfortunately, part of that is the, just the entrance of complex drugs like fentanyl, which have added to the overdose deaths. Part of it is COVID and the, uh, you know, the additional shocks to society that entail. But in, it, in any event, what I'm seeing in terms of large-end data, in terms of small-scale services, lots of work, I'll talk very quickly about a little about, a little about it, is um, that people that have hope in general just live longer, they do better, they have better health, they have better lives, they live, um, and a whole host of other things. I've written a paper with Kelsey O'Connor, who's over there on hope and longevity about two years ago, and then I've done some surveys of hope among adolescents and their, their better educational outcomes with Julia Pozuelo, who's also here, so it is fun to have so many people that you've worked with in the room. But anyway, really quickly, um, I'm gonna skip this slide on method because you know it. Um, certainly this group does, let's see if I can get this one. It does not, it, for some reason it's not moving. Will that work? Got it, I did it that way, okay. Um, all right, this is, this is a very old finding. It's kind of the U-shaped curve between age and well-being. Uh, there's still some debate on it. Um, I'm not going to belabor that debate. Uh, too much time is spent on it. It's, it is so clear in so many kinds of data. There's a U-shape in life satisfaction bottoming out, out around the middle age years. There's a hump shape in ill-being, which we're, we are going to hear a lot about, I think also from Andrew. Um, where things like stress, depression, suicide are at the same place where the low is in life satisfaction at, the t you know, at their peak and around the same age range um, uh, for, for middle-aged people. But one reason to talk about this U-curve is that it, in the U.S., for example, where I think is despair is the highest, it's not the only place. I think China had about, with very similar trends for different reasons about 20 years ago, India is now actually 
country with a lot of very high rapid income growth and a lot of despair, a lot of suicide, um, is that despair is the highest in those middle age years. And where you see the deaths of despair, where you see premature mortality, people actually taking their own lives, whether it's you know actively or passively, um, it's, it's at the bottom of this U. So there are a lot of, that's where people don't come out of when things are really bad. Um, so one of the things that I did in the course of this research was think about how hope varied across countries and across poor people and rich people. And interestingly enough, in Latin America, the, which is a, a very poor, very unequal region, I'm from Latin America, I love it, it's actually a very optimistic region, but you see that the differences in between hope for the future are much smaller be between the rich and the poor. So poor people have almost as much hope, sometimes they have more hope than rich people in Latin America, than in the US, where it's essentially, well-being is as unequally distributed as income is, if not more. So the gaps in well-being, in hope, in reported stress, and all sorts of things, are much higher among the poor and the rich in the US than they are in Latin America and many, many other countries. Um, and at the same time, we see that, um, that these same people with lack of hope have very poor markers of objective health, high levels of reported pain, high levels of opioid addiction, and high levels of deaths of despair. So one question obviously is how does all, all this work? How, do, how does hope affect future outcomes? And I think it's very simple. People who believe in their futures are far more likely to invest in them. And so I'm gonna give you the, some details on my surveys in the next couple of slides. But we've been taking surveys of low income adolescents, some of this work with Julia in Peru, some work in the US, and we see that low income adolescents who are, are young adults who are at a very critical moment in their lives where they can invest in their futures, in their future education and, or in their health, or they can undertake risky behaviors, they can drop out of school, they sort of choose a, pet, you know, they are at a critical point in their lives. And we see that kids with hope really do better. They, not only do they say they, they can do better and they will do better, but when we go back several years later, they are doing better. And these are not, these, we're comparing people that have not a lot of means. And it's not just, you know, the wealthy ones getting ahead. This is all among low income adolescents. Um, there are other examples in other data. One is unfortunately just across groups, racial groups in the US. And if you can see this, um, the, the odds of being higher up on an optimism or hope ladder, ladder where poor blacks are the most, these are across poor income cohorts. Poor blacks are three times as likely than poor whites in the US to be hopeful about the future and to be optimistic. And if you think about it, you're talking about the group that's had the most, historically the most discrimination, the most difficulty, that still has worse outcomes on lots of objective measures, and yet they're more hopeful. And what we also see is that the gaps between, say, education attainment, um, health, and even marriage rates are going are getting narrowed. In other words, poor blacks are doing better and poor whites are doing worse. And so these metrics are reflected in actual objective outcomes. And they're the most, I, I think the most um, obviously reflected in deaths of despair. So this is a slide from Case and Deaton, um, and that's, these are several wealthy countries and the, um, the very top red line is US whites only. Um, and that's mortality rate, right? So it's the only, group, the only country where a major social group is losing life expectancy rather than gaining it. This is pre-COVID. And then you see the dark um, blue line in the middle of the slide, that's US Hispanics. And if we had a, if there was a line for US African Americans, it would also be going down along with the other countries. So all of a sudden, a social group in the US, it's, it's, it's unprecedented, all of a sudden, you know, completely reverses our entire life expectancy rate due to what our deaths of despair. So if that's not a sign that hope matters, I, I'm not sure what is. Um, and then of course you have the COVID shock. This is some an analysis we did from um, first responder data. And we did this before the CDC released the final um, death data on overdose deaths. And we actually predicts it just as well. It's what first responders around the country have been answering calls for, suicide, overdose, 
We, these, these are, this one is overdoses. And as you see, there's a huge uptick in overdoses. There were 90,000 deaths from overdose alone in the US in 2020. That was a 30% increase from 70 some thousand, which is not a low number, in 2019. So COVID did indeed induce a shock. Interestingly enough though, here you go during COVID. I, I didn't really believe this was real, but I've seen it now in many different surveys. This is a survey we did with WashU. Um, and this is, these are racial differences. And here you have the um, being optimistic for, 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 you know, about life in five years. And this is reported stress. And as you can see, the most optimistic group by far are low income blacks. Yet again, even though they got hit hardest by COVID and the least stress group are low income blacks. And just quickly, this is not a Pollyanna finding. This isn't people that th just think everything's rosy because they, that's the only way to survive. The same poor black respondents who are optimistic say their city is not a good place to live. They say their financial situation is bad. So the, the, you, there, there are lots of reality tests. It isn't just sort of a reporting thing, right? Um, okay, I'm gonna, almost out of time here, so very quickly. Um, all right, so one of the things, uh, just two very, um, two more quick slides. One is this idea that hope, uh, this is a quote from Amanda Gorman, the wonderful um, inaugural poet during the 2021 inauguration. Hope is not a promise we give, it's a promise we live. And there's the idea that it's, there's something about, it isn't just, uh, and I think it, it, it's that people have agency to make their life better, or they think they do, and that's part of having it, right? that you, tr you can try and make things better. And I think it's missing a bit in the discussion of well-being, not totally, but it's just that, that actually that you can actively do things to make your life better. This isn't about how to be happy. It's just that if you, if you strive for a better life, for a purposeful and meaning life, meaningful life, you see that in the metrics that people just have better lives. Um, and whether it's doing that through altruism, as John had just showed, or whether it's doing it through other means, it's just the idea that you have a reason to get up and out of bed and not just you know, do things for yourself, but maybe give back, be a, be a part of something, a community, a world, whatever it might be. Um, so anyway, one of, the, one of the things I realized, digging into this, this a bit more, is that hope is understudied. So psychiatrists say that it's very critical to say recovery from mental illness, but there's not very much written about hope. Um, and then another thing about it is that it's a trait. So you, yes, in the same way that part of well-being is genetic, right? You know, some of it we can't explain. It just comes with you, with biological, for genes, and all sorts of things. You do inherit personality traits, but they can also be developed and learned. And I think Heck, Jim, Jim Heckman has done a lot of good recent work on this, showing that socio-emotional skills and other kinds of so-called soft skills can be learned, and they can be learned much later in life than the kind of skills that make up IQ. Um, that, so there's, I think there, that's another reason to invest in it and think about it, because it is something people can do and change and often that maybe policy can help them do and change. Um, and as I said before, uh, not having hope is linked to a lot of very bad outcomes. And I think we're gonna hear about trouble and bad outcomes more from Andrew. Last very quick slides. Um, we, we had a, um, we did a couple of pilot surveys where we basically asked, uh, we started in Peru with Julia and then I did some in the US, where we asked um, young adults, high school graduates of the next year about their future educa aspirations for their future education, their trust in others, a whole battery of questions. It was called the Thinking About the Future Project. And, um, and what we found is the first round was among very poor kids in Lima, Peru, in a neighborhood where it's half running water and electricity and pavement and half dirt, still dirt roads and piped in, you know, water from trucks and tapped in electricity. And out of four, we had, initially we had 400 respondents. Out of those, 85% of the respondents said they wanted to go to college or grad school. That was their expectation for education. Not one of their parents had gone to college. And yet, when we went back three years later, almost all of them were on track to 
meet those expectations. They were in school. This isn't easy for people who have to forego um, income to, you know, to stay in school. I mean, there's publicly available education, but it's still a sacrifice if you're poor. Um, and we also found that the aspirations were very persistent within it, individuals over time. So people with high aspirations tend to sort of stick to it. Um, I think we have a lot more to learn about why that is and, and what we can do to support it, particularly in people who don't have high aspirations. But there's, I think there's something really there. And then very quickly, in the US, which is a much less happy story, we interviewed both poor African American kids and poor white kids in Missouri, which is like the, that's called the, um, it's sort of right in the middle of the US. It borders on eight states. Um, and what we see is that the poor African American kids um, are, all have high education aspirations. They have higher trust in others. They have a mentor or somebody in their community or their family that supports them. Could be a parent, could be a grandparent, but somebody. And they, they tend, they, they're, they're conditional on graduating high school. The poor black kids in my survey are much more likely to pursue college than the poor white kids, even though the poor white kids are less materially deprived. And the vision that the poor white kids have, unfortunately, I think it says a lot about the US today, it's very self-reliant reliant vision. I can do it. They don't trust other people. Their parents don't want them to go to college. Their parents are skeptical of college the way there's a huge skepticism of science in the US now among certain groups, and it's become very ideological. But most importantly, they don't have hope. They don't have a vision that their future can be better. It's just not in their language. It's not in their discussion. It's not the way their parents feel. And you think about that and you wonder how, you know, this is going to be the next generation in despair. They're not going to have the tools to make it in tomorrow's labor markets. And I think it's, you know, the U.S. is an extreme case, but I think it's something we have to think about a lot, particularly as, you know, the well-being of the next generation is really important. And I think, you know, we really need to think about that in many other countries besides the United States. And I will stop because I've gone on too long. I do have some ideas about how we can do that, but I, I'll try and answer that in the questions, or you can read the book, which will soon be out. What do you see as the correlation or relationship between hope and purpose? Uh, I don't know how the exact numbers, but I think it's probably pretty high. I mean, they, they sort of fall along the same dimensions of well-being or the same direction and a lot of the same determinants. Um, I guess purpose is a bit more specific, and so probably particularly among younger people, low-income people who don't quite have, you know, they don't quite know how they're going to get ahead, but they're determined to do it. They may, I don't know if they, they, they it's a less well-defined purpose, let's say, but I would think they're, they're very, they're very similar. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. Could you say a little bit more about perhaps the link between hope and resilience, both in terms of understanding resilience as it is, but also in terms of promoting resilience in the future? Sorry, I didn't hear the last part. It was hope and resilience. Hope what? and resilience. So perhaps as a way of understanding why some people are more resilient than others, but also perhaps as a function of developing interventions around hope that would promote more resilience. Right. I, know, I mean, I've certainly thought a lot about hope and resilience, and in fact, our kids in Peru in the survey are really, every single one of our hopeful kids has had a negative shock. They have not been sick themselves. That's much more difficult. So if you lose your health, you know, you lose your, a lot of your agency. But other than that, people are amazingly resilient. And I've seen resilience among poor populations everywhere. Before I studied the U U.S. in so much detail, which is much more depression, depressing, I worked much more in developing countries and from Peru. And I found that the resilience of the poor was always something that really stuck at, stood out. So I think the, 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 the one thing that maybe combine or that separates hope from resilience is that hope maybe is the vision and resilience is the doing, right? So resilience is that you get through things even though it's difficult. But if you keep hope, you keep up sort of the sense that things will be better. I don't fully know. I think they go together well. I think they reinforce each other, as you say. 
I'm not sure they're completely separable comp concepts either. Um, I wanted to ask about whether there were any sex differences in the adolescent data, and in particular whether you've looked at um, one of the things we are finding is happiness with appearance is, is uh, very predictive of poor well-being for girls during the adolescent years. Uh, and I wondered if you'd looked at that at all with your data sets. I did not, um, but you said happiness with appearance. Yeah, I can, I can see that. And I think, isn't that also, there's some, uh, there's some evidence that's sort of exacerbated by social media, that, you know, that it's kind of this self-image thing. Um, we did, in our, our, our surveys were really more plain Jane about um, education, relations with parents and others. We, that really, we found that one thing that really mattered to adolescents was having a mentor having somebody that, they, that, that supported them in their aspirations. What was really amazing about the Peru surveys was that these parents who had never been to college, like the poor white parents in the US, but the parents in Peru all wanted their children to do better than they. It was like drummed into the, the culture of the, the country and, the, and, and of the adolescents, right? Um, and in the U.S., you, you're getting the reverse. Um, and the difference between African, the, not just African Americans, all minorities, and whites stands out along those lines too. That there's something, there's much more of a community around minorities, much more family ties, community ties, informal family ties. We're not talking about the Aussie at Harriet perfect family. A lot of our African American respondents only had one parent in the household, right? A parent had died or left or something. You know, this isn't the sort of, oh, it's the perfect marriage that makes kids, you know, have high aspirations. It was more that they had somebody they could trust. And that, that also showed up in just higher levels of reported trust among the minority adolescents. I mean, they even said their neighborhoods weren't safe, but they felt that they could trust other people. Again, you know, so these aren't Pollyanna findings. They know they, they live in difficult situations, and yet they have ways to get through them, right? And maybe that's resilience. A last question. Uh, wherever, wherever the microphone goes, I don't control it. I, hi, Carol. It, I'm Claire from RWDF. Okay. We haven't met in person. Great to see yes. you. Thanks for, thanks for this overview. Um, is social connectedness different than hope? Because you see in African-American communities in the U.S., as you just said, are deeply involved in the church or a faith community, which is social connectedness. So is that what hope is, just a slightly different framing? I, I don't think they're the exact same thing. I think they certainly reinforce each other. I think it's, it's much more difficult to be hopeful about the future if you think it's just you battling the world. Um, and the vision that the, the unfortunately, the, 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 the American dream, that you know, you work hard, you get ahead, you fall behind, you're a loser, you don't, you know, if you're poor, you deserve it, you don't su deserve social support, is a very lonely vision that worked very well when there was a lot of stability and stable jobs and you got a stable blue collar job and you were roughly middle class and you had a, you know, stable family and it, but and all of a sudden, the informal safety nets and communities that minorities had to form to survive because the system didn't work so well for them, right, has become an incredibly protective factor. And I think so, is, I don't think social connectedness and hope are the exact same thing, but I think they reinforce each other. And if, if, you know, if you're growing up and you're going into an uncertain world and you have social connections, again, whether it's your family or your community, it's going to help you, ha you know, meet your aspirations, and it's going to help you if you fall behind, and people fall behind, but you don't land, you don't fall without out a parachute, so to speak. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope this microphone is working very effectively. Do tell me if it's not. Uh, a huge thank you to the organizers, too, I'd, li I'd like to say. 
this is a man called Peter Turchin. He's a distinguished mathematical biologist who works in the United States. He's known for papers on phenomena like the so-called predator-prey cycles. And Turchin also works on cycles in violence and uh, upheaval, one might say, in human society. In a very brief note in Nature, in the year 2010, and then at greater length in 2012 in other, other kinds of publications, Turchin uh, predicted, I can't take you through the modeling today because there's too much to, to get through, Turchin predicted that there would be violent political upheaval in the United States around the year 2020. Probably everyone in this room knows what happened six days after the end of the calendar year 2020, and we won't forget it in our lifetimes. Uh, the, uh, a few days ago, Turchin very kindly sent me this slide, which I thought would be interesting to show to you. And you can see there his count with a colleague of the number of anti-government protests in countries like this one and the United States and in a number of other prominent Western nations. The striking uh, rise, the, the remarkably dramatic rise, is something that uh, we all need to know if we live in these kinds of countries. For those who don't follow the, the betting odds, I'm afraid I have a betting account, which I, I use really for scientific purposes. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a betting account with William Hill. In case you don't know, Donald Trump is easily the favorite to win the next election in the United States. And since I constructed this slide, uh, the odds have improved in his favor. Uh, when I constructed it, this boiled down to odds of three to one, if you like uh, thinking about odds in fractional terms rather than in decimals. The second favorite is a man called DeSantis. The North Americans in the room will know about him. Europeans may not, but he seems to share exactly the same views as Mr. Trump's. And he was, among other things, the army uh, legal representative and adjudicator in Guantanamo Bay. With my co-author Blanche Flau to try to understand what uh, we wanted to think of as extreme mental distress in the United States. A year or two ago, we published in the American Journal of Public Health a study using BRFSS data. I'm not going to go through all the data today. It's not the time. But that gave us a sample of about 8 million randomly sampled Americans, pooled cross-sections from the early 90s. And we focus on this question. It's one of the most interesting and concerning questions that got asked in every year since 1993 in this really quite important American survey. For how many days during the past 30 days was your mental health not good? For how many days in the past 30? And we decided to look at the proportion of Americans through time who said every day. Every day of my life is a bad mental health day, speaking loosely. So what's happened to that proportion in the United States of America? Here's one of the graphs in the American Journal of Public Health paper. I hope people can see around the corner there. And uh, there are many things to worry about here, but one is um, how linear the underlying trend looks to be. I've no reason to think it's uh, slowing down over the last few years. These are comparatively small numbers. I should explain that. On the vertical axis, we, we go up to 7.5% of the population, and you can see that only the females approach that. Uh, but, but this is really severe distress. It's interesting to look inside the, to cut the data into different parts, and influenced a bit by the important deaths of despair literature. Uh, I, I'd like to draw your attention to the light blue line. We don't have time for details on everything else. The, the light blue line rises from about four and three quarter percent of the population to about 11 and a half percent. And the light blue line, these are people who say every day of my life is a bad day. The light blue line is the white Americans without a college degree in this age group, which is a very large band of midlife individuals. Again, the apparent linearity of the underlying trend I wouldn't make that claim quite so abruptly in the statistics class, but I hope you'll go with me in this event. Uh, catches my attention. 
Let's turn to the mean level of distress. I've been showing you the um, disadvantaged, the heavily disadvantaged minority. And for that, we can draw on important new work by a man called Michael Daly, a talented Irish researcher, a social scientist, and a medical scientist, just out in the American Journal of Public Health. So many of you will not have seen this. It's just in the, the preview or the early view, whatever they call it. So it's officially not even in print. And leaving details aside, you can see that the typical Americans, mental health, I'm speaking like this is loose language, is, is also deteriorating through time in a secular way. There are many other concerning markers, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, about the, the US, and I'll come to the UK soon. It's very common in discussions of wealth inequality in the US for, for people to say, quite sensibly, the top 1% have XYZ percent of the wealth or the top 0.1% have Z percent of the wealth. But in a democracy, we might think it rather interesting and important to, to consider the, what you might call, I don't mean it in a pejorative sense, the bottom 50%, and half of Americans own 1% of the wealth. Now, I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen, but I wonder, could that possibly be an equilibrium, a long-run equilibrium? Could that be? There are many other uh, trends that worry me and probably worry you. This is the ever-rising number of shooting incidents in the USA. And I'm sorry to say, as you're probably aware, that since I constructed that slide a week ago, there have been a whole lot more. The number of guns in the United States far exceeds the number of citizens. That's the only country in the world for which that's true. And I read an interesting article in the FT yesterday which uh, claimed, I, I can't speak to the quality of the data, that the guns are getting more concentrated in fewer numbers, relatively fewer numbers, of citizens. There's been a huge fall in trust in politicians in the United States of America. In the late 50s, early 60s, about three quarters of Americans trusted their politicians. That number's about 75%. A few years ago, it had dropped to 20%. I don't have more recent data, but the data probably exists. From 75% to 20%, again, could that be an equilibrium in a society? Here's dis distrust, or declining trust, to be a little more pre precise in others in the United States, also down over a more truncated period. And uh, things are not much better in the United Kingdom. When I, when I made up this slide, I didn't think that our Prime Minister would be teetering on uh, resignation. I don't suppose he has resigned, but yes. has he? Yes. He has actually resigned. Okay, well, thank you. Yes. <laughs> anyway, the bigger issue for the whole country, indeed Western society, is... Uh, the disappearance of trust in Western politicians generally. And we see there, just towards the end of the Second World War, I hope that's visible, about one third of British people said that politicians are just out for themselves, one third. In uh, 2021, it had gone to two thirds. Feelings lead to actions, ladies and gentlemen, needless to say. And the feelings about income, if you look at the micro data, I had a small hand in a study with colleagues at Warwick, feelings about your income were a stronger predictor of voting for Brexit than your actual income. Okay, I think that's so important. Forgive me, I'm going to say it again. Feelings about your income were a better predictor of voting for Brexit than your actual income. Feelings of ha happiness and unhappiness are also powerful predictors of uh, voting for Mr. Trump and of populist voting generally. We have uh, colleagues in this room to thank for that very fine first paper and a young man called Adam Nowakowski who was a student at Warwick, now a graduate student, he was an undergraduate when he wrote this paper. Uh, he's now a graduate student at Bocconi. He showed that um, the same kind of effect holds for populist voting in many different nations. More broadly, Behind all of this, we have climate change. We have a tremendous secular increase in the number of natural disasters. 
I'd like here to give credit to my young colleagues Tang and Mohanty, who played a much more important role than I have in this joint project that, that's continuing. We are trying to use uh, geocoded data on small regions over very large numbers of countries to link what you might call temperature anomalies to disasters, natural disasters, and from those disasters, it doesn't sound a very cheery thing to say, onto the impact on human well-being. The project is still in very early days. We have increasing outbreaks of infectious diseases. Uh, this is by Smith and colleagues in the Journal of the World Statistical Society Interface. That's over 20, 30 years in different cases. It doesn't matter what kinds of diseases you study of this general sort, they're all trended upwards uh, in a dis disconcertingly powerful way. You'll be aware, especially if you have um, any kind of economics interest or training, that the, the rate of price inflation is spiking up remarkably. I became an economist more or less because of inflation and unemployment. I was a young man growing up in Scotland and I was trying to decide what to go to do at university and I rather liked geography and I rather liked mathematics. I'd never heard of anything about the subject of economics but I thought it sounded like it might be a mixture of those two. And I was concerned about the tremendous damage that I could see around me in the communities in Scotland. Tremendous damage from stagflation. It seems important to recall that, um, especially as uh, Danny Blanchflower, da uh, forgive me, Danny Kahneman, I hope I'm allowed that mistake, Danny Kahneman is in the room, that um, we can observe what you might call macroeconomic loss aversion. I'm sorry about too many Dannys, there's like too many Andrews. Uh, we observe tremendous macroeconomic loss aversion in data, and um, I congratulate my colleagues in this room who were co authors on this. I think of it as a very important paper. Let me draw to a close, ladies and gentlemen, and throw it open for questions because this is a highly experienced and uh, in many cases a very distinguished audience. I was taught for many years, uh, about 200 yards from here, I was taught to turn my back on all subjective experience because it was unscientific, anti-scientific to look at data on human feelings. I've grown to think that that was a very serious mistake. Nobody has to agree with me, but that's my, that's my judgment. The same general error, I believe it's an error, is uh, made all around us still. A well-known Financial Times journalist called um, Ganesh, Mr. Ganesh, whom I've, I don't think I've met, uh, wrote an article recently being um, excoriating of uh, David Cameron, the former Prime Minister, for the fact that he brought in what I would call feelings data, and that's my preferred term, to official national statistics. He wrote that of David Cameron, a former Prime Minister, only a fog-headed Sloan, that's a kind of London in insult, a kind of London insult if you know nothing about this jargon, only a fog-headed Sloan would think that way. But I'm afraid I think Mr. Ganesh is wrong. More than any point in my lifetime, I think we need detailed data on feelings of human resentment, frustration, anger, and most important of all, falling behind. It's probable that most individuals in this room don't exhibit these tendencies in a severe way, but many, many citizens in my country and the United States and other countries do. We have not been paying attention, ladies and gentlemen, and we need to start paying attention quickly. If governments had been tracking feelings data for decades, I, I believe that our democracies would not be in the danger that they currently are in. And I regret to say that I think our democracies really are in danger. Thank you very much for listening. Did I continue to use this? Okay. Right. So after that cheery set of slides, I'm delighted. <laughs> I suppose it's a bit early for a drink, isn't it? I'd be delighted, I'd be delighted to take some questions, sir, yes. So, yes, thank you for that inspiring and positive 
Okay. Uh, tying back to hope, are there things that you are hopeful about uh, in all of this despair that you put in front of us? Like what okay. are well, that's a rather interesting question, and that's a very difficult question. Are there things that I'm hopeful about? Um, uh, broadly speaking, I'm optimistic about the human race. This is just a personal view, and I'm not even sure I should express it, particularly in a scientific conference, but I view human society as on a general improving secular trend, but unfortunately with huge cycles around that trend, and that's, I suspect that's what I'm going to see for the rest of my life, I'm afraid. I hope my pessimism proves quite faulty, and I think in my country we'll probably be, as an approximation, all right. If I was an American, I would worry a great deal. But um, that's, that's considerably to do with the differences with the US and also the tremendous number of guns which we don't have in this country and most European countries don't have. I don't want to get into what you might call party politics and right versus left and all of that stuff. It doesn't seem to me entirely appropriate in what's really a scientific conference. But I'm hopeful about uh, human nature very much. It's just I imagine that we're going to need some major disasters, like the Second World War, like the First World War, whatever it will be that brought people to their senses about how humankind can best prosper. But we're going to go down, in my opinion, before we go up, I'm sorry to say. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I wonder, is there a, a common cause to all these trends in your view? Or is it sort of a coincidence that there's lots of trends pointing in the same direction towards misery? Uh, thank, thank you, Casper. It's a, it's a very deep and shrewd question. Um, if you read Turchin's work, which mathematically is based on, or at least I view it as analogous to predator-prey cycles, in animal populations, um, essentially what happens is that elites grow too strong. Um, Turchin talks about the overproduction of elites, which is a very interesting notion, and the, views the backdrop as being there are only so many, as it were, fixed positions that the elite people can really hold. So if you produce a huge number of individuals who think they're in the elite, that's a dangerous situation, and revolutions do not, by and large, come from the, work, you know, the disadvantaged workers. They do not, right? They come from disillusioned elites who are not themselves right at the top of a, of a society. So I would, I would think about all of that. I think there's a natural cycle to this. I guess that's what Turchin thinks. The elites grow stronger and stronger. I don't mean this in such a pejorative way as it might come out. It's, I think of it as a scientific fact. They grow stronger and stronger. They try to grasp the resources. The, the regular workers earn less and less relative to that, and eventually there's a kind of explosion. I, I can't predict the future in any accurate sense, and um, if you've never heard of Turchin's work, it, it is, it is remarkable to read it. I should also credit a co-author called Go Goldstone, Jack Goldstone, whom I've never met, who's a politics professor in the United States. And I think they worked independently and then eventually joined up. But I think there's just a natural cycle to these things. Uh, yeah, we have too many. Uh, hi, Andrew. Uh, Andrew Zeth from Gallup. Um, so, on a global basis, we see the world becoming... You're a little bit quiet for me, I'm afraid. Um, uh, Andrew Zaff from Gallup. Is it, can you hear me? Uh, even louder if possible, but do go ahead. Okay. So, on a global basis, we're seeing the world getting angrier year on year on year uh, on the world, Gallup World Poll data. Um, and so, you, you, show us, you showed a slide with increasing protests in democracies. Ultimately, we're also seeing those same underlying tensions in non-democratic countries as well. But obviously, those countries don't have the release valve of public protests. Um, from your predictions, what do you think is going to be, what's going to happen in those non-democratic countries which are facing very, very similar headwinds? Yes, I'm afraid I'm, I'm not really qualified to, to say too much about that. 
Um, other bad things will happen, presumably in some other way. Um, if people are deeply angry and frustrated, it's going to come out in some form, even if protest is not allowed. That, that's about all I would say. I'm, I'm afraid I'm not, um, I, I'm not a, an expert uh, on this, forgive me. Presumably even those nations have this kind of tendency to cycles and at some level, um, maybe it's even the case that what Putin's done in the last few months is, is an element in those cycles. Yes. I was interested in your perceptions of uh, how wealthy people felt and their association with Brexit. So I was, one of the arguments is that house prices have increased massively. And so therefore that wealth of those that voted Brexit um, was hidden. They didn't, they had high wealth, but they didn't feel that because it was hidden in their house prices, so they didn't experience it. And yet you've got a large number of very of younger people who cannot afford house prices. So the impact of uh, your uh, the housing expenditure has completely eaten into the income gains that you get from higher skilled jobs. And I wondered to what extent that change in the, the, the where the wealth and income is happening has fed into this cycle of misery and uh, despair. That's a very interesting idea, a very interesting thing to think about. We ran those regression equations on, on uh, individuals uh, a, few, a few years ago now, given publishing lags, and I can't remember whether we had any measure of housing wealth. I'd have to go back and check. But as, as you know very well, there's a difference between the flow of income and the stock of wealth. And in uh, expensive parts of the country, uh, you, your income per se may matter a lot. Even if your house could, in principle, be sold and you could move to the north of Scotland and buy a cheaper house. So I could well imagine that in day-to-day -day feelings, the income element would play a particularly large role in people's minds, even if only subconsciously thinking about their, their bank balances. We did have a bunch of questions on this side. So, no, 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 do, do take this, gentleman. Sorry, I don't mean to, I don't mean to be a nag. I'll be really quick then. Uh, I'm wondering what you think about the institutional con, uh, context. And part of the reason why is, you know, say, a lot of these negative trends have arisen, let's say, post-1980s. And there was a change in the policies and also globalization and mechanization happening at this time. And so if we took the Nordic countries as a, maybe a counterexample, uh, maybe we can alleviate these trends, uh, and then maybe it's not just a cycle that's, uh, say, biological or anthropological. Thanks. Uh, yes, perhaps we could chat afterwards about that, Kelsey. I, I don't have anything um, immediately to say, but you, maybe we could talk it over at Druid Coffee. Thank you. Um, so I, can you hear me? I was wondering what you thought um, the role of uh, increasing access to information might be in... The, the role of what information? Uh, access to information. Access to information, for, sorry. For people, so in terms of then them being able to perhaps compare themselves to others more easily and, and access information from various sources that might... Yes. Well, I think we know, where is my friend Andrew Clark? I think we know, um, many of us, that, of course, comparisons are just fun fundamentally so human. We just can't shake them off, and it is one of the curses of being human. I don't know a great deal about social media. I, I can imagine you're not that surprised by that. But I've, I do read the scientific papers, even if I don't look at social media. I read the scientific papers on social media and well-being. And it, it's pretty clear that, although first of all, we need to know more. Second, there's quite a bit of evidence of harmful effects, and I might call them comparison effects. I also take a keen interest in things like the market for men's watches. I don't know whether anyone here has heard my lecture on men's watches, but it's a fascinating market. If, you've, if you know nothing about this, you'd be shocked about the price of men's watches. You can spend £200,000 on a watch, 
And if you go on eBay and look at the price of men's watches and just run down for the first 500 or 1,000 on sale, new and second-hand, even after 1,000 watches, you, you're still going to have to pay £5,000 or something of that kind. Men essentially don't wear jewellery. You don't even know whether I'm wearing a watch, by and large, or you can barely see. I just think this is an example where, try looking around you, what I watch, um, international football, um, Premier League, soccer, all sorts of things, the Financial Times magazine, you are flooded with pictures of exotic watches. I walked past a store uh, yesterday, actually, and looked in, watches for £50,000. Well, I, we all carry a phone that's got the time on it, right? So you have to ask yourself, wh what is actually going on in Western society? And I think that this is just another example of the comparison effects that may have got more intense through a different kind of more traditional media. I just pass that on to you. If you've never thought about the market for men's watches, it, I think it just tells you so much about human beings. There's a lady at the back, I'm afraid, and a gentleman right at the back. I'm afraid I, I, I don't know the time. Final question. Final question from the lady. I'm sorry, sir. Do ask me afterwards. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. It seems like from your presentation, it's quite clear that wealth inequality is one of the major drivers of okay. a drop in, you know, political trust, social trust, levels of hope, you know, rising despair. And so my question is, especially since you come from an economics background, obviously the extreme levels of inequality that is seen in the United States and the UK is not inevitable, right? It's something that is by design as a result of a particular less. type of political or economic ideology. And so do you see, beyond just measuring feelings data, what can we do in terms of reforms, in terms of economic thinking, practice, and management to reverse these trends as well? What, gosh, what can we do? Uh, the, the most natural answer that an economist trained in traditional methods would say is uh, you have to raise taxes of one kind or another. And, of course, the remarkable thing there, if you hold um, my kinds of position, and I suppose values on life, is the remarkable thing is that in the United States and in the UK, the countries I know the best, most people don't want to raise taxes. They see their public services disintegrating, they want, in this country, a better national health service. We're going to need better defence because ultimately, probably, I'm afraid, we'll have to fight Mr Putin, but that's another story. So how do we get citizens to accept higher taxation to change the underlying distribution of income and wealth? Uh, probably through a disaster, I would think. I think it will probably take a disaster or disasters of some kind. Again, that's what the Second World War did. I'm sorry if that's gloomy. I'd be very pleased if we could change it some other way. And it is possible that, certainly in the European countries, including mine, that we might find um, a way to calm down the French protesters and the disgruntled British and so on. We may do that without a tragedy on a giant scale. I, th I can't see how that will be possible in the United States, but there, there are better scholars than I am um, who will have views on that. On that note, I think we'll have, go and have coffee. <laughs> I think we'll have coffee. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, John, thank you, Carol. Um, a lot to digest. Um, as, as if you haven't seen the program, we obviously have a half hour coffee break now, followed by, essentially, there's four rooms in this beautiful conference building. And uh, there are sessions on well-being and education, well-being and policy interventions, well-being and uh, economics, and well-being and measurement issues in well-being. And so take your pick um, uh, for one of these sessions that might be of most interest to you. Thank you.
two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two.
in any case, I'd like to be on time. Uh, we're going to have three uh, very interesting talks. And the first will be given by uh, Alois uh, Stutzer from the University of Basel. And I'll just hand over the floor to him. I think people will come in, but I'd like to stick to time. Thank you. Does the dream of home ownership rest upon biased belief? So this is the question that I would like to try to address in my short presentation. Now, the bigger question I'm interested in is what are people's intuitive theories of happiness and how are they formed? Intuitive theories of happiness uh, include beliefs about one's preferences, so about what one likes. One intuitive theory might be home sweet home. So the idea that happiness lies in owning an apartment or, or a house. Or in other words, the belief that this state would be enjoyed uh, a lot. Of course, this belief can be right or wrong. And if I can be made to believe that something is worse to be pursued and that, I would, and that it would make me happy, I can, of course, also be deceived. And this is an important theme brought up in the discussion about advertisement and consumption. And you see here two references, uh, two well-known references to this theme. There is, of course, um, another well-known uh, quote related to this issue, that the beliefs about our preferences can be erroneous. And this has been prominently claimed by Adam Smith in his book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And I just uh, read this quote. The great source of both the misery and disorders of human life seem to arise from overrating the difference between one permanent situation and another. And then he goes on with different examples. Now, what he raised as a claim, we, that is, Reit Watermatt and I, would like to understand asking the positive question. How good are people in predicting their well-being? And the focus in this presentation, we have done some research on this question before, is can we add additional tests studying the heterogeneity in people's beliefs and how, and how they are related to people's mispredictions with an application to home ownership. Now, in my presentation, I will start with a conceptual framework and then go on saying something about the empirical strategy, the data, and then the results. The conceptual framework is very straightforward. We start from a standard model of individual choice, underlying expected utility theory. So people decide based on their understanding of the probability certain states of the world materialize and their preferences. And we are used to the idea that people hold subjective preferences about these probabilities of the states of the world. We are much less used to the idea that we have beliefs about preferences. Uh, uh, we usually assume that we know the preferences perfectly well. But of course, oh, sorry. So that would have been the slide <laughs> with the conceptual framework. But it's easy enough that I think that you understood that. But here's the extension that we're probably not so used to. And there are many potential reasons why we hold wrong, wrong beliefs about our preferences. So there might be an impact bias or that we disregard adaptation, that we suffer a focusing illusion or that we hold specific theories that uh, guide us in the wrong direction. Now to address, empirically address this idea and to test it, we adopt a simple approach. We try to compare what people predict in terms of their subjective well-being with the actual realization. And we do that based on survey data. And importantly, we do that based on survey data that are not linked to a specific context. So people are not asked about their expected satisfaction with a particular outcome, but very general. Still, there are many challenges with this approach. 
because there are of course different drivers of a potential prediction error. Most importantly, we would like to separate it from errors that arise because people hold wrong expectations about uh, the probability distribution of events. But we would like to separate these aspects from mispredictions of the impact of an event or a life decision or the misprediction of the adjustment process. So the, the beliefs about preferences part. Now what we propose here to separate this is to anal analyze predictions shortly before or after a major life choice. So when people actually are pretty sure about the realization of a particular state of the world because they've already signed the contract uh, uh, for the apartment or the house so they know that they will uh, become homeowners. And then of course for the second aspect, for the second test, if we, want, if we want to understand heterogeneity, we need proxies for differences in beliefs. And here we propose to analyze predictions of people with different life goals, as they are likely to reflect differences in beliefs. Now, with regard to data, we draw on the German socioeconomic panel. These are repeated interviews with the same people. And interestingly, for some years, people have not only been asked about their life satisfaction on a scale from zero to 10, but they have al also been asked about their future life satisfaction based on the question, and how do you think you will feel in five years? And the scale is exactly the same, um, raising from completely dissatisfied to completely satisfied. When it comes to the application to home ownership, uh, I mean, this is a widespread belief and there is quite a big literature that these beliefs uh, seem important for um, people's purchasing beha uh, behavior. When we study the transition to home ownership, we study the status change from tenant to homeowners across two subsequent surveys and we restrict the sample to those status changes um, that occur for the first time during in our observation period and we restrict the sample to those cases um, where they also <laughs> actually move. So it's that, that they change uh, the, the place where they, where they live. Now with regard to the empirical strategy, we rely on or we extend an approach you're probably familiar with because it has been pioneered by the two Andrews that have been mentioned uh, before. So that is the study of patterns or um, you might also call them profiles of life satisfaction around life events. So in this approach you take into account the person's individual specific response behavior by a fixed effect and then you have a reference peri period three or more years before the event or the life choice and then you study the deviations year by year um, um, around this event. And we also include a series of control variables and importantly also age-specific fixed effects because uh, predictions vary dramatically by age. And then we do exactly the same based for the question on predicted life satisfaction. And so we can actually calculate uh, an overstatement of or an overprediction of life satisfaction. And I would like to show you that directly based on the results. Uh, please focus first on the black line. That is the pattern of life satisfaction around the event of actually moving from a rented home to a, a owned apartment or house. And what you see here is that relative to the reference level, life satisfaction is increasing. It is actually highest on average during the first year. They have moved in and it goes back again slightly. It stays above the reference level. Now look at the red crosses. These are the predictions relative to the reference level uh, that people hold for the their future. And what you see here, they are uh, quite high. So these are the predictions for up to in the last four months before they move in, the first four months after they moved in and experienced the new home and the fifth to twelfth month after they moved in. 
And now we com can compare that with the actual realizations later on and what you already see here, they are um, overestimating their future life satisfaction. And so these are the, these are the, the differences that you have seen just uh, represented in bars. And so the, the difference before when they have probably signed the contract, they know they become, uh, will move to their own home is uh, about 0.2 higher than what they actually realize. Now let me briefly come to the second test, whether this misprediction is related to uh, variation in beliefs. And of course these beliefs can have different reasons. Um, importantly for us, we would like to um, yeah, get a proxy for these differences in beliefs and we refer to uh, people's life goals. And here I think there is an important or interesting hypothesis that we can derive from value psychology where um, it is stated or hypothesized that extrinsically oriented people put more weight on the extrinsic aspects of a house purchase than intrinsically oriented people. So for example, they emphasize uh, the status aspects more. They see the purchase as an achievement. And if people adapt to these aspects a lot, and if we are, when we are poor in predicting this adaptation, uh, we get to the second aspect here, that these people are particularly prone uh, to overestimate the emo emotional benefits of consuming them. Now, luckily in the German socioeconomic panel, we can uh, operationalize these uh, life goals and this belief heterogeneity. So there, are, there is a classification of questions emphasizing extrinsic life goals and intrinsic life goals. And so we can calculate for every person his or her relative extrinsic orientation. And then we just split the sample at the mean, more extrinsically oriented people, more intrinsically oriented people. And if we do the analysis separately for the two groups, we learn that actually this general effect is driven by those who emphasize extrinsic life goals they really expect to be much more satisfied in the future around this transition to becoming homeowners uh, while actually, uh, yeah, they adapt quite a lot. Uh, there is no systematic overestimation for those with more intrinsic, with a stronger intrinsic orientation. So the interim conclusion would be people with extrinsic oriented life goals overestimate their future life satisfaction around the purchase of a home. Um, this empirical finding is consistent with the idea that beliefs about preferences matter for the accuracy of people's predictions about their experienced utility. And it's also kind of a, a validation of the underlying idea. So uh, let me draw some implications and conclusions. Of course, this could be uh, discussed extensively, maybe later on. This idea of misprediction of future well-being is relevant for choices to the extent that they rely on predict predicted subjective well-being. And this is what we usually assume, but of course that is uh, uh, not uh, given. Misprediction of future well-being is relevant for the misallocation of time, effort and money to the extent that there is a relative over uh, valuation of certain choice options or attributes. So it's important that it actually affects the trade-offs so that different choice options are affected differently. And finally, it's relevant for misery in life that is lower individual welfare than would be possible to the extent that misprediction is not functional for something else, also a big discussion. Now let me conclude and ask for the possible recommendations and I think that is difficult. Should we try to de-bias people or should we rather try to find out about the institution that foster reflection about beliefs? Uh, this involves also a better understanding of the suppliers of intuitive theories of happiness. So who are the actors? Uh, and what is the market for ideas of the good life? A question I think that is worth further study in future well-being research. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much indeed, Alan.
be delighted to take some questions, I know. Should we take Michael first? And then Sarah. I, I, thought, I, I really enjoyed that. I, um, it seems like the reason well-being research is useful is really only when it provides us with the value of information. So we need to know the difference between what we think improves our well-being and then what actually does. Um, so I was just actually curious if you could go back to one of your uh, last slides about the when you had the intrinsic versus the extrinsic. Yes, I just gave out the clicker out of my hand. So, <laughs> because it, so, so you said that the extrinsic people thought it would keep making a difference and the intrinsic people thought uh, didn't think that. But did you also split by um, the predictions depending upon whether those people, were those also, were those, or did you also split it by the predictions of whether those, uh, sort of the, the actual well-being of whether those were the intrinsic versus the in extrinsic? Because for, for me, it looked like they had the same effect, but the extrinsic people over-predicted it and the intrinsic people mm -hmm. under-predicted it. Yeah, so that I think that is interesting that we just could study the differences in the actual experience. And it seems that, uh, let me go back, sorry. So the, the pattern is indeed similar. Um, the intrinsic people seem to adapt less to the new state. So they might also buy a house or an apartment for different reasons that are, and so the adaptation to this might be, be less. While those who buy it, I mean, this is speculation because we do not really test this channel. We just can show that this orientation this, this, this heterogeneity in beliefs actually matters for the prediction error as predicted by the theory. But we do not know exactly the channel, whether they are kind of adapting more be because for the reasons they are buying it. But this is, uh, yeah, there is quite some adaptation here and they are not actually improving over the reference level. While those with a stronger intrinsic orientation, they actually have a long-term uh, improvement. Yes, so it's, it's interesting that they, the intrinsic people get more of a benefit, but they're more accurate. And it, so, so, so that suggests they're doing, they're doing something different in their choices as well. Okay, yeah. I think, yeah, that is probably interesting to emphasize also in the, in the interpretation. Yes. So I take a question from Sarah, and then take this lady next. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. I just wanted to check which country this was from, because I had to run out with a squeaking BB. So this was Germany? In Germany, and I'm just wondering whether there is any data on other... It would be interesting to have the comparison or with other countries where there is, or whether you've looked at anything with other countries, where there is different housing policies, or the, the option of not buying a house then has different implications and how that might mm -hmm. have lead to different... No, I think findings. that's a good question, and that's why it's also difficult to judge the first piece of evidence because this could be somehow time-specific still for the kind of house purchase that we are evaluating. And I think the second test is important for this because this is a differential hypothesis that would hold independently of some institutional features that are specific to Germany. Yeah. Question in the middle. Well, my question is, was, is similar. I, I wanted to know in which country this was because different cultures put different emphasis on the importance of on owning your own home. So if you ha would do this in France, for example, what do you expect that you would get there? No, I think that's a good question. That's why I emphasize these intuitive theories of happiness. And in Germany, and slightly also in Switzerland, but uh, slightly less, having this house <laughs> is so important and I don't know I don't know enough about France and I haven't done this cross-cultural studies of these intuitive theories but of course this would offer us some predictions that we might expect it to see more in the German context when we might see it maybe I don't know in in some other place where renting is perfectly fine yeah Um, I, I wonder whether people mispredict no matter what the event by 0 0.5 points or whatever it is, or whether the uncertainty associated with the event plays a role. And thinking of the German housing market where renting is extremely prevalent, 
you have a lot of people who buy the home they previously rented, and you know that in the SOEP. So you could probably look at the misprediction of people who know what they're getting because they already live there, as opposed to people who are buying something they, they don't know much about when you buy a new house, really. Just, just an idea if mm -hmm. there was a difference between the two. No, I think that's uh, very important, and I think we also compare it to people who change their housing but they remain tenants, because also this involves some uncertainty, and people, in fact, tend to overestimate their future well-being after a change, because, of course, they hope to improve with their change, but the, the effect is much larger for home ownership. And it's indeed smaller for those who remain in the same house. It's almost inexistent. So it's really th this change and related to uncertainty and what you can speculate, <laughs> all the dimensions you can improve and yeah, you can maintain these false beliefs much easier when you move to a new house than when you stay in, in, in the house that you've previously rented. So that would be the ex post rationalization. Thanks. Um, I was wondering, did you check for um, income or uh, how strongly these houses were mortgaged? Because I think there's a quite an interesting research happening on satisfaction from consumption that is financed out of personal wealth versus debt. Um, did you check for that? No, we don't have enough information to check that. And also repeating myself, but the second test is therefore quite important because if there were systematic patterns in the development of the mortgage market, we could maybe have this overestimation because they speculated on falling <laughs> interest rates and now they're going up. Uh, but this should not affect uh, this heterogeneity. Yeah, at least we would need to make a quite a complicated argument. Any questions? I'll take three more questions. <laughs> um, what advice would you give a friend who's considering buying a house based on this data? So I, I think to really to, to reflect and to, lo and to talk to a lot of homeowners and those who experience that I think would be wise to do. Uh, so I think we should really chat about all these important life decisions and not try to yeah, make this decision in isolation. So I think chatting about this stuff really is important. <laughs> And uh, of course, then your partner must be honest and not just tell about how great it is to, to have a, a big house. Yeah. Are there any other questions, perhaps particularly from the female members of the audience who haven't had a chance to ask? I'll ask a question, if I may. Um, we don't have here. Yes, okay. We don't have here housing satisfaction per se, do we? or predicted housing satisfaction. So I'm just thinking about what happens when you purchase a house. Almost inevitably, you have to start paying more money than when you were renting, in general. And in many cases, you will move to a different neighborhood. So you're losing a friendship structure, or at least part of, and you're paying more money. So I'm wondering whether we might be able to work out, maybe they're not mispredicting the housing bit of human satisfaction, what they're mispredicting is the costliness, you might say, or the, they, can't, they can't predict the other bit. And it would be extremely interesting to know if we could um, work out the different parts. Can we do anything on that? I think we could expand this research, and I think I completely share your intuition, and that's why I emphasize the trade-offs. If we emphasize, overestimate the the consequences of changes in every dimension somehow in this, to the same extent, then we might also think, oh, it's very bad to lose this network. And so we might get it right on average. But to the extent that we are not correctly uh, anticipate what the consequences are, also the long-term consequences of losing part of the network relative to what we gain in terms of material aspects and actually changing our expenses to spending more on housing, then we end up with this, uh, with this overestimation. And so I think that is uh, an intuition that I share, and I think we could 
maybe not on terms of predicted housing satisfaction, but we could look at housing satisfaction, satisfaction with the neighborhood to try to get at this specific channel. Uh, so I think that is a, I think that that would be worthwhile to understand the underlying mechanism. Yes, thanks. Th thank you very much indeed. I don't think I'll ever forget this interesting finding on intrinsic and extrinsic, having those very different vertical intercepts. Shall we give him a round of applause? <laughs> Our next speaker is also from Switzerland, I don't know whether directly, um, and this is Lauren Howe from Zurich. And uh, let me hand over to you, Lauren. Is good to be prepared. <laughs> Not so prepared. <laughs> Great. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm very excited to share some work uh, with my co author, Laura Georges, who's here in the audience today from the London School of Economics as well as Alexander Wagner and Jochen Menges at the University of Zurich. So as we've seen in the past years, over and over again, global crises threaten general economic stability, leading companies to suffer financially, um, jeopardizing their existence and the livelihoods that they support. So of course there was the 2008 through 2009 financial crisis that started in the US and ignited across the globe, the COVID-19 pandemic, and most recently, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, all of which, for instance, caused a steep decline in the stock market. In fact, the stock market shock prompted by COVID-19 was a time of unprecedented financial crisis, as shown in this graph, which is the Russell 3000 Index, or the 3,000 largest publicly traded companies in the United States, which represents in total 98% of the US public equity market. So from the time period of February 24th through March 20th, as we can see here, there was a really steep decline in the um, stock prices of these companies in the Russell 3000 index. In fact, this decline was even steeper than the one that occurred in this index from the 2008-2009 financial crisis. So as financial crises like these emerge, we might wonder what could CEOs of these companies do to help their companies maintain value and weather these intense financial crises. So as COVID-19 unfolded, I began to look at transcripts of earnings conference calls, or calls between top executives and financial analysts who were evaluating their companies. And I looked at calls in which COVID-19 as a crisis was being discussed as this crisis unfolded from January 2020 through March 2020. And what I was struck by was how different sometimes the responses that these CEOs gave when talking about the crisis were. So for instance, here on the left, we have the CEO of Zebra, a technology company, who talks about the COVID-19 crisis in a very human way. He acknowledges the human costs of the crisis. So he starts by saying, obviously, the coronavirus makes a very fluid situation. I'll start by saying our first priority is making sure that our employees, partners, and customers are safe. And this is a human story more than anything, I think. So in these very economically and financially focused calls, he's taking a moment to acknowledge the costs to human health and well-being that are part of the COVID-19 crisis. And this is something that didn't uh, happen with all CEOs. So here, just as one point of comparison, we have uh, Robert Painter, the CEO of Trimble, who's focusing mostly on just the economic costs of COVID-19 and how they might affect the company. So he says, okay, then there's the COVID-19 topic. We find ourselves in a more challenged environment here at the moment, and we believe we can still prevail through that. And we look at the long baseline record of the company, and we've sold in up markets and down markets and come out of down markets reasonably fast. So he's really trying to offset the analysts' concerns about potential economic costs of the crisis without talking about their human crisis, uh, costs as well. 
So we started to wonder is whether this brief acknowledgement of the human costs of the COVID-19 crisis might have any kind of tangible impact. So we wondered whether the focus that some CEOs show on human costs might pay off in some way. For instance, could these companies actually fare better on the stock market if CEOs focus on human costs as well as the potential economic costs of crisis? And the reason why we thought this might happen is that past research shows that CEOs' words in these earnings calls can actually influence analysts' evaluations of their company's worth, and that can actually translate into an immediate effect on the stock market, particularly because investors often learn a lot from analysts' evaluations about the potential value of a company. And we've seen that the language that executives use in earning calls can actually buffer against adverse market reactions. So for instance, when companies are revealing bad news in earnings calls, but they use euphemistic language to kind of soften the blow, it actually mitigates the effect of bad news on stock market returns. And just kind of reiterating how important executives' actions in these calls are, one a lawyer for a prominent Silicon Valley firm in giving advice to top executives about how to manage these calls said, successfully handling analyst conference calls requires the nuancing abilities of a diplomat and the patience of a saint. A slip of the tongue can send a company's stock price into cardiac arrest. So there's reasons to expect that what happens in these calls could actually reverberate on the stock market. So this led us to ask three questions in our research. First, how frequently do CEOs actually acknowledge a crisis human costs uh, compared to economic costs in these conversations with financial analysts? How might that relate to their company's stock returns during a crisis? And ultimately, thinking about this audience of financial analysts, how might CEOs' acknowledgement of a crisis shape financial analysts' trust in CEOs and thus their evaluations of a company's value? So let's go ahead and turn to this first question. What we did to get at this question was coded transcripts of earnings conference calls that took place during COVID-19 for mentions of human costs, so any kind of costs to health and well-being versus economic costs to business operations. And we found that among the 448 CEOs of publicly traded Russell 3000 companies who spoke explicitly about COVID-19 and earnings conference calls, almost all of them talked about the potential economic costs of the crisis, almost 97%. But just over half, around 51.8%, took time to mention human costs. So this happened as the crisis was unfolding, a very dynamic situation. We might wonder, what would happen today? Perhaps the COVID-19 pandemic made the human costs of crises much more salient, and people would be more likely to recognize them, even in calls with financial analysts. What we did to look at this question is actually conducted a study a couple of weeks ago where we asked business students to imagine being a CEO or a financial analyst in an earnings conference call during a crisis. And we asked them to prepare for these calls. For the CEOs, we said, you have a limited amount of time. What are the three top issues that you would talk about if a new and highly dangerous variant of the um, COVID uh, virus emerged? For financial analysts, we asked them to list the three points that they thought would be most important for CEOs to address. And we found, even now two years and counting into the pandemic, that most of the participants uh, in this study focused on economic costs. Out of the different costs that they mentioned, about two-thirds were economic costs, around uh, just over a quarter human costs of the crisis as a point for discussion, and some other topics. Interestingly, we saw then that around a third of those who were assigned to the role of CEOs never mentioned human costs, even in the wake of the crisis compared to almost half of financial analysts who are really focused on economic costs and preparing for these uh, potential calls about the dangerous COVID-19 variant. In fact, um, over one third of financial analysts listed only economic costs as talking points. So we see this kind of disproportionate focus on acknowledging economic costs of a crisis in earnings calls, um, less of a, a concentration on the crisis human costs that are also there. So now to turn to this next question, how might a CEO acknowledgement of a crisis human cost relate to their stock returns during a crisis? To look at this question, we examined cumulative stock returns, or the aggregate amount that a company's stock price changed over a specific time period. In our case, the time of this steep decline that I showed you on that graph when stock prices were plummeting in the US. So this is the time period where the crisis really unfolded, where national lockdown restrictions were implemented in Italy, and a time when most of the companies in the US were really experiencing a stark decline in stock prices. 
What we found is that the number of times that a CEO acknowledged the human costs of the COVID-19 crisis predicted their cumulative uh, returns during this crisis period. And we found that this relationship held when controlling for other um, measures that are standard in the financial literature, like leverage, cash holdings, um, size based on market capitalization. And they also held when we omitted outliers based on Cook's and leverage scores. Just to give you a sense of the size of this effect, um, a one standard deviation in acknowledgement of human costs was associated with 1.99 percentage points higher cumulative returns during the crisis period. So given that the median value, a market value of equity in the sample of companies that we looked at was 3.17 billion, this effect in total amounts to around 63 million of company value that was preserved in the wake of the crisis with a uh, more acknowledgement of human costs. And notably, this is a sizable effect when you look at other measures um, that affect cumulative returns in the financial literature. For instance, leverage, a key measure of financial strength that looks at uh, debt and companies, which was also a very um, influential predictor of returns during the crisis. And we see that the effect was equivalent to around 60% of the effect of a standard deviation increase in leverage. Okay. So we wondered, why might this effect be emerging? Why would we see an association between acknowledgement of a crisis, human costs, and cumulative stock returns? And this is where we thought the financial analyst might play a role, that perhaps a financial analyst responds positively when a CEO acknowledges the human costs of a crisis, that they evaluate companies' resilience in a crisis more positively in ways that could reverberate on the market. And we started to think about this when we looked into the text of the calls from the CEOs talking about the human costs of crisis. We kind of started to probe these calls deeper to explore what could underlie this relationship. So we used dictionaries that were created in the linguistic inquiry and word count software tool, which calculates the percentage of a text that has words that fit certain categories to explore what could possibly be going on in these calls. And what emerged was that we found that CEOs who acknowledged human costs expressed more benevolence in uh, calls. So this is expressing concerns about human welfare. And that benevolence actually predicted then higher cumulative returns. And we thought this was really interesting because benevolence is a key element of trust. In foundational theories of trust, there's kind of three different factors. Benevolence, concerns about human welfare, as well as ability, competence, and integrity, so being principled. So we wondered if perhaps what might be happening in these calls is that CEOs acknowledging the costs that the crisis has to human health and well-being might communicate benevolence to analysts, which influences their evaluations of this company's resilience in a crisis more positively in ways that could then reverberate on the stock market. So to try to get at this, what we did is created um, essentially a, a finance game where we gave a bunch of enthusiasts who we recruited over the internet from Reddit uh, where there's different sub-forums for people interested in different topics. So we looked at those who were pursuing a career in finance, and we gave them a one-pager about a company, based actually off of one of the companies in our sample, the Zebra Technologies uh, company. And we asked them to read some information about this company, and then to predict what the company's stock price was during the height of the COVID-19 crisis. So what we did is we actually varied whether the CEO in this one pager talked about the human cost of the crisis. Here again saying, this is a human story more than anything. Some of the people who were uh, acting as financial analysts in this study saw a quote that acknowledged human costs, but some saw a quote that only acknowledged the economic cost of the crisis or economic costs with some extra text to match the length of the human and economic costs condition. Then we had these finance enthusiasts estimate the dollar value of the stock price at the height of the crisis, and we also asked them to rate the CEO on items that measured benevolence, ability, and integrity, these three components of trust. So here, I'm um, kind of looking at the full results of our study in analyses that used our experimental condition as an instrumental variable in regressions to explore the link between acknowledgments of human costs and these possible mediators. We found that acknowledgement of human costs from the CEO's side increased perceived CEO benevolence in the eyes of these uh, participants acting as financial analysts. It also had a slight effect on perceived CEO ability, um, interestingly enough. But ultimately what we found is that there was only a significant path through perceived CEO benevolence to then the dollar estimates of the stock price during the crisis. And we also saw similar effects on another measure where we just asked the analysts to say how resilient they thought this company would be 
compared to other similar companies during times of crisis. So to put everything together into what we, we think is happening based on the explorations from these studies is that CEO acknowledgement of the human costs of crisis, how a crisis has these impacts on human health and well-being, can increase their perceived benevolence, which then positively influences analysts' evaluations of their company value and thus could translate into better performance on the stock market um, in times of crisis. So to sum up these kind of discoveries from this line of research, we find that CEOs in earnings conference calls with financial analysts focus primarily on the economic costs that a crisis might have. But there's a link between the acknowledgement of these human costs and company financial value during an economic crisis, which might occur because acknowledgement of human costs increases perceived CEO benevolence, which fosters these more positive analyst evaluations. So taking a step back to the broader insights from this research, we think that it's uh, interesting to continue to study and challenge this kind of dichotomy between the human and economic sides of business. Because we found here that acknowledgement of human costs could actually have kind of tangible financial value. And we think this can expand our notions of what constitutes effective leadership and crisis management, given that a lot of that literature has focused on the need to offset economic costs and threat to business operations in order to resume normality. And on a broader level, we hope that this uh, line of research contributes to societal discussions for the need for business to focus more on people, even or perhaps especially during challenging economic times. So thank you so much for your attention, and now I'm excited to hear your questions and discuss further. Thank you. Did you see any difference between the impact that that would have on a professional investment analyst vis-a-vis vis -vis a, an enthusiast, I think, in terms of uh, what you were talking about, and specifically commentary around the reaction that you're seeing for an organization like Unilever, which very clearly is displaying um, much more about the human capital, but yet is being quietly criticized from a professional investment with hedge funds and so on, saying actually this is not actually delivering the economic outcome that they expected. So did you see any difference in terms of your research? Yeah, so in our, our research, we tried to find kind of the best proxy for analysts that we could. So uh, we weren't able to find um, an audience of the kind of professional in the game um, analysts. So our, our best kind of proxy that we uh, could find were people who were pursuing a career in finance and who we assumed would probably think as, as in a way that was a, in a population that was accessible to us, hopefully as similarly as possible to the group of professional analysts. But um, I, I think what your question um, makes me think of is the fact that um, we didn't see in these calls that people were neglecting economic costs, for instance. So they still were taking the time to talk through the serious economic issues that their company would face. So it really was kind of an, an add-on to economic issues, but I get the sense that if CEOs were only talking about the human costs of the crisis and weren't able to address the economic issues successfully, then that would be a situation where perhaps that would backfire, maybe especially among those who are concerned about kind of delivering results. So in the sample that we had and the way that we set up the experiment, it kind of parallel what we saw in the calls that CEOs were talking about economic costs, I think we don't have the opportunity to look at whether this backfires if you're just talking about human costs. But I think given some of the literature that shows that if you talk about, for instance, corporate social responsibility or other things, sometimes it can be perceived as window dressing to kind of distract from more pressing issues. And I imagine we might see some similar backfire effects if the CEOs are deflecting questions about economic costs or don't talk about them at all. Thank you. Um, fascinating research, and I think incredibly important research. Um, so I guess my question is, you know, the, the, the outcome variable is, is really interesting in terms of, you know, the pure kind of stock market effect. Um, the independent variable, um, it was fascinating that you went and looked at actually which CEOs talk about the human cost. 
But of course, what a lot of companies faced in 2020 was, was a, a, a cost challenge. They needed to cut costs because their income was, stream was challenged, so what would they do? And some companies decided, we're going to save jobs. Your job is safe. And they made that announcement, and other companies cut jobs. So I guess a couple of questions here. One is, did you see any correlation in the analysis you did as to the CEO's who, who kind of talked about the human aspect of this and companies where they were saving jobs. That's kind of the first question. And the second question is, could saving jobs be viewed as an alternative independent variable, which might lead to a similar kind of outcome? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, and you know, in our, in our research, we ended up focusing on the CEO's kind of words and the way that it might affect financial analysts' impressions. But I think what your question um, makes me think about a lot is what might have CEOs done to, like, to act differently in the crisis, which is something that we didn't look at in the research. So for instance, did they adopt different policies? Um, we tried to get at this in some explorations where we looked at whether companies that would be more affected by social distance measures um, showed more, a str more strongly positive effect of the acknowledgement of human costs, thinking that perhaps that would be an indication that those CEOs who talked about human costs were faster to adopt policies that benefited employees in times where they had to shift to remote work. Uh, we didn't see any evidence for that, but I, I think that's just one proxy, and there's probably other avenues. And I, I think what's really interesting is some research showing that based on ideological differences, some CEOs chose not to engage in downsizing as like kind of a quick fix for problems, and they maybe suffered some short-term consequences from that, but over the long term, I think fared relatively well. So I think there could be more that's going on that's really interesting to explore through what a CEO actually chooses to do in a crisis. Thank you. Alois. Um, I have a question with regard to the interpretation of your findings, whether you have, whether this is also how you think about it when you relate that to a framework of, of efficient financial markets. So I wondered whether your interpretation is that the crisis was revealing new information about CEO characteristics, because otherwise I would have expected that these uh, characteristics of competence and benevolence have, would have been priced into the price uh, immediately. Uh, yeah, that somehow um, these attributes aren't necessarily already known in terms of a CEO's level of benevolence. Yeah, that's, I think, a really interesting question. I think it also would be interesting to look at potentially the interaction between those two variables. So if CEOs express benevolence, for instance, through other means prior to the crisis, does it matter if they expressed benevolence in these calls? I think it could, however, still be a more potent signal that they're talking about human costs in these calls at this particular moment, given that the calls have this kind of very economic uh, focus. So I think um, perhaps if you think about it as like signaling a CEO's level of benevolence, maybe that kind of reminder stands out more in a way that does kind of have this flavor of new information. Um, does that kind of get at what you yeah, were exactly. yeah. Hi, I work for a large international bank. Based on your research, what advice should I be giving my CEO regarding how they communicate well-being um, with analysts or just communication in general? Yeah, I think, you know, what I would say that I think is very interesting is that perhaps what these data reveal is a bit of a uh, mindset shift that could be needed in terms of, you know, seeing these calls as very pressed for time a lot of executives might think, you know what, I don't really need to address the human costs of the crisis. It's just these kind of throwaway statements that don't really matter, that wouldn't have an effect, or I don't have time to address that given all of the other pressing concerns. So I think maybe challenging that mindset to um, suggest that it's worth it to take a moment to just briefly acknowledge the human costs, the kind of wider context of the crisis and its effect in society, um, and that that's, that's maybe worth uh, taking a pause for in the agenda. Um, it certainly doesn't, doesn't seem like it can hurt, uh, so it might, might be worth um, taking some time as a, as a leader to acknowledge these societal costs. Yeah, I guess my question did speak a little bit to, to what you just said, and that I was interested in the idea of is benevolent leadership that 
brief moment in an analyst call and is therefore presumably a kind of expression of confidence more than anything else, or is it indeed indicative of a benevolent leadership style, which presumably would mean that this is a proxy measure for all sorts of leadership behaviors um, that you would need to get to? And is there any way we can distinguish um, between A and B there? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great um, point. Um, what I would say is I think there's certainly a lot of different ways that CEOs can express benevolence. Um, human cost acknowledgement is one signal of that, but there's certainly a lot of other ones as well, even like the, the policies that they choose to, to implement in a crisis. So um, I think, yeah, there's, there's other ways that benevolence could be signaled to ultimately have an influence. Um, what I would also say is that um, we tried to, to get at that a little bit with the experimental study by trying to hold other things um, constant and just varying the acknowledgement of human costs as, to look at the, the way that that would shape benevolence. So um, I think there could be, other, of course, other attributes that are important that um, signal benevolence that we didn't necessarily measure in our study, like CEO personality or other things um, that could be related as well. Whether their reputation on a platform like Glassdoor, for instance, um, would maybe have changed, which might be indicative of a, a broader leadership behavior that you could track. Yeah, I think that's a great idea for a potential control variable to add into the analysis, so thank you. Uh, so I was struck by the fact that talking about the human costs seemed good, but that so few CEOs and analysts thought to do it. And I wonder if you could address what was going on there. So, you know, you would think that if people knew this was important, they, they would do it, but it seems puzzling that they wouldn't know about it. Yeah, I, I think for me, um, my interpretation of that is that perhaps as this crisis was unfolding, it's very dynamic, there's a lot going on, people are trying to figure out how much their company is going to be affected, and what they want to do in these calls is really answer analyst questions, like reassure them that the company is on course and that it's going to weather the crisis successfully. And so I think maybe the gut reaction, especially given that so much, uh, so many of the ideas about crisis management focus on like restore confidence in business operations, that the gut instinct might be, we need to address these costs as much as possible. And we did see a good degree of variation in how often CEOs talked about economic costs, some kind of emphasizing them more than less. So I get the sense that that was perhaps a way that CEOs thought they would most effectively be able to restore trust is by talking about these economic costs um, and focusing on those. So I think maybe in those, having this focus on economic costs that the human costs just tend to get overlooked as something that's not quite as core to uh, managing a crisis. Um, does that help to answer your question? <laughs> Happy to keep chatting over lunch. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it, it, it still seems, so that, that sort of explanation is that for the CEO and the analyst, it's sort of a slip of the mind not to mention it. Because if you thought, well, you know, if, if the CEO had, had come to this talk and then, you know, COVID, next COVID hits, they would think, ah, one thing I need to do is, is I should remember to talk about people. Um, so it's, it's still sort of surprising that, that this wouldn't be a thing people would know to do if it is effective. So it, it's, it's surprising that it's surprising. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I get the sense that in a crisis, there's just so much time pressure and uncertainty that um, even these things that seem a bit more straightforward um, or could be acknowledged just tend to get kind of lost in the, in the chaos, perhaps. Um, as I think we've stopped on questions, I hope I might be allowed a, a tiny one. I, I'm trying to think what the, the transmission mechanism might be in this interesting finding. You, you, you wouldn't expect it to be benevolence in some direct way. So benevolence, or in, to be more precise, benevolent sounding statements are standing in for something else, aren't they? And I don't know whether you know the work by Edmonds. I think it's in the Journal of Financial Economics. Edmonds is at LBS on um, happiness at work as predicting stock market returns. Do you know that, that work? I don't think I know you, that yeah, particular I, paper. I can give you the reference. So the key idea in my mind is whether benevolent sounding statements are standing in for happy places, and happy places are simply more productive in the way that Edmonds found, and perhaps I don't know whether the glass door idea allowed you to check that, but of course there's the indeed.com rankings of happy workplaces. And if I were a referee, I might be interested to see what's the correlation between express benevolence 
across all these companies and their indeed score on happiness. Anyway, figuring out the transmission mechanism, if it's something like that, seems valuable. Yeah, I, I agree, and I certainly think there's a lot of different things that could be going on, um, not just the effect on financial analysts, like one possible pathway, but certainly through um, kind of other things that are happening at the workplace, the, the culture dimension on Glassdoor.com might be interesting to account for, for instance. So thanks for the suggestion. Well done, Lauren. We'll have a round of applause, I think. Our final speaker is from Pompeo Fabra and is uh, Sergio uh, Perla. Yes, um, um, very nice to have you here. Do go ahead. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, let me see. Yeah, so I actually, well, I'm actually moving to Aarhus uh, in Denmark for my uh, postdoc. Um, so, but I'm between jobs now. Um, and this, this was my job market paper, joined with my PhD advisor, uh, Jordi. So we know that last year, over 100 million people de descended into extreme poverty, right? Um, and, and this is a tragedy by, by all accounts. But if there is a silver lining, it's in the decades of scholarly research that shows that money tends to buy very little affective well-being, very little experience happiness. Now, these uh, decades of, of research are still a bit at odds with what we see every day, right? Uh, every day we encounter examples of individual and mass protests that are fueled by lower economic standards, and we, we see every day people that are even too willing to risk their lives to try to escape from poverty. So in this line of research, we ask ourselves, uh, are we missing an important component of the relationship between money and happiness? One commonality that is shared by past research is that uh, it has uh, focused on static measures of well-being. So it has focused on measuring well-being either once or on average. But two people can have the exact same average happiness and live completely different emotional lives. Um, moreover, we know from decades of research in psychiatry that fluctuations in happiness are key components of many psychopathologies, from uh, bipolar disorder, anxiety and depression disorder, uh, borderline personality disorder. Uh, fluctuations in effect is, are one of the key components of these uh, mental health issues. Averaging across happiness reports can also obscure rare but extreme moments of acute distress that can have far-reaching consequences in terms of uh, choice and decision-making. For example, overeating, substance abuse, or even aggression and violence. So in this paper, rather than looking, yeah, sorry, I hope you guys uh, listen to what I was talking about, otherwise, uh, uh, so in this paper, rather than looking at, um, at whether income uh, predicts uh, changes or predicts a higher average happiness, what we do is that we look into whether uh, income shapes the real of our emotional lives. And we do so using a data set of over 1 million happiness reports from 20, over 23,000 uh, French participants who pro whose happiness was tracked in real time using a smartphone app. Uh, participants uh, that had this app uh, received uh, prompts at, at random times and they were asked to report their happiness on a 0 to 100 scale uh, from very unhappy to very happy. Uh, we developed the methods uh, on how to efficiently measure fluctuations in, in happiness in a companion paper that we have with uh, Maxime Taquet, who's, who's a uh, researcher here at the uh, psychiatry de department. So our results uh, allow us to replicate past work that has established a relationship between income and average happiness, which is the, uh, this, uh, this plot. Um, 
but we also find a uh, robust relationship between income and happiness fluctuations, which in this example we operationalize as the uh, standard deviation in happiness reports. Now this relationship is extremely robust. So we consider uh, over 180 specifications with different uh, operationalizations of income, different treatment for missing variables, um, mostly, most important, the five main measures of affect uh, variability and instability that are uh, used in the psychiatry literature. Um, across these 180 specifications, the, the relationship between income and uh, happiness volatility or emotional volatility is, is jointly significant. And what I think is more important is that we also find this relationship when we look at this, uh, w when we look at a sample of individuals from uh, developing countries. So results are not only uh, specific to rich industrialized uh, individuals, but also replicate when we, uh, when we take a look at the emotional lives of over 25,000 individuals uh, from, from six developing countries. Now you're probably wondering whether uh, apart from being statistically significant, our relationship has, has some psychological uh, meaning, right? It's psychologically meaningful. Uh, and we do think so. Uh, if we look at the effect sizes, if we look at the differences in emotional volatility uh, for those earning 1,000 euros uh, per month and 5,000 euros per month in our French uh, data set, uh, we find differences in emotional volatility that are in the ballpark of the differences that past literature in psychiatry finds uh, between healthy individuals and individuals that have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Um, our differences in emotional volatility, oh, I see you cannot see the, the plot. Well, it's, it's around 0 0.4 uh, in both cases. Um, the differences between emotional uh, volatility uh, between low and high income individuals are roughly half in size of those uh, differences that we find between um, uh, healthy individuals and individuals with borderline personality disorder. So in both cases, these differences are not only statistically significant, but they, they, they're psychologically meaningful. Now, you're probably thinking that whether, um, yeah, whether um, our results uh, convey so, some form of information, that they're based on summary statistics, right? Like uh, standard deviation or, or some other summary statistics that, that reflect uh, emotional volatility, but don't really capture what, what, what is the shape of this emotional volatility. Um, so in order to really gain a deeper understanding of, of how income shapes the real of, of our emotional lives. What we do is that we consider uh, three different types of, of volatility, right? Uh, so we argue that volatility can take uh, three main, main uh, forms. Uh, can either be uh, that low income individuals experience more extreme uh, or frequent uh, periods or sequences of extreme negative effects. So uh, periods or sequences of extreme unhappiness. It could also be that these individuals experience more frequent or intense periods of extreme happiness. And it could also be that they just experience more periods or roller coaster increased uh, changes. So in order to detect these changes, we ran a uh, anomaly uh, detection algorithm that allow us to capture both points and sequences that are anomalous to a person's time series of happiness. Uh, and we classify these uh, anomalies into uh, the, the three types using a clustering algorithm. And then for this, uh, for each of these uh, clusters or for each of these uh, anomalous points and sequences, we uh, identify for each individual the, the frequency, the intensity, and the duration of, of these uh, anomalies. What we find is that yeah, the, the plot is not uh, very good, the quality in, in the projector. But what we find is that for periods and sequences of extreme happiness, money does not predict any of the, its characteristics. So money does not predict 
um, the intensity, the frequency, or the duration of points or sequences of, of or periods of times of, of extreme happiness. Uh, it does not predict the uh, duration, the the frequency or the intensity of those periods of extreme uh, changes of, or roller coaster type of sequences, but it does predict the intensity and the frequency of periods of extreme unhappiness. And what we see is that the, ef uh, the effect sizes, again, are, are quite large. So we know that uh, the difference in average happiness for an individual making 1,000 euros per month and 5,000 euros per month is around 4.5 points. Um, the differences in happiness during these acute periods of, of distress for, for these individuals are three times as large. So uh, approximately 13 points from 20 for low-income individuals to uh, 33 in a 100 uh, point scale. Uh, we also see that these uh, sequences of extreme, we, we also see that these sequences of extreme unhappiness are more common for low-income individuals. And uh, we estimate that the differences for, uh, for those earning 1,000 and 5,000 euros in terms of the frequency is around 30%. Right? So, so low-income individuals experience over 30% more uh, sequences of extreme uh, happiness. Finally our, uh, yeah, finally, our data does not allow us to clearly get at the causality of, of this relationship, uh, but we can use the exogeneity in monthly payments to see whether our results uh, are consistent with a causal interpretation of this relationship. Um, now, our main uh, sample is French, right? And so people in France get paid once at the end of the month, so what we see is that at the end of the month, um, low-income individuals tend to experience more anomalous uh, moments or sequences of happiness. But we don't see that for high-income individuals. Now, this is consistent with the causal interpretation. As we argued, the last few days of the month are, are when people usually are running shorter on, on, on money, especially low-income individuals. Um, so this seems to suggest that the relationship between income and happiness volatility is, is causal. Although further research needs to clearly get at the causality of, of this relationship. And so I think that's, that's basically it. Um, yeah, the, the main point is that income predicts happiness volatility. Uh, this is partially explained by the existence of these moments or sequences of extreme distress. And uh, these, these moments uh, of, of anomalous happiness are clustered towards the end of the month for uh, low-income individuals, uh, but not for high-income individuals, which suggests that the relationship is causal. If you, yeah, if you have mo any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Uh, if you want more information, I think the, the working paper is in my webpage, and you can also email me. Uh, and yeah, feel free to, to email me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I think the finding about the uh, low income and anomalous moments of happiness is really interesting. And I was just curious, like, what could be going on there? Like, is it, you know, really happiness that's born from feeling, like, great about having the extra cash? Or is it happiness that's born from a relieval of stress, for instance, where it's, you know, if you've been kind of burdened by thinking about this throughout the whole month and then uh, that stress is relieved, is that what causes the boost? And what can we kind of understand maybe about the nature of, of happiness at a, a deeper level, kind of from seeing that pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think my, or our research uh, talks a bit uh, to past research that, that shows that uh, typical moments of, of uh, extreme happiness, right, are moments of social connection uh, and moments when we are uh, surrounded by the people that, that, that we love. Uh, so what uh, seems to suggest is that, you know, it's, uh, or I think it talks about this asymmetry in the effect of money on, on happiness. 
So it does not really have an effect or on uh, on the positive side of happiness, but it does seem to, to, to have an effect on, on the negative side of happiness, which also I think goes back to some of the uh, some of the research that, that shows that the, the relationship between income and, and sadness is, is way greater than between income and, and happiness. Um, uh, so as to the specific mechanisms, I think we are still trying to work on that. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, hopefully we'll we'll get uh, a b like a better answer I in a few months. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll try to to look at the specifics of the you know situational context that that uh, that it can can explain a bit the, the relationship between income and and these extreme moments of of distress. Thanks, if I have permission to ask a question. Um, thank you for that presentation. Um, I'm interested in whether there's a baseline of, you know, be it poverty or what you call low income, if it's, for instance, um, somebody who is unemployed, does this still hold when it's not somebody who's just low income, but the idea of, you know, being able to support oneself, um, would that have the same pattern uh, or, or would that look different? So uh, specifically about like unemployment, we, we control for unemployment in some of our specifications and, and it still works. Um, whether, yeah, whether it, uh, it, it can be expanded to the, this idea, right, of financial hardship or like being able to uh, provide for, for oneself, uh, I think that's, that's a bit more of a stretch uh, with our data because we don't, we don't have much data on people's perception of whether, you know, like, how difficult they, or how much they struggle to, to make it to the end of the month and, and everything like that. Um, so, so yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't really get at that, but that's, that's a very, uh, very cool topic for future research. Yes, uh, so I was wondering how much information you have about context based on the survey tool uh -huh. you're um, using. And this, I asked this because I was actually surprised that you have this clear pattern that this distress goes up at towards the end of the month because mm -hmm. I would have expected that these poor people make experiences during the months that really hurt them because it's against their identity and it's really hurting their self and that is related to their poverty. And your story seems to be m more one of financial distress, uh -huh. and maybe it ha would help if we could know more about the context during which they are asked or, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so we have information on the activity they, that they are engaged, uh, the people that they are uh, spending time with. Um, and I think that's the, <coughs> that's the main uh, measures of uh, contextual information that, that we have. Um, the, all the, the surveys are type of in the moment, right? So ask in the specific moment. So I'm not sure uh, whether it could be uh, a matter of the past choices and, and identity uh, that, that, that could explain these, uh, these results. Um, I, I, think the, I think the most plausible type of explanation is the one about um, financial difficulties at the at the end of the month uh, but again uh, we need to to look into that a bit more um, so yeah I, I, I would say the, the, the most like plausible explanation is probably that you know lo low income individuals are really struggling it's also we also find um, for very um, for very like high income groups uh, we find some somewhat like a, an inverse uh, u shape in, in the moments of uh, anomalous uh, uh, happiness and, and correct me if if I'm wrong, but in um, in France you usually pay taxes uh, uh, at the like halfway through the month. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, no. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So uh, no, because I I I showed this slide with the inverted U shape, and someone say, oh, that's when. Uh, like rich people pay taxes, uh, but uh, yeah, um, I, I couldn't I couldn't translate the the um, the stuff from from uh, from France. So 
so yeah, I think I think the most plausible explanation is probably the the one about financial hardship. Uh, but it, I, I also think it is it's interesting the the idea of that it might have some identity costs uh, that carry throughout the month. I'm going to chip in then, if I may. Um, there are two other papers out there uh, with this finding. I don't know whether you know either of them. They're, they're, they're not published. So if you don't know about those two papers, I can tell you something about them, uh -huh. uh, which is good news in the sense that you're, you've got the right answer. Um, and I really like the fact that you've used the timing of the monthly salary slip essentially looking at the end of the month because I think those other two papers didn't think of that. So uh, um, that, that does seem important. As far as I remember, I asked the other two sets of authors when I saw these papers, they're working papers, may not be in the public domain at all, I'm not sure. I, I asked them about um, skewness, of course, and I don't think you talk much about the skewness of the distribution because, of course, w we'd like to know and uh, one or two of your slides were blurry, of course, so maybe it was in there, but we'd like to know whether really we're cutting off um, a lot of skewness on the downside in, in bad feelings by having money. You see what I mean? There's no reason to expect symmetry here. So do we know anything about the skewness of the volatility distribution? You with me? Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it's a very similar idea to uh, to our findings, right? So what we find is that the differences are on the extreme of the distribution of people's uh, emotional lives. This is what dri what, what is driving the differences in emotional volatility between low and high income individuals. So it would be the extreme. What I'm trying to find here is there an asymmetry where people, uh, when bad things happen, shoot down a long way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that money is st stopping that heavy asymmetry in emotional response. Mm -hmm. Do we know that? Yeah, yeah so we, we don't formally test that, that idea, but I, I think it, it is consistent with, with um, uh, the results that I presented on the anomaly detection uh, algorithm results, right? Uh, so we just see that the... the extreme moments of distress for high income individuals are not as, as intense or not as bad as, as the extreme moments of distress for low income individuals. So I think that's, that's a bit similar if I'm, if I'm uh, getting at it correctly. Um, similar idea, but maybe from, from different uh, approaches, right? Uh, methodological approaches. Okay, and if, if I'm just allowed to pursue this, because in principle we have a few more minutes, y you showed uh, monotonically increasing uh, happiness and income schedule, mm -hmm. and I slightly lost track of the x-axis, what the mm -hmm. numbers were, but the, for the volatility diagram, which was very interesting, s sweeping down, uh -huh. it did go flat eventually, or pretty flat, and I'm just wondering what kind of income level, in, like in real euro terms, real dollar terms, mm -hmm. what, uh, at what level is it, it going flat? Okay, uh -huh. 2,000, 2,500 monthly income or something. Yeah, yeah uh, I think the, uh, okay. the, uh, our top income uh, group is 6,000 euros per month. The, the what is 6,000? Uh, the top income group that, that right. we have. Okay, right. So if I get to that level of income, mm -hmm. then... Uh, Adding more cash to me doesn't change volatility. Exactly. Right, okay. That seems like a finding. Mm -hmm. Right. Shall we go and have some lunch, or would anybody else like to ask a question? Right, let's uh, give this gentleman a clap. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Can I just, just I mean, Andrew being Andrew, he worked at that. Is this the time to start? Uh, we're 50. Yes. Yeah. Oh. yeah, I would do. All right, let's do this. Hey, Elke, do you, is this on? Yes. Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. If I can have your attention, please. Hi. We, we need a. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed a lunch, and I know there were some productive conversations already. Uh, we have another set of three wonderful um, academic keynotes coming up now, followed by discussion. We will be hearing from uh, like this morning, three giants in the field um, who have each advanced the research frontier on different fronts. Thank you. Um, so, um, Cassie has advanced our understanding of time use and the role that plays in, that, the role that plays in our uh, happiness and well-being, and she'll be speaking about that later. Andrew, needless to say, as we all know, is the leading expert on income and well-being inequalities, and much more. And Claire has wonderfully pioneered incredible research on genetics and well-being, um, and it felt more than appropriate to give her uh, the floor right now. Um, we will be, we've asked them to stick to 20 minutes, um, after which is 10, min 10 minutes Q&A, just like this morning. And so once they've finished and you have a question, please raise your hand and one of our wonderful stewards will uh, give you a microphone. Um, so with that, please welcome Claire. Thank you very much, Jan. It's just absolutely wonderful to be here and have this opportunity to talk to you about genetics, which might be something a little bit new to some of you. Um, and the timing is wonderful because we were extremely excited to have a chapter in the World Happiness Report just recently um, that was exploring the biological basis of happiness. And today what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw out some of the uh, findings that we had in there. Um, and to give you a few examples of some of the work that uh, we've been doing in my group to really move the genetics of happiness forwards. So when we are interested in understanding genetic and environmental influences on happiness or well-being, a really key method that we use is the twin design. So these are identical twins, and we can use the differences in how similar our identical twins are who share 100% of their DNA sequence and compare that to how similar our non-identical or dizygotic twins are because they only share, on average, 50% of their genetic sequence. It's been an extremely popular and powerful method in the field, and it has allowed us to estimate the importance of genetic influences in creating these individual differences between us in well-being and a whole range of other traits. 
have now been two wonderful meta-analyses about genetic influences on subjective well-being. Um, and the results are shown here at the top. Um, they were published very, very close together by, by close colleagues, actually. Um, and you can see that the heritability of subjective well-being uh, and life satisfaction is in the range between 30 and 40 percent. That means 30 to 40 percent of the variation in the population is due to genetic differences between us. It's a really odd statistic, heritability, and it can take a little bit of time to get your head around it. Hopefully you've got it by the end of the talk. Um, at the bottom here is some results from, from my group, just to give you some context. If you're not familiar with genetic influences on um, psychological and behavioural characteristics, you can see that the uh, dark bar here tells us about the genetic influences on life satisfaction and happiness, and this is in adolescence. And you can see that the level of heritability is very similar to uh, the importance of genetic factors on traits like depression and anxiety. But what does it mean to find genetic influence on a trait? Well, one of the things it doesn't mean is that you are, have a fixed, deterministic level of happiness for your life. Um, actually, a lot of my research, my, my lab is called the Dynamic Genetics Lab, a lot of my research is understanding quite how dynamic our genetic and environmental influences are. So genetic influences are not fixed and they're not deterministic. The other really important thing to remember is that they're only part of the story, right? In the uh, twin design, we're able to estimate two different types of environmental influences as well. So we can estimate what we call shared environmental influences, which make family members similar to one another, and we can estimate non-shared environmental influences, which create differences between people. And you can see that uh, environmental influences are crucially important for aspects of well-being. But if you had to summarise, you know, what does it mean to find heritability for well-being? And what it means is that for some people, it's just simply easier to maintain high levels of well-being. What it doesn't mean is that you can't change your well-being. And I'm going to show you later on an example of how we've looked at heritability in an intervention study. So twin studies have been a really important method that we've used in the field. But for the last 10 to 15 years, there's been an, an increased focus on, instead of inferring genetic influence from uh, family uh, similarity, to go directly to DNA. And can we identify the specific variations in our DNA that are important in creating these individual differences in our well-being? This has been really difficult, <laughs> um, it turns out. So um, we, it's been an absolute global effort to be able to develop and refine the methods that we need to use to be able to identify the single letter changes, I'll refer to them as SNPs, it stands for single nucleotide polymorphism, but you can really just think about it as a single letter change in your DNA. Most of the large genome-wide association studies will focus on this type of genetic variation. And what we've learnt is that we need samples, perhaps an order of millions of participants, and we'll be looking at one to two million variations across someone's genome to be able to identify the single letter changes that are important in creating these differences between us in well-being. So when we have a genome-wide association study, or GWAS, you'll hear people say, these are the kind of key results that we would get from the study, and they're called a Manhattan plot. Um, and when we... Um, when we first started to do genome-wide association studies, it was completely flat. Manhattan. Um, but now, with more refined methods, um, we are starting to find and identify significant variations in our DNA that are associated with well-being. And these are two key um, uh, GWASs for subjective well-being. Jan was really involved in this one. I don't know if it brings him nightmares seeing it. Um, but um, in this first study up here, um, uh, by Ockbe et al, um, uh, led by the Social Science Genetic Association Consortium, three uh, significant signals came out of the, the genome that were significantly associated with our well-being. In a more recent study, but using quite a different um, measure, there's now more than 200 SNPs that have been identified um, from DNA that are associated with well-being. But... These estimates of genetic and environmental influence really just represent the starting point. And what I want to show you today is four ways in which my group has been trying to move these 
findings forward? How can we use this information that we now have about genetics to actually start to answer really interesting questions about the complexity of well-being in our lives? So, this is a picture. Um, <laughs> this is a picture, and there's chromosomes here. And every single one of these dots represents a significant genetic association that's been found. We have found so many genetic associations. The program set up to generate this lovely image doesn't work anymore. Um, so this is actually completely out of date, which just shows you the amazing, um, amazing collaborative progress that we've made in the field of genetics to start to identify the variations in our DNA that matter. And so when you have hundreds and thousands of um, DNA variations that have been identified, how do you then use them in the studies? How, 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 can, how can you start to use genetics in your study? Well, we know that traits like well-being, complex behavioural traits, are likely to be highly polygenic. And what I mean by that is they're likely to be influenced by very many genes, but each have a very, very small effect. And so one of the ways in which we are starting to use this genetic information that's been derived from genome-wide association studies is to construct what we call polygenic risk scores. And it is simply a weighted composite of all of the SNPs that have been significantly associated with the trait. So there are some variations on that, but that's how you can think about it. It's a composite of genetic risk, or um, I'm quite a positive thinker, so kind of maybe genetic liability. And this is a study that was published this year where we've used this polygenic approach to understanding resilience to peer victimization. So we've used a polygenic risk score for both uh, depression and a polygenic risk score for subjective well-being. You probably want to focus a bit more on the right-hand graph here, but essentially what we're asking with this analysis is whether we can use genetic factors to predict who will be resilient to social and environmental stressors. So who is going to be resilient? On this graph here, we've got well-being on the y-axis um, and victimisation on the x-axis. And you can see that victimisation in adolescence um, is associated with well-being in young adulthood. This is at age 23. And you can see that the more victimisation you get, the lower your well-being. In addition, you can see these lines separate the sample into the uh, polygenic risk score. Here, uh, the polygenic risk score for depression. Um, and you can see that there's an effect here. There's a main effect of both victimisation on well-being and there's a main effect of the polygenic risk score on well-being. What we don't see here is an interaction effect. So in this particular example, we can't say that genetics is the reason why some people are more resilient than others. And so for resilience to peer victimisation in adolescence, there are going to be other factors that we need to explore or we come back when we have refined our polygenic risk score further. But the point is that this polygenic risk score is just another variable that you can add to your data set now. So much hard work and global effort um, has gone into developing these polygenic risk scores. And now, in many of the samples that you use, you could request a polygenic risk score for depression or for well-being or, or for whatever trait you're interested in and combine that into your analyses. And I think there is real amazing potential to be able to incorporate that as an additional predictor. Now, the second example I want to talk to you about for my group is something that I'm really excited about, but that I found very, very difficult to do. And that's this idea of combining genetics with intervention science. Now, genetics generally needs really, really large sample sizes, and interventions tend to be on, uh, you know, large, but definitely on a much smaller scale to compare to the, the kind of samples that we need for, for um, genetics. So I did this initially by combining um, genetics using the twin design and an intervention study. So this was an intervention study for um, adolescents, 16-year-olds, and um, on the top left-hand side, you can see the results across the intervention. So um, we had different phases of the intervention where they did control activities, where they did the actual positive activities that were um, hypothesized to increase their well-being, and then we did a, a follow-up as well. And you can see that the intervention worked, which was wonderful. Um, so you can see that we, it, it's pretty flat while they're doing the control activities, and then we get this kick up in their well-being, albeit, you know, not huge, but there's some significant increase in their well-being in response to the positive activities. 
And that continues, it, it grows into the follow-up analyses. But what was innovative about this study, this twins wellbeing intervention study, was that it was with twins. And so we could decompose the variance in their well-being at different stages of the intervention to understand the dynamic um, way in which, which someone's genetic influences are playing out when their well-being is changing. And I think the single most important thing that you can take away from my talk today is in this slide. And it is that genetics is not a barrier to improving our well-being. It is not at all. You can see that the effects are completely different. So we can get mean effects shifting the whole population, the sample is the mean effect. Whereas what explains those individual differences between us largely remains as, as a genetic effect. And so that's what's shown here. We have genetic influences that are present at baseline and the size of the arrow tells you how consistent those genetic influences are across the intervention. So what we see is that baseline genetic influences are important and they continue to be important throughout the intervention. And actually, um, the way that we did the analysis tells us not only that baseline, that those same genetic influences are important for baseline well-being, they're also important for how people respond to the intervention. I think bringing individual differences to intervention science is a really important um, future direction, even if it is difficult to do. Um, and I think it can help us to understand why some people respond differently to interventions and therefore how we could use that information to understand the mechanisms of the intervention and perhaps the personalization of intervention to someone's particular genetic and environmental characteristics. The third example I want to show you from my group is um, thinking about how we incorporate the environment into these analyses. Now, I call myself a behavioural geneticist, and um, it kind of downplays the uh, importance that I feel the environment has, right? My title doesn't tell you, really, that I value both environmental influences and genetic influences. And what we need is those influences both in the same study to be, to be able to really interrogate what's going on. So if we think about the traditional model where we, hopefully, you're now convinced that there are genetic and environmental influences on well-being. And then quite often what we think is, well, I'm interested in an environmental exposure or experience, perhaps life events. Um, and the traditional view is that we would think about life events being an environmental measure that is part of this variance that influences well-being. However, there's so much evidence in behavioural genetics to suggest that it's much more complicated than that. And it, it shouldn't really be a surprise that the etiology of well-being, such an important and complex human characteristic, is going to be... Um, complicated. So we can have genetic and environmental influences on well-being and then we can have a look at how life events are associated with well-being and we can say well actually we find that if we put uh, a life events measure into a twin design life events are heritable. Um, so the sort of average heritability of life events is 30 percent. It's really almost exactly the same heritability that we find for characteristics of mental illness and for subjective well-being. So what does it mean? I mean, life events aren't actually, genetic influences aren't directly having an effect on life events, obviously. Um, and so we need to think about, well, what does it mean to find genetic influence on life events? And the gene environment correlation model tells us that um, what is happening is that there are genetic and environmental influences on life events, and some of the genes that are important for life events are because of the effect that well-being has. The genetic influences on well-being are correlated with the genetic influences on life events. And so in this study, we set about to explore whether we could explain the genetic influence on life events with the genetic influences on well-being. And if we can, it gives us an idea about um, how our genetic influences are um, influencing us to construct the world around us. So uh, these are the results... Um, from the study, and they're a little bit complicated, so I'll take you through them. So um, we looked at a whole range of well-being and, uh, and associated positive traits, um, and so those uh, different kind of positive traits are shown along here. And um, we looked at both negative and positive life events, so they're showing on your screen as red and blue. Um, and then uh, what I've did here is the proportion 
of the phenotypic correlation that's due to additive genetic influences. So what does that mean? So the degree to which there's a correlation between life events and um, aspects of well-being, how much of that is because of shared genetic factors? And you'll see that um, if we took an average across all of these different traits, that uh, on average, around half of the reason that life events and well-being are correlated with one another is because of shared genetic influences. And so this means that inheriting the propensity for positive traits might cause you to seek environments that lead to positive life events, and even to seek environments that lead to fewer negative life events as well. And the reason why we think it goes in that direction, um, so that it's your well-being traits that are leading you to um, seek out these different life events, is this really interesting finding here. And so um, this is uh, the results for gratitude, and this is the results for grit. And gratitude really, really stands out um, in our analysis. It's really completely different in very many ways in lots of the analyses that we do. Um, and here we've interpreted this as traits which drive behavior are more strongly genetically correlated. So traits that drive behavior like grit and ambition, they have a stronger genetic correlation than traits that perhaps follow behavior, so more reflective traits like gratitude. This makes us feel more confident that what we're seeing here is a true gene-environment correlation, that someone's genetic propensity is uh, causing them to seek out environments where they are more likely to experience positive life events. And so these advances in genetics have really helped us to answer more of these complex questions about subjective well-being. So the fourth example uh, and final example I want to show you is how we have been using um, the advances, the new results that we've got from genome-wide association studies about the genetic influences that are important for subjective well-being to ask questions about causality. And here we do, uh, and many of you will be very familiar with an instrumental variable analysis, but here we're using genetic information as our genetic instrument to be able to reduce the bias that we might fine from reverse causality and residual confounding. So we were interested to test a whole range of cardiometabolic traits, um, and they're listed uh, on the left-hand side here. And we were interested to test these because there's observational evidence that there's an association between these cardiometabolic traits and well-being. But there is, as yet, generally limited evidence about whether there is a causal pathway. Do these traits cause changes in our subjective well-being? And likewise, does subjective well-being change these traits? And of course, causality is a really important thing to establish if we want to develop effective and efficient interventions. The only uh, one of these variables which had, a, uh, had strong evidence for a causal pathway was from body mass index to subjective well-being. There was not strong evidence for any of the other cardiometabolic traits. Um, and so the reason why we might have seen those in observational studies before is likely to be due to residual confounding. We were really interested in this um, finding between body mass index and, and subjective well-being, and we were able to do a follow-up analysis in the UK Biobank study. And this allowed us to look at um, the different aspects of happiness and satisfaction that, that they have measured in that study. And we can see that the causal uh, pathway is driven, in this sample at least, by satisfaction with health. So the reason why body mass index causes subjective well-being is likely to be a psychosocial process rather than a biological process. So why are some people happier than others? Well, the short answer is that both genetic and environmental influences are both important in creating these individual differences between us. Mm -hmm. But I hope today I've shown you that four different ways in which we can move the science of genetics forward to ask these more interesting questions about the complexity in well-being. And that's by including polygenic risk scores in our analyses. Um, it's by uh, combining genetics and intervention, thinking about um, gene-environment interplay. And I really have only scratched the surface of the interesting things that you can do in terms of gene-environment interplay. And finally, it's using these advances in genetics to answer really interesting questions about causality, and that will lead to better interventions. 
So what can you do? I think there are two really important ways in which a really clever bunch of people like you could really influence what we're doing in genetics. The first single most important change that we could uh, benefit from in genetics is a consensus in how to measure well-being and how to uh, distinguish between different aspects of well-being. And the second way is to find a way for us to really truly foster collaborative work to study these genetic effects within the context of social and economic factors. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's absolutely fascinating. I wanted to ask about your conclusion that the satisfaction with health due to BMI is a psychosocial, um, potentially, you know, because isn't the satisfaction with health a combination of your expectation about what your health should be and what it actually is? Um, and not just, you know, do you see what I mean? So you should be unsatisfied with your health because, you know, you can't walk or you know you can't get out of bed <laughs> or whatever and that could be the causal pathway for you then reporting lower satisfaction in life yes yes i th i think there are lots of um, ways in which we need to unpack what's actually driving that uh, causal pathway and we were limited by the measures that were available um, to really uh, try to unpack that but i think what it shows is that it's not having its effect through the more um, hedonic aspects of well-being, and it's perhaps not having its effect through perhaps more biological factors um, and health factors. Um, and so it might be having its effect through stigma or through yeah, the perception that um, you're doing worse than you should do in terms of your health. But yeah, I, I say psychosocial very broadly there. Um, yeah, I think we need to unpack it a bit more. Thanks, that was really interesting. So on the use of genetics for polygenic risk scores and Mendelian randomization efforts to determine causality, can you say a little something about the um, strength of the instrument and what happens if you don't have a very strong instrument and the problem with inferences that could arise? And then a second question is, uh, my sense is that many of these polygenic risk scores even so far have been developed on majority white populations and so what are some of the issues if you're trying to apply some of this work to more diverse populations? Two excellent questions. So um, the strength of the instrument in Mendelian randomization is really, really crucial. And I think one of the main reasons why we don't find the causal pathway between subjective well-being leading to body mass index is because the well-being instrument um, is not a very strong instrument. In fact, the instrument that we used there was the, the three well-being SNPs. Um, uh, and uh, there have been new genetic variants identified and we need to repeat the analysis. Um, and so I was very careful because there's, there's, there's strength of evidence for the causal pathway between body mass index and well-being, but there isn't as yet strong evidence of a causal pathway from, from well-being to body mass index. And we absolutely, you know, as we do in all instrumental variable analysis, have to be very careful about the, the strength of that instrument. What we also find in doing Mendelian randomization studies for more behavioural and social characteristics, is that we need to be especially careful about pleiotropy. Um, and so uh, there are various different sensitivity tests that we can do in an MR study to be able to test whether we think it's actually pleiotropy, so the fact that genetic factors might be influencing both of the um, variables in our study. Um, and I'm lucky, I'm at the University of Bristol, which is the best place in the world for doing Mendelian randomization. So um, I've been guided by some, some great people, and I, and, and I think there's real... Um, potential for using this. As we identify more and more SNPs from the genome-wide association studies, those genetic instruments are only going to get better and better. And your second question, I've forgotten. Oh, yes. So you're absolutely right that um, genetics has a, a, a very strong history of um, only including uh, white, Caucasian, Western uh, samples in their analyses. That was done for, for kind of very good statistical reasons at the start, but there is a wonderful movement now in terms of um, increasing the diversity in genome-wide association studies. And we're finding that increasing the diversity is actually also improving um, the number of hits that we get, um, as, as I think you would predict, actually increasing the diversity. 
Um, and it's also meaning that um, the results can be applicable to many more people. It's a really important um, movement within genetics at the moment to increase the diversity. So we need people to fund the genotyping of diverse populations. A final question, one up here. Thanks, this is really interesting. Um, I have a question about whether there's a conceptual difference between subjective well-being and what maybe you could call like organismic well-being. So presumably our genetics have evolved under pressure to help us flourish in some way. Um, and then subjective well-being is, this, is, a, is a kind of different way of thinking about what's good for the individual. Um, is there any danger in um, kind of thinking about ways of using genetics to improve subjective well-being that lose sight of the organismic foundations for those genetic properties. So, for example, um, if, if you're really working on getting people to have a good mood response or a good life satisfaction response to life events, um, and then you don't take into account how a, a, a different kind of response might lead in the long run to something that's more organismically favourable. Is there, is there any kind of tension in that? I don't know that there's been um, a lot of research on that topic, but I think it's, I think it's really important to remember that, um, one, that the importance of genetic influences can change across the lifespan and in different environmental contexts, that different genetic factors might be important um, in, in different futures of the human population, right? Um, I mean, that's what's been driving evolution. Um, and so the, the, the single biggest impact of that is that once we've done the genome-wide association study, it's not the end. We actually need to reiterate, we need to go round and round uh, in terms of identifying what are the genetic factors that matter now in this particular population, in this particular environment. And I, that doesn't quite answer your question, but that's the kind of thinking um, where genetics is going. We need to be much more dynamic. These aren't genes for happiness. That's not the way that it, um, it works. Um, and so um, understanding a bit more about the mechanisms between those um, genetic factors and you know, human behavior is, is, is something that you can do to understand that, but also just accepting that these are gonna be really dynamic um, and we're not going to get a final set of genes that are, are important for something. We're going to have to um, reevaluate that as the human race develops. Thank you very much. Thank you. Incredibly long introduction. <laughs> Disappointment. <laughs> Okay, so I should be mic'd up. Um, I guess I should, oh, I should get my presentation. I suppose I should do that first things first. It's the University of Oxford. <laughs> oh no, there's more, okay. Um, so the first thing I'd like to say is thank you to Jan for setting this up and to the entire team who've been um, incredibly efficient and professional. So that's been fantastic. Um, I've got an unusual presentation, I think, in the current context. Um, I think there are three kinds of well-being papers. The first of which is what things make us happy. The second of which is much, much smaller and is linked to the validation literature, is what do happy people do in their lives, do they quit their jobs, quit their husbands, things like that. And then the third, which I'm going to contribute to here, uh, is using well-being data in, a <laughs> in an instrumental way, not quite how Claire uh, described it, but as a tool to understand uh, social or economic phenomena. And, and I'm going to contribute to the, um, to the third of these kinds of well-being research. I should say that this is joint work with Richard Layard and uh, Maria Cotterfan, both at the uh, London School of Economics. And the question, which is a very old question, uh, is how much inequality is there? And I'm going to look at this in a labour market context, so I'm going all the way back to Adam Smith. You know that you can find everything in Adam Smith if you look hard enough. 
And the question I'm going to ask here is how much inequality is there on the labour market? And this is, you know, it's a priori a very simple question. Who ends up getting what? Who ends up getting more? Who ends up getting less? What are the systematic patterns and, and, and how do they come about? Um, the difficulty here is that the returns, as economists like to call them, the returns we get are partly pecuniary, that's our pay packet, and they're partly the non-pecuniary amenities of our job. How much do we like doing it? How nice are the people we work with? Is it dangerous? Is it fulfilling? Things of that nature. And historically, and historically means up to about yesterday, we don't have good data on these non-pecuniary um, amenities. Um, so we are a bit stuck. The theory of compensating differentials says that if you have a nasty job, you'll get paid more to do it. The anti-compensating differential or rent-sharing approach or, 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 or result would be that able people, however you want to define able, are able to earn higher incomes and have nicer jobs at the same time. So this is a, a question about what we call compensating differentials. Do they exist on the labour market or not? And if we take job amenities into account, what can we say about inequality on the labour market? And that's our, um, that's our big uh, question. And as I say, we don't have information on job amenities, so we've run into a bit of a dead end on that one until, of course, we appeal to subjective well-being data. And instead of trying to measure job amenities and then trying to infer how much these matter to different people, and you may care a lot about um, work-life balance and somebody else doesn't, other people may like risk, other people are averse to it, so there's no standard set of preferences. Instead of doing that, we're going to infer the value of a job from subjective well-being data. So we're going to be able to split up um, the returns from a job into the pecuniary earnings, the pay packet, and then the non-pecuniary value of different occupations, we're going to be looking at 90 occupations, as inferred from the subjective well-being of the workers who work in those um, occupations. And we'll be able to make a statement about how unequal the labour market is and whether we've underestimated or overestimated it. And remember that a priori, we don't know which way round this goes. If there are compensating differentials, then we've overestimated the degree of inequality on the labour market. Um, so we'll be able to make a statement about that and then we can, um, using this, the same data in a sense, uh, make statements about the uh, gaps between men and women, between different ethnicities and things of that nature. So um, for those of you with a very short attention spans, this is the main result of the paper. Uh, we, we underestimate labour market inequality by only looking at um, income. And what does that mean? That means that people who earn more have nicer jobs. Okay, so this is rent sharing. This is not compensating differential where you earn more because your job sucks. This is not what's happening. We're finding the opposite. And the opposite to a fairly large degree in that we estimate um, that the, the, the real degree of inequality on the labour market is about one third higher than we would think just by looking at um, income data. Okay, so no evidence of compensating differentials in the UK or the US, whatever we do. Most of our results are going to be for the UK. Um, we also try to placate our potential referees by doing analysis 
on US data as well. So that's the main result. Um, you can switch off now if you wish. This is how we did it. We're going to be mostly using cross-section data. The five most recent waves of the annual population survey, this is the largest population survey in the UK, largest social survey in the UK. Um, we're going to restrict ourselves to workers of um, general working age, 20 to 65. Our well-being measure, Claire, this is the best one. This is the one we should use. Life satisfaction, <laughs> write it down. Uh, life satisfaction, zero to 10. And our earnings are going to be the log of hourly pay. And we have three-digit occupations uh, uh, as classified by SOC 2010. Equations. We can't, get, we can't get by without an equation, right? Um, so this, this is just a very, it's just very, very simple. It's um, an earnings equation. So it's a well-being equation, to get that right. Well-being equation of individual I working in occupation J that depends on a very small set of that individual's predetermined characteristics, their earnings, and then the occupation in which they work. So we're going to measure their well-being holding their earnings constant. In a way, by definition, this is non-pecuniary returns to an occupation that's going to be picked up by the Alpha 3J. It's, it's not a very sexy uh, term. We would probably should think of something better. But this has ended up being Alpha 3J. So if we write... For, um, what am I trying to say here? If we rewrite equation one as depending on x's and the full earnings, well, that's just rewriting this, where we define full earnings as your log earnings in dollars plus the value of your occupation expressed in dollar terms. So it's just being commensurate. Okay, We're going to express everything in terms of dollars, and this is what we're going to call full earnings of an individual, pecuniary and non-pecuniary, the question how unequal are full earnings compared to dollar earnings? And of course, the quick amongst you will have noted that that depends on the correlation between these two things. Okay, and that's what we're going to evaluate, and that's what's going to turn out to be positive. So there's more inequality than you think. Okay, uh, this is the only, it's not quite the only equation, it's the only main equation. Um, th this is a well, a cross-section life satisfaction equation on people living in the UK in, in the late 2010s, um, controlling for very little indeed. Remember that these are all workers, so they're all, all in work, in employment, um, and we get a fairly standard set of results. Women are a little bit happier than men. Um, these are, uh, this is standardised, I do believe. So this is 6% of a standard deviation. It's, it's not huge, but it's there. Um, and we get the classic U-shape in age that everyone gets, but nobody can really understand, nobody can really explain. And then we have our occupation and ethnicity uh, wave fixed effects. OK, so that's, that's the, the building block of what we're doing. And what we're going to be interested in are the occupation... I should stop doing this. Are the occupation coefficients in this regression, of which there are 90. And that's going to show you what jobs are nice and what jobs are not nice, holding the income you receive in them constant. And this is, this is the main result. Um, we have a, a, a summary figure for the standard deviation of log earnings, and that's 0 0.5. We have a summary figure for the standard deviation of the value of different occupations, 0.38. And then we have a standard, uh, we have a summary figure for the standard deviation of the value of those things two things put together, and that's 0.68. There is no automatic relationship between these numbers. This could have been smaller than that, or it could have been larger than that. It depends on the coefficient of correlation. Are they correlated positively? 
are they correlated negatively, which is a statistical way of asking whether there are compensating differentials on the labour market. And that's, that's what we're asking. And just to show you that this adds up, um, which it does, thank goodness, um, the variation of full earnings is just the variation of its two parts, the sum of the two parts plus the covariance. The co and this is what's going to be doing our work here. The covariance is, of course, the, multiple, uh, the products of the standard deviations times the correlation coefficient. And the co correlation coefficient is 0 0.14. Nobody is excited about that except me. <laughs> OK? I'm excited about that because that means that people who earn more work in occupations that are more pleasant. That's what that 0 0.14 positive figure means, which is against compensating differentials. And I think that's, that's coming on to all I wanted to say about that. Um, we have the world's largest set of robustness tests and checks and specifications. And, and, and it's all awful. And we, we, you know, we don't want to talk about that here, so we're not going to. Um, let me tell you, potentially, I think, just two more things. The first of which is that that's cross-section data. And unfortunately, we are not allocated to an occupation randomly. It would be really nice if we were, but we're not. So we have this selection of types. Happy people go to some places and miserable people do PhDs. Uh, in economics only. Um, so what we can do here is follow the same person over time as they change occupation from being a judge to being an economist or what have you and see how their well-being changes as they make that change. So this is what we call within-subject change. And then see whether the pattern of nice jobs, not nice jobs, is exactly the same or very different from that in the cross-section. And it turns out to be astonishingly similar. Astonishingly similar, the pattern... Uh, uh, 15 minutes remaining, that says... Five. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, we're, we're good. Uh, so this is astonishingly similar, which means that good jobs are good jobs, not just because happy people go there. They're, they're, they're really nice in a within-person sense that if you took them up, they would be pleasant. Okay. Here's an illustration of the kind of thing we're looking at. You can't read this, and neither can I. These are, um, oh, that's come up really badly. Yay, 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 yay. You can't see that. That's the vertical line. You can't see that, can you? Can you? It's, it's really rubbish, isn't it? Um, that's better. Okay, that's better. <laughs> it's magic. Um, what, what, let, let, me, let me illustrate our, our main findings here. Um, log earnings, so these are the 90 different occupations that we're looking at. Log earnings are given by the X. Okay, it's log hourly earnings uh, given by the X. The full earnings, that's the value of your income plus non-pecuniary, is given by the bar. If the bar is to the right of the X, you've got a nice job, a nicer job than average. If the bar's to the left of the X, you've got a, a less good job than average. What you can see here, going down the occupational ranking, is that mostly at the top, the bars are to the right of the X's. Mostly to the bottom, the bars are to the left of the X's. And that's just an illustration of that 0 0.14 correlation coefficient. Okay? And it's, it's not mechanical and it doesn't work for everybody. Let me give you... So th these, are, these are senior managers. So senior managers get paid a lot and they've got nice jobs. Um, we made a good choice, okay? Health and teaching, um, if I can find those, it doesn't matter if I can't, but health and teaching, there. Uh, they have, no, 
It's not there, I can't find it. Uh, it doesn't matter. If we find health and teaching there, they have non-pecuniary values that are also better than average, even though they don't always pay very well. So those are, those are very nice professions. Um, bad jobs, elementary jobs, routine admin, and those are going to be automatable, so I guess we're going to lose those, going to lose those bad jobs. And um, sales. Sales, absolutely, if anyone's ever worked in sales, they are absolutely, it's here, these are sales, so pay's not very good, but the non-pecuniary returns to sales occupations are absolutely dreadful. All right, I think that's pretty much most of what I wanted to say. Let me finish by telling you, the, just, just giving you an idea of the extent of the gaps on the labour market and how these change when we take non-pecuniary into account. I don't know if you can read this. This is a, a regression of dollar earnings, the non-pecuniary returns, and then full earnings, which is, of course, the sum of those two. Um, the gap in returns by education is a little larger when we take non-pecuniary aspects into account. So the educated earn more, but they have nicer jobs as well. The bigger movement we get is men and women. Uh, men earn more than women, as you can see for that negative coefficient there. But women also have worse jobs in terms of non-pecuniary aspects, in, in the sense that they work in occupations that are less pleasant. And we underestimate the real gender gap on the labour market. It's about one third higher than we think. And the situation, well, you won't be able to calculate this quickly, but the situation is even more striking with respect to some ethnicities. The black-white gap on the labour market is about 40% larger than we would guess only from the income that people earn. The uh, white Pakistani gap is about 50% larger than we would estimate only looking at um, dollar returns or earnings. Uh, so I think that's it. With, uh, I, I'm going to skip over the US results because they end up being exactly the same as those in the UK, of exactly the same nature. There's more inequality than you think and it's about one-third higher than we would guess from just wages. This is a summary of all the things I've just said to you, uh, and, and one of the most boring things is when people read through all the lines they've got on their slides. I mean, you can read that, right? You can read that. I, I don't need to say that. So th these, this is the summary of what I think we find in this work, and the last thing I really wanted to say is I... I, we could not have carried out this analysis without information on the subjective well-being of the people who work in these different occupations. We would still be stuck in the non-observability of amenities, but we feel that you can use well-being data to infer the value of those amenities, and that's, that's why we're so excited about it. So thank you, thank you very much. Wait, wait, wait. Thanks. Um, do, would you have thought of using job satisfaction instead of life satisfaction at any point? And secondly, there's quite a lot of within occupational variance yeah. in how people feel about their jobs. You've, you've abstracted away from that, probably yeah. not unreasonably, but I, I wonder if you've looked into that. Um, the reason we didn't look at job satisfaction in the APS is that it doesn't, it's not measured. It's not one of the big four well-being measures in the APS. It is in understanding society and the pattern of the results in the sense of inequality is, is, is very similar. The only qualitative, qual I can't say that word, qualitative difference is that 
non-job pecuniary amenities are more important relative to income in job satisfaction than they are in life satisfaction, which is understandable, because they're a central bit of your job, but not necessarily a central bit of your, the way you, 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 know, you live the rest of your life outside of work. You asked me something else. This is SOC, SOC three digit. Uh, we can go... Yeah, I know, but this is already three-digit occupations. Yeah, I know, but you've got plenty of ends within each occupation. I'm not sure APS gives you four-digit occupation. Understanding society does, but it's got a sample that's about 80% smaller, uh, which is a little bit of a worry. Uh, l let me just try and remember whether we did look at four-digit in understanding society. Okay, thanks. Uh, I wonder if you could just explain about, uh, give us sort of a story as to why you don't find this compensating differentials bit. So the sort of story is you, you could do a sort of boring job. Uh, much, let's say you're not very skilled, you could do a boring job, but then you could do a boring and dangerous job and you should get paid more in the second circumstance. So you're telling me that you, you, you don't find something like that or that's... No, no on average we don't. Uh, uh, I mean, there are, there are two forces at work here. One of which is if you do something that's unpleasant, usually you have to be compensated for it. That's the compensating differential. And the other of which is if you're an, an able worker who is in demand, in some sense, on the labour market, who has what we used to call bargaining power when we used to look at these things, then you can take part of your return in amenities and part of that return in dollars. And it seems that the rent, not rent sharing, but the, 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 the way in which you take your rent from an employer is, is outweighing any kind of compensating differential, um, any kind of compensating differential effect that might be at work here. Um, one thing that would be interesting would be to ask which bits of the labour market look more like compensating differential and which bits of the labour market look more like rent sharing. Um, and we did, I don't know if you remember this, Richard, we did do this, splitting the labour market up into people who work in the public sector and people who work in the private sector. And it's not perfect because not all occupations are well represented. Um, this anti-compensating differential result is purely private sector. There's no evidence of this in the public sector where the correlation between um, non-pecuniary amenities and dollars is essentially zero. But we still can't find any place where there are compensating differentials. Not even when we look at minimum wage jobs. We went right down to um, people who had hourly earnings within whatever it was, 15% of the minimum wage level. And even there, we couldn't find strong evidence of a trade-off uh, between the two. And you might imagine that minimum wage workers are those with very relatively little bargaining power and, and who would need to be compensated. So that was a very long answer, by the way, wasn't it? Um, did it work? Well, hold on, let, let's, let's, let's to go around and see if we've got any time. I'd, I'd like to know if you considered or you've not yet looked at the other three ONS, An anxiety and happiness yesterday and also purpose. You mentioned at the beginning you focus on life satisfaction because it's best, but it would be interesting to know how they looked and, and how that is influencing Sorry, I, can't, I can't hear you terribly well. Can you move the The, the, other, the other three on the ONS four, whether, were they absolutely out of, your, out of the study? And if they were, have you considered what, how they might be influenced with these differences in, in wages? So I'd I'm, like to know well, how it, One of the how problems purpose. with getting old is you, I just cannot hear what you're saying. I'm, can you, can you, what, what's that? Oh, sorry, yeah, I was just not blanking out. Yeah, um, no. <laughs> no, we didn't, we didn't. Um, and if not, why not? It's partly, sorry, it's partly because we, we're really 
a little bit wedded to this idea that life satisfaction is the most important of the four. Um, no, we could, could. I mean, we, we could. We could. We, we, I mean, we, we could, sure. Sure, I mean, I don't know what it, what does it mean to have effect? Could we do that? I guess, yeah. I mean, there are jobs where you have a lot of positive effect. Maybe that's, yeah, maybe that's a thing. I mean, my, yeah, my personal feeling, seeing as you asked, which you didn't, but I'm going <laughs> to let you know anyway. I mean, my feeling is that eudaimonia and these kinds of things broadly determine life satisfaction, which is the ultimate measure. But that's my personal feeling, and I could be empirically wrong. And of course, we could use those other three. Yeah. Quite that actually maybe life well, that, that's the worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we, 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 we could look at that. Yeah. Is the difference of status compared to actually how your status reflecting maybe aspects with life satisfaction, and then how your day is day to day, to day could actually have a different impact? Well, we yeah. I mean, you. I mean, the question is, what's the ultimate measure? of how good a job is. Well, I mean, this is, it's, it's actually not an obvious, uh, I should stop, it's not an obvious question. This is all the kind of work that Dan Benjamin and colleagues have been doing of what, what actually matters when you make a decision. Is it, I've, I've finished. It's, it's their fault, tell them to stop. <laughs> no, I, sh I, should, I should stop, sorry. Uh, who's in charge of this, me or someone else? <laughs> Shall we take one, one, more, one more question quickly, sir? I promise to answer quickly, and then I'll, I'll stop. So I'm going to say it quickly, because it's the same point. So I am from the Office for National Statistics, the home of the ONS4, and I would suggest the eudaimonic question would give you different responses, because analysis that we've done looking at income and the full four have shown that the relationship between eudaimonia and income is very different. And wealth, in that instance, plays more of an effect than income does. So I would suggest that what Sarah said. Okay, yeah, I mean, it, it, we, we just, yeah. So we did, <laughs> we did look at the eudaimonic question and work. And we find that your private sector, public sector, third sector thing is a good point. So we find that eudaimonia is higher for those in the public sector and the sure. civil society sector and those that look after the home as their primary occupation. No, I and there are differences in that. terms of job security etc. And in, in those analysis. So I think I'll, I'll share it on Twitter, but it, we've done it. Yeah. Uh, remember, I'm looking at occupation here. I'm not looking at sector. So I would be looking at occupations cross sectors, but I, I entirely take the point. Okay. If three people say the same thing. That means I should probably do it. Okay. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much. I should leave. Good afternoon. Let me make sure that we are. It is such a treat to be here, both the environment, which is beautiful here at Oxford, as well as an honor to be with this wonderful company. Um, I am Cassie McGilner Holmes, um, a professor at UCLA's Anderson School of Management. And I study the role of time in cultivating subjective well being. And in doing this work, it's sort of echoing. <laughs> in doing this work, it's, um, I've become convinced that perhaps more than any other resource, it is time. The amount we have, as well as how we invest what we have, that is critical for the enjoyment we experience in our days and the satisfaction we feel in our lives. And today I'm going to be talking about the amount of time we have. In a lot of my work, I've looked at the amount of time we perceive ourselves of having and left in our lives overall and how that influences happiness. Today I'm going to be talking and focusing on the amount of time we perceive ourselves as having in the day to day. And for many, this is not a lot. Individuals across the globe report um, constantly being in a rush, suffering from a hectic pace of life, 
Um, and this acute feeling of having too much to do and not enough time to do it is what we call time poverty. And this is a widespread issue. In a nationally representative sample of Americans, we found that almost half report being time poor. Though women tend to feel more time poor than men, and though working parents tend to feel particularly impoverished, all types of people lack for time, including those without children, those who are not working for pay. And this, the pervasiveness of this is bad news because in our uh, data, we found that time poverty is associated with feeling less positive emotions, such as joy and contentment, as well as more negative emotion, like stress, anxiety, and anger. We find that people who feel more time poor experience a reduced sense of meaning in their life, and we find that they're less willing to engage in behaviors that are worthwhile and fulfilling, like volunteering. The detrimental or have also been shown in others' research as well as across other dimensions of well-being. Uh, for instance, studies have shown that when people don't have enough time, they are less healthy. So they're less likely to exercise, they're less likely to go to the doctor when they're ill, they're more likely to eat fast food, which is not particularly healthy. People are also less kind less willing to take the time to help others out. They're less confident in being able to achieve their goals and are less happy. Being, <laughs> uh, so actually going back, I guess. Um, being a mother of young children with a partner who also works, I fall directly within that demographic strata of the temporally impoverished. I have felt extremely poor and have exhibited every single one of these negative behaviors and effects. And I know it was mentioned that our personal experiences and feelings, there's not a place for it in an academic conference, but I am going to share mine with the purpose of vividly illustrating the data as well as hoping to highlight the relevance of this issue. I have felt so time poor that I considered leaving my job as an academic. Um, I remember a night in particular earlier in my career when I was on the faculty at Wharton and I had given a talk that day in New York and I had almost missed, barely made, the very last train that would get me home to my four month old and my husband back in Philly. And I remember as <laughs> I sort of rested my head on the sort of cool glass of the window, and as I saw the blur of houses and the trees whiz by, I was realizing just how quickly life was passing by. And I was wondering if I could keep up. And <laughs> it was, you know, between trying to be a good partner and parent, the incessant pressure to publish and perform at work, the unending at home, it was all too much. Um, there simply weren't enough hours in the day to get it all done, let alone to do any of it well, let alone to enjoy any of it along the way. And in that moment, <laughs> it was like the single conclusion I thought to this experience of time poverty was to quit. I should quit my job, move to a sunny, slow-paced island, bring my husband and baby along, greater happiness. But then the question is, and I wondered, would I be happier if I had a whole lot more free time? If I had more hours in my day, would I feel more satisfied in my life? As a social psychologist, I'm like, actually, there's probably an empirical answer to this question. And so I looked to test it. I recruited a couple of my favorite collaborators, Hal Hirschfield and um, Marissa. 
okay, what is the relationship between the amount of discretionary time people have and their life satisfaction and happiness? In our first study, what we did was we analyzed data from the National Study of the Changing Workforce. And in that study, um, it asked participants, all of whom are working, on average, on days you're working, about how many hours do you spend on your own free time activity? The life satisfaction questionnaire, or question in the data. And what we found was a inverted or a negative quadratic relationship, an inverted U. Though it's not a big effect in terms of the effect size, the pattern is very clear. And what it suggests is that, yes, <laughs> so me, and I'm sure many of you actually have seen nodding heads, can relate. With too little time, there is less happiness. But it also suggests that having a lot more hours in your day to spend on free time activities won't necessarily lead to greater happiness. We wanted to test the robustness of this pattern. And so we looked to see whether it would replicate in a different that included both working and non-working Americans, um, as well as a different and perhaps more objective measure of discretionary time. So we analyzed. Um, data from the American Time Use Survey, which captures for tens of thousands of both working and non-working Americans how they spent the hours of their previous day. And what we were looking to do was to calculate how many hours um, individuals spent on discretionary activities. Then the question is, well, what counts as a discretionary activity? Since there isn't a standardized um, definition, what we did was we presented um, all the categories activities to another group of participants, or another group, separate sample of Americans. And we pre-registered that we would count any activity that more than the vast majority, more than 90% identified as discretionary as discretionary. I will say that the pattern um, is robust to when we use a more lenient threshold. So if more than 75% agree as discretionary, but based on this, the activities that we counted as discretionary included relaxing, so doing nothing, watching TV, watching a movie at home, um, active leisure activities, so playing sports, going to watch others play sports, going out to the movies, as well as socializing, so spending time with family and friends. And what we found was, again, that there was a negative quadratic relationship. Um, viewing the data in a different way, this histogram shows and suggests that with less than, at least within this data set, with less than about two hours of discretionary activities in Wednesday, that is experienced as less happy, um, as too little time. Um, with more than about five hours of discretionary activities in the day, however, you see um, that that is experienced as too much time. You also see this drop in um, life satisfaction. Oh, sure. Switch it over. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, is that better? <laughs> okay. We'll see. Time will tell. It's all about time. Um, so we wanted to sort of dig into um, explain this pattern of results. And um, with additional studies and analyses, we found that uh, for the too little time folks, they experienced higher levels of stress, and that is what contributed to their lower levels of happiness. For those of us who exist in that <laughs> sort of place on the graph, this is not at all surprising that we feel stressed out and are unhappy. Um, what is perhaps more surprising is this too much time effect. And what we found in additional studies and analyses is that Americans, and I'm going to say this is all of my data is uh, among Americans, and I'm especially among the many treats of being here is hopefully having meeting folks that with um, data sources that can look at these findings um, and look to see whether they um, extend across cultures. 
But among us Americans, we are driven to be productive. We do not like being idle. With too much time on our hands, we feel, and without anything to show for how we spend the time, we feel lacking sense of productivity and a lacking sense of purpose. And this is what seems to be driving this reduction in satisfaction with too much time. And this actually, I think, is what gets at the heart of the question that I was grappling with on the train that night and is a nice answer <laughs> to um, sort of discourage uh, folks who, um, away from joining the great resignation that we are seeing in the US, um, is that the answer is not to quit, um, per uh, particularly because so many of us find a great deal of purpose in our jobs. Um, what is, is also really interesting in this data um, is this middle sort of flat portion of the graph. Um, because it suggests that for a pretty wide range between two and five hours of discretionary time in the day, there's not a relationship between how much time people have and their satisfaction. Um, this is important because it suggests that except at the extremes, which are important to understand because there are so many of us that are sort of in those extremes actually, um, except at the extremes, this suggests that it's not so much a question of how much time you have, it's really a question of how you spend your time and invest the hours that you do have. And so when it comes to time and your satisfaction in life, this suggests that it's not about quantity and having more, it's about quality, how we invest what we have. Um, and then the question becomes, how should we invest the time that we have? Um, and there is a wealth of insights <laughs> in the science of happiness conducted by folks in this room um, and pulling from all of those insights and applying tools from those insights. I've developed a course that I've been teaching to our MBAs and executive MBAs at UCLA for the last um, few years. And it's been incredible to see the wonderful impact it has had, seeing significant increases on uh, my students' satisfaction, sense of meaning, sense of connection, um, as well as happiness from before the course to after the course. Um, seeing the impact, I then <laughs> was motivated to sort of pull those insights and tools together. In the last two years, I have written this book, that Happier Hour, which will be um, coming out in US in September, in the UK in January, um, which is an investment guide of sorts, but for our more critical resource of time. And what I am looking to do in order, my approach to solving time poverty is to inform individuals and at the individual level, um, give them the information so that they can make decisions how to spend our days so that they aren't just overly full, but that they're fulfilling. Um, and I am so excited, again, to be at this conference because with you know, folks here who are thinking more at the organizational level, at the community level, what are, I would sort of urge and invite uh, folks to think about what are some sort of policies and practices that we can put in place to offset the negative effects of time poverty. So with that, I thank you all for your time. I might. Yes. Yeah. I, I don't know if you need a mic, but I can. Thank you. I appreciate the insights you get in the, on the Northeast Regional. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. It, you know, makes you question your life. Um, you know, we found in, on the health side. Um, that um, what sometimes uh, we'll call non-compliant patients 
is a time scarcity issue. If you, if you compare outcomes of uh, diabetic patients who's managing their diabetes um, um, and you look at racial differences, it's not non-compliance, it's time scarcity uh, and the inability if you're taking three buses to get to a clinic, uh, you're just not going to show up on time. So the question on this one is how have you looked at time scarcity, time poverty? Um, as a multiplier of, of inequities, uh, particularly place-based inequities, transportation-based equities, uh, um, which get labeled as something else. Yes, and it's such an important point, and I think we, we haven't um, looked at it, but I think what you're saying is exactly highlighting the import um, and severity of time poverty. If you don't have the time, um, it keeps us from doing very important things like following, going to the doctor in the first place, following what the doctor tells you to do so that you are able to take care of yourself. Um, it's interesting um, in looking at the relationship between time poverty and uh, income, there is not a significant one. And, and it's interesting because I think that time poverty is experienced for different reasons at different sort of um, levels of economic wealth. So for the extreme poor, um, you don't have the resources to outsource. For instance, you might have multiple jobs to make ends meet. Um, so there you feel um, very time poor. Uh, you see at the folks who are, are higher in terms of economic status, that they also feel time poor, but I think for different reasons. It's that sort of increasing responsibility and demands from outside of your individual experience and more sort of in the professional realm. Uh, and so there with those competing pressures and demands, um, you, you see time poverty. Um, in terms of, uh, so I think, I guess to highlight just how important what you said is that it is critical to take into account um, time scarcity and how little time we have in lots of other behaviors in our uh, life. Thank you. And also, it's also interesting with respect to health. Um, this is anecdotal <laughs> with friends who are um, uh, uh, medics and psychiatrists. It's been interesting to see the uptake of um, telehealth uh, and how the COVID pandemic has obviously had very negative effects in very many ways. But one positive is that patients and doctors are more willing, they've been forced to um, re, uh, sort of start using telehealth, and that has reduced um, the sort of logistical constraints. Not all medicine can be treated remotely, but a lot can, and in particular, um, therapy. Yes. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, I was wondering if I could um, ask a narrow question about one of the impacts of COVID, which is the boom in remote work or hybrid yes. work, and the interesting paradox that seems to be emerging from that from a time perspective where, objectively, we can use our time in more flexible ways if we are working remotely or working in a, a more hybrid setting, but there seems to be an increase in self-reported time poverty, particularly from organizational workers. Can you talk a bit about that, maybe why that's happening, how we can potentially resolve it? Yeah, it's so interesting um, because what, you know, as we are working from home, as we know from day reconstruction um, uh, results, commuting is one of the activities that is associated with the most negative emotion. With COVID, working from home, that removed our commutes, so we, regained that time to potentially spend in better ways. Um, but another thing that we are, in terms of well-being from working at, from home, and I haven't conducted this data, but basically applying some of the insights from my work to what I'm observing, um, is the, another thing that we have come to lack is that social connection. Um, and the extent to which that comes from our workplace, that is, as we know from data reconstruction, um, results that the time that we spend engaging with others um, is sort of among our most happy. And so 
you know, hopefully we are re-engaging with those um, sort of around us, that not necessarily that social connection from work, um, but that is something that's lacking. In terms of how time poor we feel and the increase of the sense of time poverty, even though we have regained an hour from not commuting every day, is it comes from this um, sort of lack of differentiation between the time that you're spending at work um, as well as your personal time because it is all in the same space, all bleeds together. Notably, our way of measuring time poverty is subjective. So how much the amount you feel like you have to do and the time you have to do it. Um, by removing those barriers, sort of physical or sort of, you know, spatial barriers from this is my work time, this is my personal time, and it all bleeds over into each other. Um, it increases our sense that we should always be doing, we should always be on, always be working. And that is making us realize that we don't have enough time to, it's, it's exhausting, <laughs> is what it is. So for all of those reasons, um, this sort of, it will be interesting to think about as we return to being in person, what are the smart ways to do that? Because there are some gains of not commuting every day. Um, in the US, uh, the average commute is 30 minutes each way, so that's an hour of your day. Um, so maybe if we think about how not to do that every day, but how can we coordinate so that we show up at work and are able to engage with our colleagues and get that sense of social connection, um, get the ability to brainstorm together. There's an interesting paper that just came out about how working, sort of being remote in terms of coming up with new ideas with your group versus being in person. And what they found was that um, coming up with new ideas, the brainstorming part of strategy and decision making um, suffers from not being in the same place together, but actually selecting from those strategies you can do individually. So I think that as we are sort of going back to work, I and mean, we've been working the whole time, as we're going back potentially to the office, how can we be smart about optimizing the, our time with each other in the office and at home such that sort of all of our dimensions like um, of having leisure time and the break um, are all taken into account. Yes. Final question. Great. <laughs> Good. I mean, thank you so much. Um, I, I've always had a, a lot of sympathy with the view that uh, people are getting stressed because of lack of time and that this must be a reason for population-wide stress. But then I've always been puzzled by the fact that people are watching TV for three hours a day. I mean, this is just so difficult to reconcile one statement about the population with another statement about the population. So, so it's the reconciliation that the people who are, are time poor uh, are just, you, you say people like watching television a lot, that's your top thing. Uh, it's the problem that the people who are time poor are just not watching enough television. Yeah, so I actually didn't say that people like watch, t watching television a lot. Watching television was counted as a source of discretionary time, but of course there's lots of different ways of spending discretionary time. And we did additional analyses among the dis discretionary activities, distinguishing those that were experienced as productive versus not productive. And what we found is that the non-productive activities, so this is watching TV, um, this is where you see that really big dip, or larger dip in spending too much time on it. And as we know, people are not very good at <laughs> always predicting what activities that are good for them in terms of their own happiness even. Um, but what this also points out is this interesting thing where you actually don't see as much of a dip among the productive discretionary activities. So these are things that um, are like hobbies, so personal enrichment. Um, uh, playing sports actually um, pulled up into this. Um, and so what this is pointing out is that it's not so much, again, actually, the conclusion, it's not so much how much time you have, it's how you spend the time. And so, you know, I, I'm often asked among retirees, for instance, if they have so much time, then, like, aren't they all unhappy? And the answer is no. It depends on 
how they're spending the time that they have, and work shows that retirees who spend their time volunteering, which is experienced as purposeful and productive and worthwhile, you don't see that dip in life satisfaction. Um, so all to say, we should not be spending so much time watching TV. Um, so that's the conclusion. <laughs> Thank you. That would be lovely, thank you. People wanted a little break, a light biscuit, <laughs> and a right to be so. This is a great concept. What? This is excellent. Thank you, Danny. At the, at the research frontier in terms of measurement yeah. and understanding what people are doing. No, I was very, I was very pleased and I interacted with them afterwards. Are you comfortable? Yes. I'm comfortable, I'm perfectly comfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, because I can't do it here. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Okay. Close. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, everyone, if I can have your attention, please. <laughs> okay.
I have to say, I think we can get used to getting applauded uh, just to try and give people the <coughs> Thank you. Um, all right, it goes without saying that we are incredibly thrilled and honored um, to have um, Daniel Kahneman with us today. And we're incredibly grateful to you, Danny, for making a trip all the way from New York. Thank you. Most of you will know Danny and the fact that he received the Nobel Prize uh, in Economics for his incredible work on judgment and decision making and pretty much starting the field of behavioral economics. Um, but in preparing for, for this interview, I also looked up um, Danny's Google Scholar page and I couldn't believe my eyes. Um, so for the academics in the room, sit tight. Uh, Danny has 486,000 academic citations. <laughs> I see some people. I know I'm not raising the collective well-being of the academics in the room by saying this. Uh, for the non-academics, as an academic throughout your career, you can probably aspire to, if you do really well, about 10, 15,000 academic citations. So we're sitting, or I'm sitting, and we're all sitting in front of a legend here. Um, most of you will have read his book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, which brings all his wonderful research together in an accessible way. Um, what not all of you will know, or what is slightly less known out there in the public, is that Danny has had a very, and seems to continue to have, a very impactful line of research on happiness and well-being, which he coined as experience utility in the context of economics. We tend to talk about decision utility or revealed preferences. Um, it's also that line of research I found out over the years that uh, Danny started, I think, late 80s, early 90s, inspired people like Richard Layard, Paul Dolan, who's here with us today as well, to really turn their attention to this, to this line of research in turn. So thank you, Danny, for um, inspiring what are now becoming mentors to many other people. Let me start by asking your origin story. Um, why did you take an interest, or how did you come around to taking an interest in happiness and, as, and as well, experience utility? OK, it's a long story. Uh, <laughs> when I was working with Amostrowski on prospect theory, so that was in, in the late 70s, I invented a puzzle. And the puzzle was this. Imagine that you have an illness that requires you for treatment to receive one injection every day. And it's painful. Uh, and you don't adapt because it's once a day. How much would you pay to reduce the number of injections, say, from 20 to 15 or from 10 to 5? And it's immediately obvious that you wouldn't pay the same amount. And yet you should pay the same amount. And so clearly there was a distinction here between the utility that is experienced, where 20 is clearly twice as much as 10, and, and the decision utility. So that, that was in the back of my mind. And, and I knew that sometime you know, I would get back to it and to that project. And much, much later, in the late 80s and early 90s, I, I actually got to the question of whether people can predict their future enjoyment of things and whether people can correctly remember experiences that they have had and evaluate experiences that they have had. And the, there was a paradoxical result, which is quite easy to, to duplicate. We first found it in a questionnaire, actually, and then we, we confirmed it in various ways, which is that if you take an unpleasant episode and you add, and, and you add to it, you add more unpleasantness, but diminishing unpleasantness. The memory or the global evaluation of the entire episode improves. And so that led to the formulation of something that I call the peak end rule. But mainly, it led to the idea that experience and how you think about your experience are completely separate things. And at the time, I thought that experience is reality and that what we think about experience is just, you know, it's just biased judgment and, and the biases are interesting, but I thought there is reality. In. And so that's where, that's how I began uh, my work on well-being. 
That was the origin of the work on well-being. In the late 1990s, I think, I was invited by Richard Layer to give a series of talks at LSE, and I think I presented that work in one of the lectures. And it was clear, or it appeared to be clear, that life's, that well-being research was being conducted with life satisfaction questions. But life satisfaction is a judgment. So I thought, oh, all of this, we can redo the study of life of well-being with experience, and we'll find completely different things. So I engaged in that exercise with, a, with colleagues. We developed the, the day reconstruction method that was just mentioned, and that's how I became interested. Sorry for the very long answer, but uh, I'm not going to answer all questions at that length, <laughs> I promise. Well, no, but then I think people are here to, to hear you and to, to hear these stories. Um, I do want to, we'll get back into, because um, throughout the conference we've had a lot of information already about evaluative measures, life satisfaction, and the more experienced measures, such as um, affect and then happiness in the moment, the experience of it itself. We'll get back to that in a second, but I want to dig a little bit into that story of how the economics world then got to find out about your amazing work. And I think you were the first one to, in one of the very top economics journals, the Quarterly Journal of Economics in 97, publish a piece called Back to Bentham, uh, Explorations of Experienced Utility. And I was wondering, at the time, it was very much still revealed preferences, decision utility, the ordinal measure of, of, of utility that economists were using and to some extent are still using today. What was the reception of that famous piece that hit the, the very best journals? What, what, what your colleagues at Princeton in the economics department, did they dismiss this? Did they well, like think, this? What did they think? You know, I, I think the, it was ignored. I mean, you know, <laughs> like everything else that, that psychologists do. So I don't, the Nobel actually made a lot of difference. So after the Nobel, it was, it, it's been, you know, it's been read much more, but the initial reaction was very little interest, I think. And, and I should add, this was published after Ramostowski's death in a special issue in his memory. So it was barely refereed, if at all. And if it had been refereed, I'm not sure it would have been published. So. Uh. <laughs> Uh, we know of another famous paper uh, a few years later in the American Economic Review, one of the other big, big places, by uh, Andrew Oswald and others, which did go through proper review, and it also did make it uh, almost because of very tough referees. Um, okay, um, you mentioned already your interest in the field came through these the, the colonos colonoscopy studies and others with the peak and rule, and the the fact that sometimes. Um, evaluations uh, of or memories of the experience don't quite suit what actually happened. Uh, but then in a piece in 2018, uh, and I sh I, I've, I've got a copy with me here, Danny did an interview with Harrod magazine and the title of the piece uh, was the following, Nobel Pri why Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman gave up on happiness as a title, obviously very attention grabbing. Luckily there is a byline uh, but yet now considers life satisfaction of greater importance. As you can imagine, in the field of well-being science, that was circulating quite widely. Oh, I and didn't know that. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and we're keen to hear how um, um, you may not have fully transitioned, I gather, but how you feel today about um, the f which of the two measures could be an optimal criterion for policymakers or individuals to strive to optimize. Is it the experience or is it the memory of the experience? Well, uh, so I started out with the position that it's the experience and that you know life evaluation is it's just a biased judgment. Uh, <clears throat> and I was, I, I held that position for, for quite a few years and Eventually something hit me, which is that life satisfaction, well, let, let me add, we had a group that I set up, and, and the group was, the idea of the group was to get economists interested in well-being. I mean, the two Andrews had, were there, but they were pretty isolated. Uh, I brought Alan Kruger, who was a famous, the late Alan Kruger, a very well-known economist at Princeton, and a whole group 
to develop an instrument to measure experience. That was the, the day reconstruction method. And it enabled us to look at, quite specifically, what predicts life satisfaction and what predicts emotional happiness. And, and it turns out, you know, they're different in obvious ways. So life satisfaction is largely predictable as conventional success. So our idea of success in life is widely accepted and people measure themselves by roughly by that criterion. Happiness is primarily, at least in our work, it seemed to be determined primarily by who you are with, by whether you are peop with people you like in a pleasant interaction. And, and a lot of, so income was much more predictive of one than it was predictive of the other. There was those very large differences. So we knew that, but then, you know, something hit me that, that I should have seen earlier about life satisfaction, which is that life satisfaction is what people actually want. That is, when, when people set goals for themselves and make decisions, long-term decisions, uh, they're looking, they're actually, in the term that I use, they're serving their remembering self. That is, they're evaluating the outcomes, they're anticipating their memories, and this is what they're, they want to maximize. In short, people want to have a good story for their life. And, so I, I discovered that I had a theory of well-being that didn't correspond to what people wanted for themselves. And that seemed extremely awkward. And it's not that I gave up on, on happiness. I gave up on happiness as, as the solution. And it's not that I adopted life evaluation. It's just that I became totally puzzled and baffled. And I didn't know how to solve it. And I moved on to other things. <laughs> But hopefully this conference bring, brings you back in to some extent. Certainly. <laughs> but can I push a little bit on that point? How do we know that people may prefer the story of their life, life evaluations over the experience of it? Well, how do we know that? When you look at the determinants of life satisfaction, those are turn out to be goals that you know, many people aspire to. They, they turn out to be how people evaluate each other mm. as well as how they evaluate themselves. So that's, that's pretty obvious. And it's also obvious, actually, that if we wanted to maximize our experience, we wouldn't know how to do it. Because all we get to keep from our experience is our memories. And so maximizing experience is a very difficult thing. It's an art that uh, maybe, you know, maybe it's learnable, maybe it's teachable, but it's very different from life satisfaction and what brings life satisfaction. Thank you, Danny. Um, I want to uh, change tack a little bit. Uh, back in 2012, I received an email from you. And um, as a junior scholar, this is the kind of stuff that obviously uh, um, you never forget. And by the way, I, I've heard of a number of junior scholars after publishing a paper that you send them a, a note congratulating them on a paper or pushing their thinking a little bit further. So I want to thank you for that. And I know the other uh, junior scholars at the time also really appreciated that, so thank you. But in that email, which I looked up again like, to get the actual text, and it's something that has resonated with me ever since and I've been looking for, which is you, you wrote something, I'm increasingly troubled by the problem of labeling, labeling results by one pole of a dimension which reflects deep linguistic habits rather than the structure of the data. For example, and it's so simple and so clever, this example, and yet so telling, uh, suppose that, I suppose that being very short is more likely to make one miserable than being very tall to make one happy, but the relationship would still be described as connecting happiness to height. And I've seen that also picked up in, um, in, in studies where a lot of the action is often driven by the bottom end of the well-being scale, um, yet it's described as matching X to well-being or happiness. But can you, can you elaborate a bit on this for us? Because I know it still is 
something that you care much about. Oh yes, I mean, I, and that's one of the few points I think where Richard Laird and I disagree. I mean, I, the, I had always thought that we should be studying misery, and that and that <laughs> and that the objective of social policy should be to reduce misery rather than to increase happiness, and in part this was because the dominant view of what increasing happiness was at, at, at that time, like 15, 20 years ago, was positive psychology. And positive psychology aimed to change the way you think about your life, which, which is nice in a way, but it's also a very conservative message in some sense. It doesn't so much matter to improve your circumstances or to change your life as to make you happier with whatever you, whatever it is that you have. So I was questioning that, and I thought that reducing misery is, should be the objective. And that the focus on happiness, which is really linguistic, mm -hmm. uh, it's like, you know, we measure length and not shortness, uh, that the focus of happiness was guiding us in a different direction. If we were thinking of objectives of policy, that's what I thought. Let me say that this conference shows that, that I was wrong. But I thought that if you focus on happiness, you wouldn't focus on reducing misery. That was my... Right. It turns out uh, that uh, Richard Laird focused on happiness and on the reduction of misery, and that's very clear uh, in this conference and in the, in the book that you've written that I've just read, that, uh, that Many people are thinking about this and that, you know. And in terms of talking to the public, then happiness is a much better word than misery. That's, uh, that's clear. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm glad that we can get yeah. to stay scholars of happiness and well-being, um, but perhaps put some extra weights on the people yeah. at the bottom of the distribution scale. Um, I want to ask you, for all of us, especially the young scholars in the room, what are some of the big next research frontiers that you see? Where, um, you've, you've seen some of the sessions today, you've been thinking about this quite a lot. Where do you see the research frontier? Where, um, is it genetics? Is it experience sampling base? Is it Twitter data? Where do you think the exciting new avenues for our understanding of well-being will come from? Um, you know, whenever I'm asked a forecasting question, uh, I'm reminded of a, of a Hebrew proverb which said that prophecy is for fools. And, and I really don't, you know, I don't have any forecasts. I think that it's obvious that if you want to know what's going to be interesting in, in the next 20 years, 30 years, you should be looking at what graduate students are doing now. Mm -hmm. You know, I personally am fascinated by the brain, I'm fascinated by artificial intelligence, and by genetics, you know, I think that those are big departures, but I wouldn't forecast that this is really what's going to happen. Thank you, Danny. Um, it's been a great privilege to me to be able to sit here and ask a few questions, but I think I should, and I would want to share that privilege with everyone in the room. Um, who, if, if you have a question for Danny, um, please raise your hand and we'll make sure um, that uh, Stuart gets to you with a uh, microphone. And Andrew. I must say, it's a real pleasure to be able to ask a question like this. If you think about all the things that you discovered, think of the things you discovered, not just pure ideas. Looking back, what do you think was the thing that most surprised you? The one discovery that sticks in your mind as you were really not expecting that. Is there one? You know, it's very hard to say because when you really understand something then it seemed that you understood it always so uh, I think that the discovery that excited me the most that of discovery was whether people make non-regressive predictions and ignore base rates when they're making predictions that was that was quite new to me and surprising and exciting uh, other things that I've worked on are typically sort of main effects that are pretty obvious to introspection, so I, I haven't 
I haven't had deep theoretical insights that, you know, I deal with obvious things. <laughs> Questions? Ah, uh, Mark. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Mark Williamson from Action for Happiness. You talked about alleviating misery uh, as opposed to promoting happiness, but um, I'd love to ask you about the sort of action side of that, which is uh, at two different levels, really. What, what would be your top recommendation from what you've looked at for a policymaker, big picture, to try and alleviate misery where we're struggling? And also from an individual perspective, so many people are struggling right now with low well-being. What would be your top insight for an individual to try and help them get further up that, that well-being scale? Well, you know, in terms of social policy, what I'm going to say is trivial to all of you. Uh, I would say mental health and loneliness, you know, would be the first obvious concerns. And, and I think that, that they're widely accepted as, as aims, as, as goals for policy. Your second question was whether I had any... Adv what insight for an individual who might be struggling with their own well-being from your own... You know, I would say something very similar to what we just heard, that time is a very limited resource and spending it well is the most important decision that you're going to make. And, and making decisions and constraining yourself in the sense of setting up habits and setting up structures that, that make you use your time wisely would be my best advice. I don't personally follow it much, but... Casper. Uh, uh, you haven't given me the opportunity to say something that I wanted to say. That my, my main contribution to the study of well-being has been, was really to get Richard Laird interested in it. Uh, and my... And That is really something uh, that I feel very proud of, actually. <laughs> uh, and I actually made another uh, contribution that's not well known. Uh, I participated in the setting up of the World Poll. Mm -hmm. And I actually wrote the emotion questions. And it turns out, which I didn't know, that I convinced Jim Clifton, who directed the Gallup at the time, um, to, to use the Cantrill uh, ladder, which I know John doesn't like, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> can I belabor that point a little bit? Is because uh, we've now been talking about um, different definitions of well-being and, and what could be optimized, so it's more conceptual in nature. But the latest data, we saw this morning some of the larger trends in well-being by John and others. Um, what I know that you've been reading Jim Clifton's son, John Clifton's work, um, and his recent piece in The Economist about the disturbing trends that we're seeing on negative emotions. And do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, when I've... It's clear from the Gallup data, I mean, that's a huge change. It's like 10% increase over the last decade in, oh. in negative emotions. So when you see a finding of that magnitude, I think your first thought ought to be, is there an artifact? Mm -hmm. I mean, and... But what I, what I gather is that Actually, there are many data from other sources that broadly confirm it. Exactly. And this is huge because, uh, you know, things are really very stable in the domain of... Uh, and to see, a, to see such a change, and 10% is enormous. Can I... Um, it's actually worse than 10%. I looked up the statistics. In the last decade, it increased negative emotions globally, increased 20%. So, and it's especially worry and stress have moved up yeah. with about, um, what was it, about 25% of people experiencing them on a day-to-day -day basis in 2010. And that's now up to well above 30% of the time that people are experiencing these negative emotions on a day-to-day -day basis. What's really striking, I think, uh, is it what was... What I meant by 10% was not 10% of what oh. it was. I meant 10% in absolute terms. In John's data, it goes from 25 to 35% roughly. Exactly. Thank you, Danny, you're right. 
The, I do want to point out, I, I find that personally very disturbing too, in no small part because it's against the backdrop of growth, low unemployment, and the pandemic obviously exacerbated this trend. Um, and now at the end of the pandemic, it's come back on that negative trend uh, uh, that, that it was on. So it is something that I think we as well-being scholars should really be sounding the alarm bells on, just like Andrew Oswald did this morning, or John Clifton is doing in his pieces, is that these negative emotions are such a rising trend that um, it should be acted upon. Yeah, I mean, I certainly resonated to Andrew's talk this morning you know, that, you know, this looks like something that's getting ready to explode, mm. you know, certainly in the United States. Questions? I, um, oh, Casper, oh, you, Casper, you're ready to go. Thank you. And then Paul. So, so I know that you are, that you are not a prophet, um, but, but you were involved in both the experience sampling method and the, the day reconstruction method. So I'm just wondering, what do you think, how will we, maybe globally, measure well-being in 30 years? Uh, well, I mean, I have no idea, really. Uh, clearly, one thing that we didn't anticipate when we did the day reconstruction method, it, we thought of it as a very, as a substitute for experience sampling, which was impractical. You know, then shortly thereafter, uh, the, the iPhone came on the scene and the problem was solved. Uh, it's going, you know, we're going to continue to measure experience, so that's clear. It's also clear already, so I'm not making, you know, long-term prophecies about uh, 30 years from now, but wearables are going to, to come, you know, we're going to know a lot more about what happens to our bodies and, and this is going to happen soon. It's, it's happening now. And certainly those things are going to interact and to be used together. Uh, Paul Dolan, and then we'll go to the other side. Oh. Uh, Paul, then you, Hello, Danny. then Carol. Um, so you'd expect me to want to pick up on your comments about life sat versus happiness. Speak. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? <coughs> sorry, how's that? Better? Better. That's okay, better. sorry, thank you. Um, you would expect me to pick up on the life sat versus happiness question. Um, first of all, on what it is that people would want, um, now, of course, based on a sample of LSE students, which is not representative in any meaningful way, um, of a few they hundred of them. You. Can you, can you hear me? Then you can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Oh, uh, so we, have, we, we found that about 60% of them would choose life sat over happiness, but 40% would choose to be happy day to day over having higher life sat. So it's not obvious that people would choose life sat. Um, second point, you make, you make a really good point about time use. Um, I think time use requires us to measure experiential data because what we do, who we're with, and what we think about. Um, and finally, I just a quick uh, question, if I may. Your motivation for wanting to do this is to move towards life is that Which is kind of, kind of interesting, I think, because one of the reasons that I got into happiness research is one of the things that you, you know, showed and others showed over many years that people have. a bit silly. Uh, and so experiential data gives us at least some way of assessing or some way of covering the, the extent to which the things that people want. Oh my God, now you've got a microphone that works. All of that was so articulate. Now this is going to be so inarticulate. Did you hear all of that? Um, I, I understood most of it. Danny? Right, can I just, okay, so, okay, all right, so very quickly, I very quickly, very close to Paul very to quickly, him very quickly, time, about 60% so. about of people choose to be, choose to maximise life satisfaction over happiness, and 40% of our sample choose to maximise happiness over life sat. So that's the first point I made. Um, the second point is time use, we all agree, is absolutely central to our own happiness and well-being. That does require us, I think, to measure experiences more directly. Um, and then the third point was very quickly on the motivation and the goals that individuals have is a, not necessarily the best yardstick by which to judge which measure people should use because we know that people make all sorts of mistakes and errors in, their, in assessing happiness. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. 
Um, I think the first question really is, Paul did some work, uh, survey work at the end with LSE students, showing that 60% of them do indeed prefer life satisfaction, but that's not an overwhelming majority either. So I think Paul, thank you. Uh, so I think but Paul is, is cautioning you a little bit on, on that move from uh, affect I, to life evaluations. Yeah, on, on that question, uh, I think that what guides people in, the, in their long-term decisions is not a view of experience. And, and I was talking long-term decisions, not the, you know, if I'm, if I'm asked, do I prefer uh, you know, something today or something tomorrow, then I prefer something today. Uh, that's clear, and I prefer experiences when they are short term. I was referring to the long term, and in the long term, I don't even know what it would mean to try to maximize experience, but clearly maximizing success in life or maximizing life satisfaction, which is really, I think, I don't know which is a proxy for which, but it's clear that what defines life satisfaction in terms of its predictors is really quite conventional success and much less experience. And there were two other questions. Yeah, but maybe best to keep, take them offline between the two of you. Um, uh, Nuf. My name is Nofel Janebi. I came from United Arab Emirates University. It's, a, it's an honor to see you in person. Um, my question for you is an advice that you would give to a new researcher like myself. Sometimes those who are interested in the field of well-being, sometimes I find myself, I'm talking about my experience and my colleagues as well, that we struggle between defining well-being, measuring well-being, educating well-being, and in trying to influence policymakers at the same time. What advice would you give us? <laughs> I wouldn't give you any advice. <laughs> you know, um, you know there, there is a lot of diversity. People pick different things to do, and the, the mix more or less works out, and more or less corrects itself. And I, you know, as individuals, you really have the luxury of choosing your problems. And that would be the advice I would give, which is really trite. Thank you. Um, Carol. Danny, I remember years ago on the National Academies panel, you were discussing anger as a very different emotion. When we, go, when we had this discussion about the negative emotions index and then Andrew's presentation and the idea that this is all going to blow up. and I. I feel, I agree. I mean, I just finished how civil wars start. Um, so, but I'm wondering, it's interesting, and John Emanuel mentioned, the biggest increases in negative emotion are in stress and worry. And as far as I can tell, we aren't seeing huge increases in anger. We're seeing increases in public protest. And I was just wondering if you might, what you think of that, you know, particularly as if we talk about this being explosive, yeah. potentially explosive. <coughs> I think that what people mean, those questions about anger are personal questions. Did you feel angry yesterday about something that happened yesterday? What we are not measuring with these questions is sort of anger with the world. It's the kind of despair that uh, you know, we, we heard about. And that, I think, is a, it's, it's, not, it's not a kind of emotion that you would pick up in experience sampling necessarily. It is part of the way that people view the world and view their place in the world. And that is clearly getting worse. And in part, but only in part, it's probably because of the, the decline and the importance of religion, which I think provided some framework that, and the United States, you know, still pretends, uh, people pretend to be religious, but, uh, and that's where things are the worst. I, 
I know why uh, you refer to my saying that anger is a different kind of emotion, and that's because, in general, the negative emotions are associated with avoidance, and anger is a negative emotion that's associated with approach. And uh, physiologically, it is somehow halfway between the negative emotions and the positive emotions, and that's what I was referring to. I think we've got time for two more questions. Um, yeah, thank you, yes. Amanda. Thank you very much. Um, so you were talking about how, particularly around emotional happiness, it's so much about who we are with, so the importance of social connection and not feeling lonely. But I was wondering if you've done any research or have considered also looking into a lot of the like data around how our relationship with nature and spending time also in nature has huge impacts on our, our happiness as well. Um, the link between uh, well-being and nature. Well, clearly that's something that, you know, studies of experience sampling, I'm mm -hmm. sure, uh, are going to bring out to light that this has a huge effect on how people feel. It's the weather, it's nature, it's, you know, it's trees, greenery, water, uh, and it, and there are children in, you know, urban, the urban poor, who've never seen nature, and making that part of, making that part of education, and making sure that everybody knows the joys of nature, that I think is a worthy policy objective that's not about reducing misery, but it's really about something positive. Yeah. It's the wonderful work done by George McCarran and Mappiness and these kind of experience-based sampling using geotags as part of uh, iPhone pulse surveys. They've really been able to show very concretely the proximity to green or blue spaces, like the Thames, for example, in the World Happiness Report chapter, very positively related to how you feel, and especially if it's with other people, that you enjoy uh, spending time with, and even more so if you're doing it actively by moving, uh, such as jogging together. Um, last question. Uh, yes. Um, just going back to the idea of this experience versus the memory of, you know, uh, mindfulness, which I know Richard's a big fan of as well. We talk a lot about, you know, focusing so much about being in the present moment and not worrying a, about the future or ruminating about the past. And how do you acknowledge, how do you marry that with saying, okay, let's focus on life satisfaction or memory of things when we know a lot of research is showing that the more mindful we are, the more we are in the present moment, the happier we are? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there is, you know, mindfulness is actually highly active. I mean, you're doing nothing, but it's, but that you're actually completely focused. And I was interested when we were mentioning television earlier and the amount of television watching that there is. Television and mindfulness are both passive physically, but they are radically different. And so it's not that when you watch television, it's not that you're in the moment. You're, you're nowhere in some sense. Uh, and so being in the moment is a very different art. Yes. Thank you. Um, I wanted to say, um, when we started the conference planning, it became pretty clear to us that we wanted to um, come up with awards or prizes to recognize um, exceptional research and contributions at different stages in people's careers. And the first of three prizes that we thought up uh, was the Distinguished Career Award. And um, Danny featured high on the list to begin with. When we found out he was actually coming, it was decided pretty soon and direct who we would want to award the Distinguished Career Award in Wellbeing Science to. Now, we, we, we were joking at the center, needless to say, that it doesn't quite figure next to a Nobel Prize. But, <laughs> but, but, but Danny, please consider this a heartfelt thank you from everybody in the Wellbeing Science community. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Ooh, this is heavy. <laughs> Thank you. I will continue very briefly with the other two awards uh, that we are hoping to, um, to award. And the first one that we did is um, at a di very different stage in people's careers. We want to try and drag in the brightest young um, minds here at the university. And so we circulated flyers and emails to all undergraduates to see um, whether they could come forward with uh, research proposals, short research proposals to the point that we, would, that we would find really exciting to work with and help them uh, hopefully stimulate them to go into the field of well-being science and research. We limited this to um, uh, and opened this prize to individuals of underrepresented groups. It, it was very much also the um, the um, commitment of the anonymous donor of this £2,000 prize award that this would help underrepresented people in the field to um, hopefully make their way into our research community. Um, a lot of undergraduate students came forward with really cool ideas and there's uh, th uh, three of them who are here with us today and we ultimately selected one of them. But let me say that Eleanor Ford, Maggie Wang and Sophie Westhorpe really came forward with wonderful ideas and at the center, we ultimately decided that Sophie Westhorpe uh, would win the um, Student Research Prize for her wonderful proposal to work on the impact of the menopause on women and their well-being in the workplace. So Sophie, thank you. <laughs> well done. <laughs> The third and final prize, and last but by no means least, is um, also an, um, an award that comes with a £2,000 prize, which is funded by our centre. And this was uh, uh, the best paper award, to try and recognise extraordinary work by current scholars, really at the frontier, the research frontier, doing fantastic work. Um, you should know that for this conference, 90 um, uh, scholars apl applied and responded to our call for papers of which we then selected 24 to be presented in the parallel sessions that you've already seen earlier today. And the next series of that uh, 12 papers is being presented in the next hour after the coffee break. Um, out of those 24, um, we, we put up a committee um, chaired uh, by uh, Professor Andrew Oswald and committee members were uh, Drs. Casper Kaiser, Lucia Macchia and uh, Alberto Prati. And I would like to call um, Andrew to come forward to um, to award the best paper award to extraordinary work taking place at this very moment. Uh, well, thank you very much, Jan, and um, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, once again, I should emphasize, I speak on behalf of uh, a group. Uh, it seems to me that research is best thought of as a group activity, although all humans, we all have a certain degree of ego, but for the sake of science, it, uh, I believe it's valuable to try to downplay that somewhat and to think of it as a collaborative uh, process where we all contribute different ideas and different evidence. But it does seem to me that there's a place for individual prizes. In a sense, ladies and gentlemen, to congratulate, um, in this case, a young scholar from the community for his or her work. So I have great pleasure on behalf of the committee in awarding for a very fine paper on workplace happiness this prize to George Ward. I think you better take the box. If I hold the box. You may have to hold it up. Uh, congratulations, George. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you to everyone on the committee. It was uh, quite an effort to get through all these papers, but it was well worthwhile. If you want to know why the committee was so excited about George's paper, then I urge you to um, offer the coffee break that is. Uh, come back into the plenary where the future of work session will take place and George will present his extraordinary work. 
Uh, before you help yourself to coffee or tea, or both coffee and tea, should you want to, um, it is important that I thank a number uh, of people for making the event possible. Um, and first of all, I would like to gratefully acknowledge the incredible support we've received from our conference partners, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Victor Pinchuk Foundation, the Wellbeing for Planet Earth Foundation, and KSI. Thank you from all of us. Thank you also to Richard Layard for uh, co-organizing the conference. A big, a big thank you also to the, um, um, con the whole conference team, from the wonderful students uh, helping you out around uh, the, the college, the stewards, to Barry and Kate and Cherise for uh, leading on comms, uh, to Becky here at Worcester College for, making, uh, for helping us out so much and going well beyond the call of duty, uh, and to the Oxco uh, team for running the tech uh, so ably. But there's two extraordinary individuals that I'm sure you've interacted with over the course of the last few weeks in the run up to this, or even in the last two days, uh, that really need a special round of, round of applause, I think, for their heroic efforts in dealing with pretty much all of it. And I would like to call to stage um, Dr. Hannah Lucas and Dr. Laura Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. thank you. A well-deserved coffee break for everyone. And then uh, choose your session afterwards. We've got economics and well-being, policy interventions, measurements, uh, future of work. Pick, pick your favorite.
I just, well, I, I kind of recently joined LSC, so I've been, I'm in the PBS department, <laughs> on and off the uh, office. As long as you have, uh, I think officially, my, my of, uh, mental start date. Anxiety and stress and okay. motivation, okay. life is interesting. That's true, that's, that's good. good. Very it means that you care. It's the best. It'll be great, thank you. Yes, that's true. Okay, it means um, you care, is my right? mic on? I think my mic is on. It, I yes? think it is, yeah. It's on? Hi, everyone. Am I good? Yeah? Okay. Hello. Good afternoon. I know we're running out of time talking about time today. Um, I think this session is really interesting and, and personally for me because we'll be talking about the future of work and well being. And as you know, the way we work has been changing in so many different ways the way we interact with others, the way we communicate. And today we have three extraordinary speakers who will talk about specific challenges in the future of work and how they're tackling those three specific challenges. And we had a bit of a change in schedule, so we'll start with um, Eliza Jane Stringer from LSC, who will talk to us about people versus machines um, on a paper that is with a colleague of mine from LSC. So please give her a round of applause for her first academic talk. Thank you, everyone. Um, let's get forward. Ooh, there we go. Um, first off, thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor. Um, I'm really excited today to be presenting Dr. Grace Lordens and my research on the impact of being in an automatable occupation on Australian workers' mental health and life satisfaction. Um, so a quick summary, uh, I will provide a quick summary, um, a background and motivation to our research. Um, I'll outline the model specification and then um, outline some results and our limitations and extensions. And then I look forward to having a discussion um, and answering as many questions as I can. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to provide a summary of our research and our findings um, to keep you interested for the end. Um, so we explore the effect of working in an automatable job on mental health and life satisfaction. Um, we use an Australian panel data set, HILDA, to apply a fixed effects linear regression approach, uh, controlling for individual time and area level fixed effects. Um, overall, we found evidence that automatable work has a small uh, detrimental impact on the mental health and life satisfaction workers within some industries, um, particularly those with uh, higher levels of job automation risk, uh, so, such as uh, those in the manufacturing industry. Um, we find no strong trends to suggest that any particular demographic group is disproportionately uh, impacted across industries, and we also find evidence of adaptation to these effects after a one-year tenure on the job, um, indicating potentially a limited role um, for firm policy beyond uh, retention over one year. So some background and motivation for our research. Um, so new and emerging technologies associated with the, um, the fourth industrial revolution are changing how people live, work and communicate with one another. Um, so in fact, over the next decade, new technologies are predicted to make uh, up to 47% of jobs in the EU, EU partially automatable and 35% of jobs fully automatable. Um, and similar trends are projected across the UK, Australia, um, the US, and a number of other regions. Um, and so while much of this research has been explored the potential impacts of job automation on labor market outcomes during this transition period, uh, there's been quite little research which has examined the impact of this automation on workers' mental health and life satisfaction. Um, yet, with the projected scale of automation, um, understanding whether labor automation has a detrimental effect on mental health and life satisfaction of workers likely has important implications for public policy. In fact, if we're going to see the scale of automation, it does have a detrimental effect on people's mental health. So that led to our central research question, um, which is that, is working in an automatable occupation negatively associated with mental health and life satisfaction? Um, so to answer this question, um, we looked retrospectively to explore whether working in an automatable occupation has been associated with mental health and life satisfaction during the, the third industrial revolution. So essentially the 1960s until now. So instead of looking forward looking, we're looking retrospectively. 
Um, we used a fixed effects linear regression um, to relate a person being in automatable work to proxies of their well-being uh, using 18 waves um, of the household income and labour dynamics in Australia uh, panel data set, so the HILDA. Um, and we built on the work of Orta and Dawn, uh, defining automatable work as jobs which have high levels of routine task intensity, or RTI, um, and are therefore most replicable by technologies such as computers and automa uh, automation. Um, so these are jobs which are high in abstract and routine, uh, uh, sorry, in routine and manual tasks, um, and therefore are easily codified by technology. Um, so, just to demonstrate uh, the, the trends of what's been happening to automatable work in Australia, um, which is where we're looking, um, we can see that over the last sort of 50 years, we've seen a marked decline in what we're calling routine task intense uh, occupations. So, the proportion of uh, manual and uh, routine tasks, as you can see, has really been declining as a proportion of the tasks that are being performed by human labour across the Australian workforce, and at the same time, we see an increase in the number of abstract tasks that are, um, that are uh, being completed. Um, so that's just demonstrating the change that we've seen. Um, and so our question is essentially, uh, have we seen an impact on mental health and life satisfaction that corresponds with this change? So our hypotheses um, looked at, firstly, uh, we hypothesized firstly that job automation risk is negatively associated with mental health and subjective well-being. Um, and secondly, that uh, this was essentially stronger for those who are at more risk of job automation, so those who are in industries which have seen higher levels of automation um, over the past couple of decades. Um, so the reason why we hypothesized this was based on a range of the existing literature in related fields. Um, but the primary, so the primary uh, mechanism or that the literature proposes is essentially that job precarity is the primary channel through which occupational automation risk influences mental health and well-being. Um, so it's essentially argued that because job automation risk increases your job insecurity, um, it follows that working in an automatable occupation could have a detrimental effect on the mental health and life satisfaction um, by inducing job insecurity. So essentially, if you're in an automatable occupation and you're seeing that people are around you are losing their jobs, perhaps uh, that's increasing your uh, job insecurity and therefore detracting your mental health. <laughs> Um, others suggest that routine and repetitive work itself has been linked with negative impacts on mental health and life satisfaction um, due to the impact uh, of you know, uh, boredom or potentially um, the physical labour which is often associated with manual tasks. Um, so that also suggests that there might be a negative association. Um, in contrast, some of the characteristics of automatable occupations may have a positive association with mental health and life satisfaction. Um, if they're associated with things like better work-life balance and lower levels of stress. Um, so that also went the other way. So um, we wanted to look at uh, both. So uh, I'm just going to skip forward, actually, and uh, talk, oh, talk about our methods. So we used um, 18 waves of the HILDA longitudinal survey data, um, which in initially uh, consisted of about 19,000 participants. Um, the sample was restricted to those whose labour force status was employed across all waves um, because we wanted to look at the impact of working in an automatable occupation as opposed to potentially losing your job um, and that having an impact on your mental health. Um, we estimated our model across our full sample and also disaggregated by age, gender and level of education um, to identify heterogeneous effects um, across those different uh, demographic groups. Um, and by nature, the fixed effects model captures the effects of moving between occupational um, automatability classifications. So we disaggregated by the direction of movement, either into or out of an automatable occupation. So essentially, if you move from an automatable occupation into a non-automatable occupation, does that improve your mental health and vice versa? Um, so, to talk about uh, the model in a little more detail, um, so our independent variable was occupational automatability. So we used a binary classification of job automatability um, based on order and doors, Dawn's um, classification, um, and they classify as an occupation as automatable, um, where it has been found to be in the top third of routine task intense uh, occupations. So essentially, if yours are in the top third, uh, you were classified as uh, automatable and not if you sat in the bottom two thirds. 
Um, and then our dependent variables were life satisfaction, and we also looked at mental health using the um, uh, available data in the Hilda panel data set. Um, so we put that into our uh, broader model, um, which, in which we also controlled for individual uh, fixed effects, um, time fixed effects for each wave, and then area level fixed effects at uh, sub sort of sub uh, groups in Australia, sub areas, sorry. Um, and then our standard area errors were two week clustered by occupation and industry. Um, we ran a number of robust specifications, a uh, whole range, um, and uh, so that was including uh, our model uh, which excluded individual fixed effects. Um, we also used a continuous rather than binary uh, occupational automatability variable. Um, we used an unpaneled, un unbalanced data set. Um, we included area by time fixed effects. Uh, we also lagged our outcome variable to identify any potential legacy effects. Um, we included additional control variables, so uh, we tried three different groups of additional control variables, um, the first being income, marital status, race, so socioeconomic um, disadvantage and age, age and age squared, um, and hours worked, income, hours worked, and tenure enrolled. So we ran a large number of uh, uh, robustness specifications. So what did we find? Um, we found evidence that automated work has a small detrimental impact on the mental health and life satisfaction of workers within some industries, um, particularly those with higher levels of automation, um, including manufacturing, construction, and transport. Um, we interestingly found a notable exception in the services industry, um, and considering that the services industry is the only um, industry which has not seen declining employment opportunities for lower skilled workers. Um, this finding supports the hypothesis that the, neg um, the negative effects of automatable work on mental health and life satisfaction are driven by job precarity. Um, so essentially in the services industry, it's, we've seen less decline because those routine tasks are harder to be replaced by automatable, uh, by computers, et cetera, due to the nature of services. Mm. Um, so while statistically significant, the effects on mental health are sm relatively small in magnitude, uh, typically reducing mental health and uh, well-being by less than uh, 0.2 standard deviations. Um, and I'll just show what that looks like in our um, effects. So this is our effects on mental health. Um, so on the left-hand column, we see our pooled effects. Um, we don't see any effects across our uh, full um, workforce, but when we start to look by industry, you can start to see that where people are moving to non-automatable occupations, uh, their mental health is improving, um, with the exception of the services uh, sector there. Um, we see similar effects, but less strong for moving to an automatable occupation, which is interesting as well. Mm. Um, this is the effects on life satisfaction. Um, so we see similar sorts of um, effects, but they do diminish when you look at life satisfaction as opposed to mental health. Mm. Um, so looking at the uh, effects of our results on heterogeneous associations um, by age, gender, and education level, um, we saw uh, more significant effects among women in construction industry and the youngest workers. Um, however, we find no strong trends to suggest that any demographic group is sort of disproportionately impacted across industries. So while we did see some effects um, within subgroups, um, there was no strong indications that this was sort of systematic. <laughs> Um, and our findings were robust ac across the range of additional model specifications, uh, with the exception of the lagged model. Um, and this indicates that after moving into or out of an automatable occupation, uh, individuals adapt their new um, automatability risk uh, after to one year on the job. So they essentially adapt to their new environment of uh, an automatable or non-automatable job. Um, suggesting that potentially there's not as much of a role for uh, firms, for example, um, than uh, trying to keep people beyond that one year uh, retention. Uh, so this is just a quick summary uh, of some of the many, many numbers um, that we found. <laughs> I won't go through them all um, out of kindness. Uh, 
And then our limitations and further research, um, and then I'll uh, throw to questions. Um, so our primary li limitations, I think, is particularly that we looked at those who remained in employment. So our research was interested in the effects of automation um, or on those who remain in work rather than the effect of unemployment. So we restricted our panel, as I mentioned, to just those who remained employed. Um, this does, however, mean that we didn't see the impact on a lot of people who may have left the labor force because they worked in an automatable occupation. Um, so we couldn't uh, track that effect. Um, so I think that an extension that I would like to look into, I think that would be interesting, uh, would to be to look at the impact um, using a different methodology. Um, and then further research, uh, replication across geographic regions, um, so seeing if these findings hold, um, and then impact of policy interventions on well-being. So I think it would be really interesting as uh, so much of the work is currently looking at the impact in the labour market and trying to mitigate the effects of automation on people in the labour force. Um, when you're trying to create that and get people to upskill and reskill, for example, does that also have a positive impact on their mental health even if they're staying in that automatable occupation? Um, so to me, that would be an interesting opportunity for extension. Um, I will leave it there, and uh, I'll, I'll see if there's any questions. Hi. Sure. Great, great paper. So I was wondering, I understand why you, you, uh, you look at people who move in and out of, uh, of a job which is automatable, but since you're looking at this long period of time, can, could you look at whether you know, some jobs are becoming automatable? So you know, new softwares, you know, technology, and so y this would be completely exogenous, like a person suddenly uh, finds herself in, a, in an automatable job and what is the impact on her? So yeah, so I think that was part of the appeal to us of using the methodology we did around how to quantify what an automatable job was because it's not, um, it was basically the proportion of how routine and manual the occupation you are um, rather than sort of any other way of making it, yes, it's automatable right now. Um, um, that being said, uh, I think the research suggests that if we were looking into the future and projecting out uh, the impact, um, you would need to increase that proportion of things that are automatable relative to the baseline we used because, um, because of the fact that so much more is about to be able to be codified um, and automatable. So what constitutes an automatable job in 1960 is very different from what will in uh, 2022 and what is going to be in 2062. <laughs> Um, the data out of the Foundation for Young Australians indicates that the current generation under 25 is the most stressed that there's ever been and about 25% of all jobs being created at the moment are gig jobs. Uh, gig jobs. Gig jobs. So to what extent of what you're seeing is, as opposed to automation, is the fact that um, zero hour contracts are really becoming the norm in that segment of the population, and therefore that's driving the impact on well-being. So uh, I think that's a great question. I think that is one area that I would love to explore further. Because we did especially look at those people who remained employed, I think we would have lost out on some of those people um, because they, even if they remained in the workforce, it would not be in the same, you know, it wouldn't be captured by our data. Um, so I would say that like people becoming uh, unemployed, you also would see a lot of effects on people who are underemployed, especially in those kinds of age groups. So I think um, this is the fo first foray into this, this sort of area, especially using panel data. Um, it would be great to see whether you could start to capture those effects on some of those people who get lost in, in some of this. job precarity mechanism um, and I think Andrew you make a, a very good point uh, about the gig worker piece um, I ask because I'm more interested in the moderating effect of age as you were talking I was expecting the results to be the opposite you, your results said that the younger people uh, were more impacted than older people and perhaps I'm generalizing but um, perhaps the generation above me might have had a job for life um, whereas 
generation below me don't no longer view a career as a job for life, but rather a, a journey and continuous education and the need to adapt. So I would have hypothesized as you were talking that perhaps the older generation seeing the risk of becoming obsolete might be more impacted. Uh, and so that's where I think, Andrew, your point might go some way to, to, to answering why the moderating impact seemed higher for, for younger uh, people. But ha have I understood the moderating impact by age correctly? I, th I think so. So I've, we did see um, impacts across different. So there was younger groups that were p particularly affected within some industries. I, I think it was retail actually, um, but it, we saw in other industries th things like manufacturing, construction. Um, you did see the the impact predominantly driven by those workers over forty. Um, noting as well that when you're starting to get down to the level of um, within industry, within age group, the sample size was getting smaller, um, which is where we were sort of reluctant to draw any um, strong trends. Mm, yeah. I had a question around um, how much this is being driven by the perception of job insecurity versus feeling valued. Because if you look at um, employee data, in Australia actually for industries like mining that have mm. gone through major dis digitization, you actually see job satisfaction, engagement scores going up mm. rather than down. And so um, if it's done in a way that makes employees feel more valued and takes away some of the routine stuff, I, I, I just wanted the degree to which you, know, you, you put in there that it's actually about job insecurity versus potentially other factors. Yeah, I absolutely would think about other factors. To me, I think some of this suggests that it's potentially the salience of other people around you losing their job that's driving the negative effects. So um, if you're in the manufacturing industry, you're starting to, we've seen over the last 50 years, uh, huge losses um, in, in some of those industries in Australia. Um, so if you're seeing that people in your uh, workforce uh, are, are around you, um, that's very salient that your job is becoming insecure. Um, but if you compare that to uh, another industry, and in, and in fact in some demographic groups, we saw, it was interesting to compare to previous research that said that some groups were just as at risk as others, but perhaps they weren't aware or as, it wasn't as salient. So I think that's a really interesting question of where, which is it driven by? Is it driven by the salience of it, or is it driven um, and for those who remain in the industry, um, even if peop other people are losing their uh, jobs, are you then potentially, you know, is your employment more meaningful or do you take on more responsibility? Um, definitely areas for further research, I think. Mm. Thanks for, your thanks for your talk, it was really interesting. Um, I was just wondering uh, how you actually measure this automata automatability index. Because my concern is that you're not really measuring auto automatability, but just job quality. So automatability was a measure of, two, so essentially uh, how routine task intensive is your occupation. So essentially that was a breakdown as to the proportions um, of your occupation, which would be abstract, manual or routine. Um, so it sort of defined it. If you had a high proportion of uh, routine and manual jobs that are then easily, sort of more easily replicable by technology, um, that was how we defined high, um, high uh, automatability. But that was where we said in, in the potential mechanisms, I don't think we've answered that question of is it that uh, potential negative effects are driven by potentially, is it that those jobs are inherently lower quality and also vice versa. Could those jobs be higher quality because maybe there's other things associated with those jobs. We, we just can't tell from, from this yet, but I think the fact that we um, didn't see effects in the services industry, but we did in manufacturing and construction suggests that actually maybe it is dr the being driven by job precarity because the services industry was the only industry that hasn't seen that same decline um, in uh, occupation opportunities. In fact, it's the only uh, industry in which you've seen growth um, in uh, job opportunities relative to those other industries which have similarly highly automatable jobs um, but have seen decline. So I think this starts to suggest, I don't think it's conclusive, but it starts to suggest that it is the job precarity rather than the inherent nature of the job. So we have one more question. 
the hands go down when I say it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if we have the mic there, just um, Mark, go ahead. Thanks. That's really short. So, yeah. Really, as a follow-up to what you just finished on there, did you? There's a question in Hilda that's something like your subjective assessment of how likely you are to lose your job in the next year. Did you use that at all? And I think there's also a question on satisfaction with job security. I think we did look at those. Um, I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to get back to you on that. It was a while ago since I've done gotten to that level. I remember we captured that. I think there was an issue with the sample size or because it might have been taken in only every fourth wave. Um, so I don't think we were able to use that in the same way we were able to use the rest of the data. Okay. Um, do we have any more? No. Okay. <laughs> I'll come. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me here. I'm really delighted to be back to conferences. I thought I was fed up and I, uh, I didn't like it anymore, but actually I really enjoy uh, the script. So uh, this is a about uh, work from home. You know, people were, um, okay, no? Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah? I think that's, I think I'm still on. Um, she's still on. Okay. This one, yeah, okay. So, uh, so as you know, uh, during COVID and uh, lockdown, people were just forced to, uh, you want me to hold the microphone? No, okay, to stay home whenever they could, whenever they had a job that allowed them to work from home. Uh, and so this is like a, really a big shock, uh, exogenous shock on uh, the, the place you work. And this is uh, really the opportunity to assess whether um, there is an impact on, uh, on, on life satisfaction and mental health. So we use this as a, well, not perfect, but a kind of natural experiment. And of course, the question is uh, for the future, will work from home persist? If, if so, it's gonna have a lot of impact on many things. Um, you know, if you can hire people and not have to uh, give them a room, it's gonna be cheaper, so maybe an increase in labor demand. Uh, maybe women will, will work more, because labor supply of women, because they can you know, conciliate work and family life. Um, if people can work from any place, uh, they're going to settle in uh, nicer places than just the city center and because it's cheaper and uh, better quality of life. So the uh, organization of, uh, you know, spatial organization of, uh, of countries is going to change. There's going to be a deconcentration. So there's a lot of micro and macro effects. And um, the question is, are firms going to want to keep workers away from uh, their uh, premises and are workers going to want to remain at home? So in this paper, we look at the labor supply side. So is it nice for workers to be working from home or not? Um, so we know, so how could, be nice, how could it be nice or not nice? We know what the drivers of well-being and well-being at work are, more or less. So you know, autonomy, uh, prospects for progression, uh, meaning, uh, meaningfulness of the job, well, purpose, work-life balance, job security, all these drivers could, be, could go either way. For instance, autonomy, you could think is nice, I can do what I want with my time, but uh, sometimes it's the contrary. There is some algorithmic control, you know, you're, you're supposed to be in front of your computer, your computer is controlled by your employer, so maybe it's, you get more autonomy or less from working from home. Yeah. Career prospect, maybe uh, you, don't, you don't know uh, what's happening in the firm, so you, you don't really, you can't really expect, or, more, or maybe on the contrary, it's leveling the playing field. There's no, you know, everybody on the same ground. Social capital, so relations with colleagues, we, I, I think it's playing, it, it's not really, well, work from home is, is attenuating uh, the benefit of, the, of this. Purpose, work-life balance supposed to be good, but the first studies that we had during COVID showed that for women, for instance, it was more work, uh, so it was not necessarily good. Job security, also the only unambiguous thing is uh, not to have to commute anymore, because we know from this research domain that over 30 minutes of uh, commuting between home and, uh, and work is bad for your, detrimental to your life satisfaction and mental health. Okay, so before COVID, work from home was really small, from three to 5% of the labor force, but nonetheless, there was a lot of study about um, work from home or telework, distant work, uh, impact on productivity or well-being, uh, and essentially, the uh, evidence is all over the place. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad for mental health. It's not really conclusive. During COVID, th there were some experiments conducted within firms, 
and it tended to show a positive impact, but it was mostly you know, call centers. You cannot really generalize the impact of work from home if you're thinking about people who, who, you know, who are doing a very uh, lonely and uh, independent task and repetitive, so not really uh, generalizable. So during COVID, uh, there was, a, of course, a lot of evidence showing that people were stressed and mental health de decreased. Uh, with, with telework, but it's difficult to disentangle the fact that people are working from home because there is this pandemic, and so they're afraid of being ill. Uh, it's, a, it's a very stressful context, so you would really need to be able to, to, to depart, you know, the fact of uh, this is COVID and I'm afraid, and I'm working from home. So if you, you, if you, you want to look, look at people who are working from home and compare with something that is comparable. If you just look at somebody who is working from home and somebody who is not during lockdown, you're comparing two completely different persons. They have different jobs. One is a researcher, the other one, other one is in the construction sector. If they have different life satisfaction or mental health, it's not necessarily related to work from home. You want to look at people switching to working from home. But even, so you, you need to have a point before COVID. But even though, even, that, even then, if you have two persons, again, the construction sector and the researcher, and they move, uh, they move because they have different jobs, and so maybe the impact of moving to, into work from home or not moving would be different. Maybe a uh, construction sector guy would love to work from home or not, maybe he wouldn't like it at all, and researchers would like it, so it's difficult to compare. So you really want to, com to, to have longitudinal data, you want to have observations before COVID, you want observations during COVID, and you want people who go in and out of work from home during COVID. And this is uh, what we do, and I think nobody did before. Um, okay, so we use this wonderful UK HLS uh, panel, which is a regular yearly um, panel before, uh, before the pandemic, and then they uh, added a regular, bi almost bi-monthly waves during COVID with these specific questions about, about the, in particular, telework. And so, of course, in order to be able to identify a causal impact of work from home on life satisfaction or mental health, you have to assume that people didn't choose, so they moved into telework or out of telework when government or the firm decided that they should do so. Um, we can relax this uh, assumption a little bit later. Uh, so the, the, the important thing about this data is that some people work from home, uh, not necessarily at always, but sometimes. Um, okay, so what we, what we find, I'm really surprised because workers always ask to work from home. I mean, even at PSC, in the admin, people have been asking to the general secretary whether they can have some, some days at home, and the general secretary always said no, because work from home is not really work. So you would think that when they eventually have the possibility of doing so, they will enjoy. But the result is that, on the contrary, there is no impact on life satisfaction, and if any, there's a negative impact on mental health. So I'm not going to tell this to you because we're, uh, you all know that we're in, uh, you know, the UK HLS, we're in England, but you know that there were some periods of really strict lockdown, which were essentially the same in, uh, in England, the Wales and, uh, and Scotland, at least at the beginning of the period, and then maybe it was not less uh, homogeneous. Um, and anyway, during this entire period, you had this strong regulation and also the, uh, the recommendation sustained by the media and social networks, you want to stay at home orders. So, um, you know better than me, but I think it was really stringent, uh, at least during 2020. Okay, so data, we use the, this uh, UK HLS, we use the, the year uh, uh, 2020, so the uh, COVID uh, waves start in, uh, with, which include life satisfaction and, sorry, how do I go back? Uh, okay, uh, I'll just skip. Okay, so we use the, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to go back, it's like, like in real life. Um, okay, so we have seven special COVID waves, which are uh, April, May, June, July, September, November, and then it goes further, but then, you can, then people have the choice of working from home or not. We, and so we use four years before COVID, and this seven, year, seven waves during COVID. We focus on employed people with, uh, of course, positive working hours, and we drop individuals who used to telework before. We really want to see people, we want to compare, what it, what it does to your mental health to move into telework or, or go out of it if you didn't used to do it before. Okay, so the outcomes, you know, it's life satisfaction, of course, and uh, GHQ uh, mental health scores, 
So it's a series of 12 questions, uh, like uh, have you recently been able to concentrate? And then you can answer on uh, this uh, four step scale, much less than usual, less than usual, same and, or uh, more. So we, we create a synthetic index and we will also look at uh, each specific questions. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, so I don't know. <laughs> Uh, so the, the, it's a, it's a, it's a di definitive uh, identification with uh, individual fist effects. So we look at people who uh, we define as intention to treat. So people who have a teleworkable job. So people who can work from home. Okay, uh, or maybe I'll skip. And, and so people that we see at least once working from home. And then what we are going to to to, to look at is the, the 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 period when they are actually treated, meaning working from home. And these are the questions that allow us to do this. Okay, so treated, when you see the table, means somebody actually working from home at that wave. Um, okay, so just to show you that you know, nobody used to be working from home in the UK HLS, and suddenly whoosh, it jumps until 60% and onward. Uh, this I skip, so this is a, maybe I skip this too, uh, <laughs> the equation, okay. Uh, okay. So results. So the result is in, in average, uh, people. So the question is, uh, do, do you work uh, from home? Uh, no. Well, never. Sometimes. Often. Always. So always mean every day. I'm always working from home. Often is uh, you know most of the time. Sometimes I guess. So we consider working from home often or always. Um, so we differentiate these two uh, two intensities. And so the result is, uh, is that controlling for the fact that this is COVID, controlling for the fact that uh, I have a teleworkable job, controlling for the fact that I have a teleworkable job and this is COVID, interacting COVID with all the, 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 the observables, the, uh, the, the impact of, uh, uh, of working from home always is negative in average on the sample uh, for mental health and there's no impact on life satisfaction. Okay, so then uh, what about time? Because this is during, I mean, there's, this is Wednesday. You, you work from home, you know, April, May, July, you know, September. So maybe so ch things change. So what about time analysis? So we look at people, we, we, we expect two potentially different things. Maybe people adapt. We know in this literature people adapt to everything. Um, or maybe uh, they self-select. Into, telework, into work from home when they can at the end of the period. So, or maybe on the contrary, they adapt, so the, the effect becomes more positive, or maybe on the contrary, they desocialize completely, they become more and more um, isolated, and they, they, they miss more and more the, the, the social relations with colleagues and the meaning that comes from uh, the purpose that comes from being here, you know, with people. So we, we don't know what's going to happen over time. So we studied the effect of being working from home for one, three, five, seven, nine consecutive months. So this is a, so I'm working from home in May uh, and uh, I'm, I'm working from home for, uh, this is the first, uh, uh, this is May and I'm working from home. This is June and I've been working from home from the start. This is July and I've been working from home from the start in May, June and July. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the, when you go right, these people have been working from home from the start and more and more and more. So what we see is that this is um, uh, mental health. So initially there's a negative impact on mental health of people who work from home, always the red or often the blue. Negative in May, negative in June, and then it vanishes. Then there's no impact anymore. People adapt. Mental health is not affected anymore. So this is just for the uh, feeling useful, how useful you, you, you feel. Negative impact in May, negative impact in June. Remember that these guys are home from since March. So March, April, May, June. And then the effect goes away. Same for being able to concentrate. So, um, okay. So we think that, so we see that <laughs> at first individuals uh, mental health deteriorates um, and in average it's, uh, it's negative and then with time they adapt. So do they, do they adapt or uh, are we sure that this is adaptation? Uh, so maybe, um, maybe, yeah. 
the, maybe they're self-selected to work from home. We're not really sure, you know, we can be really sure that they, they, they are obliged to work from home, especially at the end of the, of the period. So we, there is one question uh, which is asked, not always, but only in uh, June, September, and January 2021, asking people whether when all this is over, what would they like to do? They would like to continue or they would like uh, to go back to the firm. And so people can say again, I, I would like, uh, okay, I would like to stop, or I would like to go to work from home uh, uh, sometimes, often, or always. So we we just we can't really control for that because th this is asked only in certain waves, and this time analysis is based on people who remain all the time. But we can still look if there is a correlation, and there is one, a small one. So this is uh, people. I want to work from home. I'm saying that I want to work from home in June. Uh, the impact of the fact that I am actually working from home in July, in September, in uh, December, uh, uh, November, January, etc. So there is a small self-selection effect, but it's really small compared to the uh, to the actual um, work from home. This is something for September. I'm saying in September that I want to work from home in the future. It has no impact on me working from home in November. Uh, some impact in December. And January, but it's, it's also it's already January 2021. So uh, ideally, we would restrict the analysis to 2020 because this is really when this is a pure, uh, natural, exogenous shock of you know putting people work from home. Okay, so conclusion: um, partial work from home is preferable to uh, total work from home. That's for sure. People who work from home always are much worse than those who work sometimes. Uh, there is probably an adaptation effect and maybe a small um, self-selection effect. So the conclusion in terms of policy is that uh, I guess there is no uh, one size fits all. If, uh, if, uh, if firms impose uh, so to, to their workers to work from home all the time, it's going to be detrimental to their well-being. Uh, and if there is some self-selection um, impact, self-selection phenomenon, then you should leave the choice to people. So if work from home becomes an additional degree of freedom, it will be good for people. If it becomes um, imposed, it will be bad. This is what our take from the data. And I stop. Okay, any questions in the back? Yeah. Thank you, fascinating. Um, a fascinating analysis. So I have one observation and then one question. The observation is when you ask employers why they want to continue to help their people work from home, they, the top number one reason is for well-being of their workers. So there's clearly some crossed wires here potentially going on and or, this leads to my question, what do you think could explain then the fact that despite people ob on semi-objective variables not necessarily being better off working from home, the vast majority of those people whose job is amenable to working from home are nevertheless saying, this is what I want to do, I'm quitting my job if I'm not allowed to do this, twice as many people would like to quit their job if they're not allowed to work flexibly, or I'm moving, you know, employer, I'm willing to take a pay cut. All of that analysis and research mm. seems quite compelling. So what, what explains the difference between people's hmm. um, actual observed, you know, well-being versus what they would then like to do in the future? Mm -hmm. So employers, I'm not sure all employers want to keep the workers home for, their, for, for the sake of employers. Some, you know, it's, it's also a cost reduction device. It's, it's much, uh, but, but maybe some, some of them are benevolent. Okay. So why do people uh, say they want to continue working from home, but uh, they're not happy? So first of all, maybe they want to continue to work from home sometimes or often, but never always. So the, the really big negative impact is on them, those who work all the time uh, from home. Uh, maybe there's some heterogeneity too. Although here we tried heterogeneity. We tried to look at women versus men, children versus no kids, etc. In that data, there is no heterogeneity, uh, statistically significant heterogeneous effect. In many studies that I saw, it's the same. We all expect that women will be uh, less happy working from home than men. Ma many times it does not appear in the data. So, but still, there may be some heterogeneity. And then finally, maybe people, you know, maybe people think it's nice to work from home because they can get organized. They have this idea that it's good for them, but they don't realize that on the mental health uh, side, 
uh, they get depressed, uh, they lose uh, social integration, they're becoming uh, anomic. Uh, maybe they're not fully aware of uh, the consequences of, uh, of, of not being uh, in, in contact with, uh, with, with their colleagues. Uh, behavioral economics has shown that this can happen, that you're not fully aware of the consequences of your decisions. Uh, some people, I think, really struggled with not having the commute because they couldn't, they couldn't change personas. You know, when you go to work, you often, you know, people talk about putting on armor, putting on my suit, you change personas. And certainly, colloquially, with some business leaders I speak to, they said, you know, I'd go in the kitchen to make a coffee and my eight-year-old daughter would say, who is this man? Because it's not <laughs> fun, Daddy. It's suddenly serious, ha unhappy, Daddy, or whatever. So I think, that, I think something about boundaries has really broken down. And then I also think people have got a focusing error because they say, do you want to work from home? Home is a happy place, work is not. So they think they want to work from home. Yeah. But yeah. just because of the word, not really. So when you ask, I, I, think, that, I think it's a really, you know, I, I, I think there's something wrong in the way we're framing the question or something like that. You know, we're framing it in a, do you want to work from home? Not, I, I think we need to frame it in, would you like to see your colleagues? You know, so Maybe, then you yeah. suddenly, I, so I think there must be some error in that. I don't know, that's my just the thoughts. I'd love to see the paper. Um, it looks it's true that home is uh, identified with, uh, you know, non-work time, leisure, so it's nicer a priori. So maybe people understand it this way. It's true. Uh, I don't know, boundaries, yeah, I, I would call it identity. You know, you, you, you dress, you go in a place, you interact with uh, some formal way, and you, you're motivated. When, the, when you're in a different place, when I work in my um, uh, dining room, which is where I work from home, uh, the, the, the hierarchy of priorities change. Suddenly I think about, you know, the washing machine, it's a good time to do it, and I'm going to uh, take advantage of the time to, and, and suddenly you, you're not into work anymore, and after some time, you, it's true that if you are doing a Zoom and you're in pyjama, uh, uh, you know, uh, you have pyjama pants, uh, you, you're losing identity, so you're losing motivation, you're losing the, the feeling of, if you think about social life as a, you know, a, a series of uh, acting scenes, like uh, interactionist theory that I like, uh, you're not in this interaction, professional interaction, so you're losing uh, momentum. <laughs> I'm just curious, and I'm going to reveal something about my home life with this question. But um, did any, uh, did you back perhaps measure I, ah, okay. I think so. um, whether or not people were homeschooling their children during that miserable dip in their mental health during COVID? We tried that, but uh, yeah. in this data, it does not appear. We have another paper with Andrew, who is here, and uh, Anthony Le Painter and Conchita. Uh, I still have to write this during the summer. But there, with the GSOEP panel, we see exactly, so everybody is less happy working from home, so mental health deteriorates, also in Germany, uh, especially women who have school-aged kids. So they have to, uh, to do school with them. So the, the negative impact of work from home is increased for women who have these uh, kids between 7 and 14. And it's attenuated for women who have babies. They're happy to be with the babies. So there is heterogeneity. Yeah, women who have young kids, uh, not, not, not school age, they, they, they are less unhappy with work from home uh, than the average. And women who have school age children, they are more unhappy. This is in the, with the German data. Um, gotcha. Um, but in this data, there is no heterogeneity. I don't know why. Yeah, I, just to add to that, I, uh, the, the Lancet Mental Health Task Force, which John and I, uh, and Jan actually, uh, uh, sit on, um, we found also that your opinion of if you thought your own government was handling the COVID crisis well had an impact on people's mental health. It's another covariate yeah. just to add into the mix. Yeah. Okay, there was one in the back. Andrew? Yeah. I just wondered if you'd looked at the economic factors that play the part because um, I work for BT and one of the things that we're finding increasingly in the lower paid end is uh, employees that are choosing and actively wanting to work from home because of the commuting costs uh -huh. and also they can feed themselves cheaper at home than the cost mm -hmm. of food at work. Mm -hmm. uh, no, we didn't. We just, no, we controlled for income but of course there can be some, uh, yeah, you don't have to spend the... Uh, the, the, the expenditure of uh, commuting. There's another thing I could say, I mean, if, if nobody's asking. Because it's not, a, of course, it's a natural experiment. It's nice, we can see the impact of working from home. But this is special because everybody's working from home. 
So you're just doing what everybody else is doing, there's no stigma. Maybe uh, when all this is over, working from home, the impact of mental health and life satisfaction will depend on what other people do. If it becomes a new normal, then maybe it feels good. Uh, if you're the only one to do it, or if it's the minority, maybe you feel, um, I'm not really doing what I should be doing. So this externality effect, or I don't know how to call it, or coordination, is absent from this analysis, we just cannot do it, but it, of course it's an important dimension. So this is like a qualifying the result. I suppose one of the important questions in Western society looking over the next 10 or 20 years is what might be the cumulative effects on people and on businesses of very long run um, periods of working from home. In a sense you're looking at the impact effects of course and they, they clearly matter. I, I wonder if you could help us to understand what might be the cumulative consequences of long periods of working from home. Do you think you could do that? <laughs> uh, I can imagine <laughs> what would be the cumulative effect. I guess if people were working from home, after some time they would realize that they really miss the social interaction dimension of uh, life and, and, and well-being. And I guess they would recreate that aside from work. So they would start, you know, I don't know, having these uh, you know, neighbor um, uh, associations or socialization uh, instances or uh, something else or work more in, uh, in uh, NGOs or the, 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 I guess they would find another way because I don't believe that people can really remain like this, like a monad <laughs> um, with a distant communication, you know, on, on everything on Zoom. Uh, it looks like an, another humanity. I'm not really sure. about employee happiness and recruitment, a field experiment. Okay, so thank you very much. Thanks everyone for coming and making it to the final uh, presentation of the day, uh, which will be over in half an hour and then we'll be able to get everything. So, I'll tell you a little bit about a field experiment that I've been working on uh, recently itself is called Employee Happiness and Job Search Behaviour. Um, and just the motivating background here, the last few years there's been a large increase in interest practitioners. And is that better? Okay. Uh, and one of the most widely uh, discussed and most widely studied aspects of employee wellbeing is really its uh, relationship. Uh, with firm uh, performance. And the, the sort of, ultimately the key question there is whether or not uh, firms with happier workforces tend to be more profitable uh, or not. Um, and as you might imagine, I'm not the first person uh, to find this interesting. Uh, there is actually a long uh, line of uh, research going back almost to the 1920s, or at least as far as the 1920s, when researchers really started to, to investigate the impacts of workers' moods and levels of satisfaction on subsequent uh, organizational outcomes. And so great, in fact, has been uh, the interest uh, in this that it's sometimes even referred to as the holy grail of organizational research. And while that might be somewhat uh, over the top, I think uh, one of the reasons why people are so interested in the relationship between uh, happiness and performance is that it really has key implications for how firms uh, should treat their workers and for um, the sort of the role and importance more generally of human resource management, uh, management practices, organizational practices uh, in a firm's overall business strategy. So, uh, as I say, there's a large and long-running literature on uh, happiness and firm performance, and it's really focused on two main uh, channels through which we might expect uh, a happier workforce to lead to better organizational outcomes. Uh, one of those uh, is productivity, and here the idea uh, is that happier workers may be expected to be more productive in their jobs. Uh, and a second channel uh, is retention, and in this case the idea is that happier workers may be less likely to quit and turn over. Uh, but there is a, a third, as yet largely unstudied, channel uh, that may be uh, at play, and that is uh, recruitment. And here the question is really, uh, is it the case that firms with happier workers 
uh, are going to find it easier to compete in the labor market in the first place and attract uh, workers more easily. And that's really what I'm going to try and do uh, in this paper is to try and test this third uh, potential channel. Uh, I'm going to do that uh, using a field experiment, uh, which uh, I was very uh, fortunate to be able to collaborate uh, with Indeed, and that's going to be the experimental setting. Uh, for those I'm sure uh, most people in the room know, uh, Indeed.com is one of the largest, I think it is the largest uh, jobs website in the world, uh, and it has two, at least two main functions. Uh, the first function is what you might most immediately think of when someone says the words jobs website, uh, and that is it hosts uh, job ads and facilitates applications, but it also has uh, a secondary and increasingly important function, and that is to crowdsource uh, information about companies and disseminate that uh, to job seekers in order to help them make decisions in the labor market. Uh, and to that end, uh, companies that have a presence on the site uh, have what are called a set of company pages, uh, and this here uh, is an example from MIT. You'll see this sort of basic information about the organization, uh, things like the industry, uh, that it works in, the firm size, when it was founded, and so on. Uh, and then importantly, you also have information, uh, things like written reviews, a lot of information about how much people are paid, uh, sort of crowdsourced salaries, information about what the interview process is like, and so on and so forth, and uh, of course, what jobs are currently available there. And what I'm, what this field experiment uh, really does is take all of this information that's currently there uh, and tries to add an additional piece of information about how happy workers feel uh, at different companies. So, uh, Indeed uh, began uh, crowdsourcing information uh, in 2019 about the lived experience of workers. Uh, and in a really fascinating data set, they've been able to collect information on a range of characteristics about what life is actually like at uh, organizations, how people experience them day to day, things like diversity, inclusion, uh, managerial support, stress, uh, and so on. What I'm really focused on in this paper is a question they've been asking uh, about employee happiness. Um, and you know, if you go to uh, Indeed uh, this evening or tomorrow, you may well be asked this question uh, about your current or former employer, uh, the extent on a one to five scale uh, to which you agree with the statement, I feel happy at work most of the time. So this is really quite a, an effective or hedonic uh, question trying to understand how people experience work day-to-day uh, -day at different employers. So, uh, as I say, since the end of 2019, uh, they've managed to collect over uh, about six and a half million uh, individual level surveys in the US and now increasingly in other uh, countries, but I'm gonna be focusing today uh, on the US. And I'm really gonna focus on this data uh, at the aggregated company level. So I'm gonna refer to uh, company level happiness scores. Um, so in order to have uh, a score, to be eligible for a score, a company has to have at least 20 individual level uh, answers to this happiness question, such that you have a meaningful uh, number to show. And during the period that I study uh, in this field experiment, that meant having around about 28,000 companies in the US, uh, for which there was a score that's actually much larger now since data collection has continued uh, in the US and elsewhere. Um, and what happens, the way they calculate this score, is they take the mean within the company of this one to five happiness question uh, and multiply it by 20. It's just a simple linear transformation uh, such that each company has a score that is out of 100. And in the US, the mean uh, is about 62 with a standard deviation of about 10. Uh, and interestingly, as I sort of show in more detail in the paper, uh, there's quite significant variation in this across companies, even within very tightly defined industries uh, and locations. And a lot of my sort of other work is trying to uh, understand why it might be the case that there is such uh, variation across companies with you know, really very observationally similar companies facing the same business environment, trying to understand why it is that there is that variation. Uh, but in this paper, I'm really interested in the flip side of that uh, equation and sort of trying to answer the question of so what? You know, are there downstream consequences for firms? Uh, and in particular here, uh, does it have any impact on their ability to recruit? So just, uh, as I say, in the paper, you're able to sort of break uh, things down by very fine-grained um, within uh, industry, within location variation to demonstrate that point. But I just wanted to break out here uh, more coarsely across two-digit industries. And you can see, for example, there's clearly a lot of variation across industries. Uh, but even within industries, there's really interesting levels uh, 
of happiness across companies. So if you look, say, at education, uh, our own uh, industry, which is on average quite a high happiness industry, uh, there are still quite a few uh, organizations that are getting things very, very wrong uh, and have very unhappy workforces. But on the other hand, you can look at sort of telecommunications down here on the bottom right, uh, which is a sort of, on average, relatively unhappy industry. There are nevertheless quite a lot of organizations, or at least some, who are getting things right and have quite happy workforces. So as I say, what I'm really trying to understand in this paper is what are the knock-on implications of that uh, for firms. So a little bit about the experimental design. As I say, this is going to take place on uh, Indeed.com as a field experiment. It's going to be a between-subjects uh, design uh, where job seekers on the website are randomized into either treatment or control. Uh, control job seekers going here, sticking with the example of MIT, going to the MIT website, on uh, MIT company page on Indeed, would see the uh, information as usual, uh, what I showed you earlier, including things like written reviews, salary information, and so on. And then uh, treated job seekers uh, going to that same page on that same day, all analyses are going to have company by day fixed effects, so we're always going to be comparing uh, control and treatment job seekers looking at the same page on the same day uh, would see all of that information plus this additional widget uh, on work happiness which is added quite prominently on the company's landing page here what they call the snapshot page and that's going to add uh, a piece of information about how happy workers are uh, at that particular company and ultimately what I'm going to be interested in here as my main outcome is whether or not treatment and control job seekers are any more or less likely to apply to that company uh, on that day. Of course, this being uh, sort of website data, there's all sorts of outcomes that you might want to track, things like clicks and dwell time and whatever. Um, but as the main behavioral outcome here, uh, I'm going to be focused uh, on applications. And this ran for about 10 months between uh, May 2020 and March 2021, uh, during which time we were able to observe about 25 million job seekers uh, in the US. So before I sort of skip to some of the main results, I will just show uh, very quickly uh, across a range of observable characteristics of individuals as well as companies uh, see good um, experimental balance. So what happened? So you'll remember uh, this is uh, an information provision experiment and I'm going to be typically interested principally in the difference between treatment and control. Uh, but the nature of the experiment really varies according to what that information is. So in the case of uh, MIT, uh, you'll remember there the happiness score was 78. What the, inf what the sort of field experiment is doing in that case is revealing a relatively positive piece of information uh, compared to so the control job seekers are seeing as normal, treated job seekers are being told actually people are quite happy at this company. Now, I, don't, I obviously haven't picked out uh, and singled out some unhappy employers, but you can imagine in other cases a company may have a score of say 40 or 45 or whatever it might be, and in that case what the experiment is doing is revealing a piece of negative information uh, about how happy or unhappy workers are uh, at that company. So I'm going to break down the results not just by treatment and control, of course, but also by the nature of the information that's being provided. So what happened? Well, when providing uh, a relatively negative piece of information, so when revealing that a company had a, uh, a score uh, of below 60, um, you find there's about a, a treatment effect of about, not, of about minus 3%. So in those cases, you get 3% fewer applications to those companies. On the other hand, showing a more uh, positive piece of information, uh, say that a company has a score between 70 and 80, really has no effect uh, on application behavior. So you see no difference between treatment and control. At the very sort of top end of the happiness distribution, showing the most positive piece of information that you can, that a company has a score of over 80, does boost applications by around 2%. Um, though it's worth noting that the sort of magnitude of that positive effect is smaller than the equivalent negative effect of showing uh, negative information. But the overall picture of what happens here is that you get a reallocation of um, applications away from low happiness firms towards higher happiness firms, which is really driven uh, by an asymmetry in the effect of people using this information uh, as a screening device in order to weed out uh, low happiness firms from their job search. So, uh, just briefly before I finish, this being a sort of real-world uh, natural field experiment, uh, I'm relatively limited in what I can observe about the characteristics of, of experimental subjects, 
um, but using a, a subsample of the indeed data it is nevertheless possible to observe a limited number of characteristics that will enable us to uh, sort of break down these effects uh, and look at heterogeneity. And what I find is that really there are very few differences uh, looking either at pos revealing positive uh, or negative information, you find very few differences in treatment effect. The one uh, area where you do find uh, a significant difference uh, is when showing negative information uh, and you see a difference across educational groups or at least and presumably also across uh, differing levels of labor market power. So uh, people with higher education tend to be more sensitive uh, to negative uh, information in terms of their application behavior. Uh, but across a range of other characteristics, you find very few differences in treatment effect. So, as I say, what this information provision serves to do is to reallocate applications away from low happiness firms to higher happiness firms, and that is driven by an asymmetry uh, in the effect, and people are using this as a screening device. And so, uh, just to wrap up, I want to sort of draw out uh, what I think are the most interesting uh, and important implications, both for policymakers as well as for firms. The key uh, finding in the paper is that job seekers respond behaviorally to information about uh, incumbent worker happiness. And what that means, I think, is that workers appear to value workplace happiness. They place a value on it and they're motivated to pursue it. In the paper, I'm able to sort of uh, add a bit of flesh to that by also uh, studying a survey experiment embedded within a nationally representative sample in which uh, people are offered hypothetical job choices with differing uh, experimentally decided uh, levels of salary and workplace happiness. And what you find uh, in that exercise is that people say they would be willing um, to give up salary in order to work at happier companies uh, and also to avoid uh, working at particularly miserable companies. And as a result of that, um, I think there's a labor market penalty for firms with unhappy workers. And what that means is there are ultimately incentives uh, for low happiness firms to improve the well-being of their workers if they, to the extent that they value uh, larger applicant pools. And again, I'm able to uh, add a little bit uh, more flesh to that in the paper uh, by studying not just the experiment, but also uh, looking at within company variation uh, in scores. So as you'll recall, the experiment took place over a 10-month period company's scores were being updated in real time as more and more micro data was collected, which gives nice within company variation. Uh, and you, what you observe there is that as companies improve their scores, they do attract uh, more applications. Uh, and to try and sort of lend some uh, causal credibility that, to that, I'm able to use uh, some quasi-experimental variation in the score where you get discrete jumps in the score depending on whether things are rounded uh, up or down, because an integer is always being shown, but of course behind that there's you know, an average which is to any number of uh, decimals. So overall, um, as I say, firms with uh, the evidence across the survey experiment, the field experiment, and also uh, this subsequent um, quasi-experimental evidence suggests uh, that firms uh, with happier workers will find it easier to compete in the labor market and attract workers uh, and I will stop there and take any questions. Okay, more questions. Um, Andrew had the arm up first, so we'll go there and then go to the room like that. My mic is working. Uh, thank you very much. Just very quickly, George. Um, so you're giving the um, potential workers um, numerical information on the happiness scores. And I, I can imagine it would be rather hard for people to know what an, a normal kind of score is using language loosely. So it occurred to me, did you consider using ranking positions? People would understand the third best, ha third happiest in the industry rather than 4.6 and so on. Yeah, so as it currently stands, they're shown a numerical sort of, you know, uh, value, along with a piece of sort of signposting information, which at the moment is an emoji and a little piece of text, which either says uh, sort of average, above average, below average, which is kind of a coarse signpost. Uh, and that's sort of global. Uh, I think in future, which would be extremely interesting to look at, is a range of different types of signposts, whether it be sort of within industry, 
uh, within location, whatever it might be, and also looking at trying to understand what the best and most understandable signpost is to people, right? whether it could be percentiles. You know, the, the, most people don't understand sort of uh, a distribution, but they'll understand when it's explained to them sort of this company is happier than 80% of other companies or is in the bottom 10%. So the real challenge here is trying to situate that data to make it meaningful, yeah. Oh, sorry. Hi, George. Um, you said in your summary <laughs> slide is a labor market penalty for firms with unhappy workers. And I wonder whether you could say there's a labor market penalty for firms with unhappy -er workers. So if you took 20% off of all of your figures, do you think anything would change? Is this a zero-sum game competing for workers? So it's a lot's going to, as I say, the signposts are fixed, right? So there's a certain number, uh, the, the sort of the cutoffs for whether you're sort of above or below average, so you, could, you can move from one to the other. You're quite right uh, that this is a reallocation of uh, applications rather than an absolute sort of uh, discouragement or encouragement. Uh, but I think that could be, I should, we can discuss that more in the paper to try and, you can, I need to, we can discuss ways to check that more in the data actually, which would be good uh, for the discussion. So thanks. Any other questions? Thank you. I was wondering, well, people, we hear that the new generation, whatever it is, is more really focused on purpose, you know, happiness, not losing your time. They don't just want to sell their time for money. They want to, to do something in the firm. So I know you don't have the age of the applicants, but some job offers maybe are targeted towards young people, like I guess programmers, or maybe if it's to hire an assistant prof or something, you can, you can know what kind of public is going to be interested. And so I would really be interested in knowing whether there is a, a, a greater effect for the young. The other thing is about purpose. You, 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 you show that there's also a score of uh, purpose. You know. Is it the same or is it different? Yeah, so I'm not able to observe uh, the age of the people, of course, but we could look um, at the average, to try and code somehow the average age uh, appropriateness of company. It would have to be at the company level, not at the job ad level, because this is shown on the company pages, not on the job ad level. Um, well. I was thinking about the job offer, uh, well the, 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 the job to which people apply, maybe it's... Uh, the particular job, yeah. Yeah, maybe you know, specific type of people are expected to, to, to apply to this job, like uh, old people will not apply for assistant prof. Yeah. So what I can do uh, to delve into the generational issue more thoroughly is I use the survey uh, experiment where you can actually observe a lot more and you don't find... Uh, I also had this exact same hypothesis, and you don't find huge differences across age groups in people's willingness to pay uh, for working at happier companies. Uh, in terms of the point about purpose, purpose is also collected, um, and it would be great to randomize access to that at the same time. What this experiment did was sort of prominently show the happiness score with some other aspects to it, and in the paper I'm able to sort of interact treatment with all of these other aspects of what's there, but it's really happiness that's the most prominently shown piece of information, which makes it difficult uh, to say something individually about all the other aspects. Uh, thanks, this is very interesting. So uh, you showed us heterogeneity by individual, uh, but not by firm. And so I'm wondering if there are various factors that might moderate, you know, so certain industries, happiness isn't important, or maybe the salary, uh, or certain types of occupation. And I imagine you have, you know, a huge amount of data yeah, available so there. Yeah, so it's much easier to observe things about the company, uh, and some of the aspects uh, of what I showed there were at the company level. Uh, we're able to break it down by uh, industry, as you say, a uh, fairly coarse measure of the average salary uh, posted by that company, although this being the US, a lot of jobs don't have posted salaries. Um, and you really don't find any uh, huge differences across them. Uh, I obviously had quite a few strong priors about industries and so on going in, but you don't find huge differences in treatment effect across them. Hi. 
So again, uh, fascinating. Um, so I did a huge survey in the States, ten, uh, population survey, so su at least supposed to, trying to be representative, about 10,000 people. And we asked a five-point question too, but it was in general, how happy are you at work? So very slightly different. But our mean was 71. And is the 61 that you've got, do you feel that's a, uh, because of the convenient sample that people are looking for work, that actually they're likely to come being more unhappy. It felt quite low to me on a five-point scale to be down there. So I just wondered about that, you know, whether, whether that's strong. And then, like Andrew said, I, I feel saying that they got 62, we're so primed that eight out of 10 is a good score, that I, when I was looking at that thing, I thought, well, I would, if it, only if it was over 80 would I start thinking it's good. And in a sense, that's just a focusing error, you know, thing, not really a real thing. So. Yeah, those two things. A great paper, thank you. Yeah, so on the first... Um, ...issue, you are right uh, that it may seem low, and I think there are probably a whole range of reasons why we would expect crowdsourced data to be uh, biased in different ways, in the same way that all samples may be biased. Um, I think that's much more important when you're trying to use this data uh, as an outcome, say, in trying to understand how... Yeah. Uh, the key thing here, I think, is that bias is likely to be the same across uh, firms, right? Uh, and here, I'm not necessarily interested in <laughs> sort of the data itself. Uh, I'm interested in the effect of showing it. You know, you could imagine uh, a range of lab studies where you would just sort of make up the number <laughs> uh, and show it to different people. Uh, but I think you're quite right that a sort of future direction of research here would be trying to really understand um, the nature of the crowdsourced data, and there's a lot of uh, work that that can build on uh, in marketing and elsewhere, uh, using this kind of uh, crowdsourced data in product markets uh, to better understand, uh, you know, what it is exactly uh, that this data represents. But I think the key thing here to remember is that whatever biases that all data have, in this case, we're really interested in uh, comparisons across companies. In which case, you know, uh, they're likely to be the same. The rank ordering of companies should still be the same. Um, on the second issue, uh, scaling and signposting is, 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 is hugely important um, and, I mean, has to be uh, tested further and trying to understand how people understand these things, uh, trying to understand what, you know, what do people think is a good score uh, and do they update their beliefs about that, even if you tell them this is above average, uh, they may still not, particularly, you know, with all sorts of cultural baggage of different numbers uh, being seeming low or high. Uh, that's uh, all to be studied, yeah. Thank you very much. Amazing work. You did not reveal the main piece of information, which is for each unit of happiness, how much were people willing to give up on their salary? So in the survey experiment, yeah, so I focused here on the field experiment. In the survey experiment, you were able to vary both the salary and uh, the happiness level of hypothetical job choices. Um, for, I think, let me get this right, in the US, going from sort of choosing between a, uh, the, the average, and people are told the average level in this hypothetical distribution is going to be about 65, uh, and then you sort of offer an alternative job with 75, on average, I think it was about a 12% uh, salary change that people were, state that they would be willing to take. Of course, it's a discrete choice experiment, it's not sort of how much would you, but uh, that's the, uh, the headline comment. Same question. Okay. Anyone has a final question? Okay. Over there. Otherwise, I would have asked the question, but I can ask you afterwards. Oh, it's just real quick. So, how did you define the signposts? Uh, you didn't specify. Is it literally just above and below average? Uh, you know, it, because, or is it by industry? It, you know, can you? So it's it's done globally. So there are five signposts. Uh, they didn't have time to sort of go into in great detail sort of below 50, 50 to 60, 60 to 70, 70 to 80, uh, and 80 plus, and it's sort of low, below average, average, above average, high, which were based on uh, the distribution of a, a company happiness scores, at least at the start of the experiment. It didn't sort of dynamically change based on the average, and the average doesn't particularly move a huge amount during the 10 month period, so they were sort of picked uh, to roughly define buckets and also to be understandable to people. Um, Thank you very much for that. Um, 
I'm kind of interested, and maybe this is not something you can answer right now because I know that it's a time-bounded um, test, but um, just in terms of looking at crisis moments or, you know, even, you know, you can call it COVID, you can call it, you know, right now, where there's a sense of general job insecurity, if you see those differences massively impacted or, or not so much. Um, and then, so I, I don't know, maybe over time, if you're able to look at this at key moments. Um, and there was something else, but I forgot. <laughs> yeah, so what I can do is sort of look at heterogeneity and the effect size um, by, say, month during the 10 months, and I don't find a huge amount of difference. Um, of course, it's very coarse to try and understand this. I think a better approach, which I'm sort of trying to think about, is to try and use some sort of cross-sectional variation across counties or commuting zones in the US where you may be more or less uh, impacted or maybe something to do with occupations or industries to try and I think there's going to be more useful variation there than, than there is just simply across time because you're sort of just looking at 10 months by the US whilst everything is sort of happening at once and everything is going uh, uh, wrong is very difficult to make any inferences and also people may be learning over time as this product that's been shown to them is new, that, that may sort of complicate that, that overtime analysis. I, I just remembered the, the second part of my question, um, which is that if you, if you look at, you know, sort of a generally lower average income that is being advertised, does that also, because you look at MIT, I mean, I assume the salaries are fairly high. Um, but if you, or not so much, <laughs> but if you, I don't know, I don't know what the, what the cutoff is in a way um, for what would start to lose that effect if people say, okay, you know, I can't sure. go any lower. Yeah, so it will be, the best I can do there is look at the average that each company, the average salary of posted jobs per company and then break that down, I think in the paper I do it by sort of uh, quintiles of that to then see. Uh, and you don't find huge differences. Uh, and again, uh, in the survey experiment, you can break it down by people's income because you actually have much more information about them. Uh, and you don't find, again, huge differences. You find some educational differences, uh, but not necessarily in terms of income. OK, if you want to ask more questions, you can find him at drinks. Thank you so much. One more round of applause for everybody. Thanks, and thank you, Laura, for Thank you for <laughs> looking after us. <laughs>